Chapter One of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter One Foot Fairing. It was a lovely morning in the first of summer. Donald Grant was descending a path on a hillside to the valley below a sheep track of which he knew every winding as well as any boy his half-mile to and from school. But he had never before gone down the hill with the feeling that he was not about to go up again. He was on his way to pastures very new, and in the distance only negatively inviting. But his heart was too full to be troubled, nor was his a heart to harbor a care, the next thing to an evil spirit, though not quite so bad, for one care may drive out another, while one devil is sure to bring in another. A great billowy waste of mountains lay beyond him, amongst which played the shadow at their games of hide-and-seek, graciously merry in the eyes of the happy man, but sadly solemn in the eyes of him in whose heart the dreary thoughts of the past are at a like game. Behind Donal lay a world of dreams into which he dared not turn and look, yet from which he could scarce avert his eyes. He was nearing the foot of the hill when he stumbled and almost fell, but recovered himself with the agility of a mountaineer, and the unpleasant knowledge that the sole of one of his shoes was all but off. Never had he left home for college that his father had not made personal inspection of his shoes to see that they were fit for the journey, but on this departure they had been forgotten. He sat down and took off the failing equipment. It was too far gone to do anything temporary with it, and of discomforts a loose sole to one's shoe in walking is of the worst. The only thing was to take off the other shoe and both stockings and go barefoot. He tied all together with a piece of string, made them fast to his deerskin knapsack, and resumed his walk. The thing did not trouble him much. To have what we want is riches, but to be able to do without is power. To have shoes is a good thing. To be able to walk without them is a better. But it was long since Donal had walked barefoot, and he found his feet, like his shoe, "'weaker in the soul than was pleasant. "'It's time,' he said to himself "'when he found he was stepping gingerly. "'I gave my feet a turn at the old accomplishment. "'It's a pity to grow not so fit for anything "'sooner nor you need. "'I would like to lie down at last with hard soles. "'In every stream he came to he bathed his feet, "'and often on the way rested them "'when otherwise able enough to go on. "'He had no certain goal, "'though he knew his direction and was in no haste. He had confidence in God and in his own powers as the gift of God, and knew that wherever he went he needed not be hungry long, even should the little money in his pocket be spent. It is better to trust in work than in money. God never buys anything, and is forever at work. But if anyone trusts in work, he has to learn that he must trust in nothing but strength, the self-existent original strength only. And Donald Grant had long begun to learn that. The man has begun to be strong who knows that, separated from life essential, he is weakness itself, that one with his origin, he will be of strength inexhaustible. Donal was now descending the heights of youth to walk along the king's high road of manhood. Happy he who, as his son is going down behind the western, is himself ascending the eastern hill, returning through old age to the second and better childhood, which shall not be taken from him. He who turns his back on the setting sun goes to meet the rising sun. He who loses his life shall find it. Donal had lost his past, but not so as to be ashamed. There are many ways of losing. His past had but crept, like the dead, back to God who gave it. In better shape it would be his by and by. Already he had begun to foreshadow this truth. God would keep it for him. He had set out before the sun was up for he would not be met by friends or acquaintances. Avoiding the well-known farmhouses and occasional village, he took his way up the river, and about noon came to a hamlet where no one knew him, a cluster of straw-roofed cottages, low and white, with two little windows each. He walked straight through it, not meaning to stop, but spying in front of the last cottage a rough stone seat under a low, wide-spreading elder tree, was tempted to sit down and rest a little. The day was now hot, and the shadow of the tree inviting. He had but seated himself when a woman came to the door of the cottage, looked at him for a moment, and, probably thinking him from his bare feet, poorer than he was, said, 
Would you like a drink? Aye, would I, answered Donal. A drink of water, gin you please. What for no milk? asked the woman. Cause I'm able to pay for it, answered Donal. I want no payment, she rejoined, perceiving his drift as little as probably my reader. And I want no milk, returned Donal. Well, you may pay for it gin you like, she rejoined. But I dinna like, replied Donal. Well, you're a some queer customer, she remarked. I thank you, but I'm no customer. Sit for a drink of water, he persisted, looking in her face with a smile. And water as I been gratis, sin the days of Adam. Sit maybe in tones in the hut parts of the world. The woman turned into the cottage, and came out again presently with a delft basin, holding about a pint full of milk, yellow and rich. There, she said, drink and be thankful. I'll be thankful on drunken, said Donal. I thank you with all my heart, but I canna bide to take for nothing what I can pay for, and I dinna like to lay out my silver upon a luxury I can weel enough do wantin, for I had no muckle. I wouldna be shabby nor yet greedy. Drink for the love of God, said the woman. Donal took the bowl from her hand and drank till all was gone. Will you have a drap mair? she asked. Na, no a drap, answered Donal. I'll gang in the strength of that ye give me. Maybe no just forty days, good wife, but mair no forty minutes, and that's a good part of a day. I thank ye heartily. Yon was a milk of human kindness, gin ever was any. As he spoke, he rose and stood up refreshed for his journey. I have a soldier, laddie, away in the hep parts ye spake of, said the woman. Gin ye had na ta'en the milk, ye would a gin me a sad heart. Eh, good wife, it would a gin me one to think I had, returned Donal. The Lord gie you back your soldier laddie safe and sound. Maybe I'll have to gang after him soldier myself. Na, na, that wouldna do. You're a scholar. That's easy to see, for all you're so plain spoken. It dis a body's heart good to hear a man that understands things say them plain out in the tongue his mother taught him. Sick a one'll gang straight till his maker and find all thing there home like. Lord, I wish ministers would speak like other folk. You would say to please my mother saying that, remarked Donal. Ye maun be just sick another as her. Weel, come in, and sit ye down out o' the sun, and has something to eat. Na, I'll take na mare frae ye the day, and I thank ye, replied Donal. I canna weel bide. Wha well, for no? It's not so muckle at a minute hurry, as that I maun be doin'. What are ye born for? Gin a body may speer. I'm going to seek, no my fortune, but my daily bread. Gin I spake as a right man, I would say I was going to look for the work set me. I'm feared to say that straight out. I hanna won so far as that yet. I winna do nothing though he wouldn't have me do. I dare to say that, so be I understand. My mother says the day'll come when I'll care for nothing but his will. Your mother'll be Janet Grant, I'm thinking. There cannot be two such in one countryside. You're in the right, answered Donal. Ken ye, my mither? I ha seen her, and to see her is to ken her. Ay, gin who sees her be sick like as herself. I canna pretend to that, but she's well kent through all the country for a god fearing woman. And where'll you be for the no? I'm just upon the tramp, looking for work. And what may you be pleased to call work? Oh, just the communication o' what I have the understanding of. Oh well, gin you'll condescend to advice frae an old wife, I'll give ye a bit with ye. Take na ilka lass ye see for a born angel. Mist out her a wee to begin with. Hang up your judgment o' her a wee. Look to the mo and the een o' her. I thank you, said Donal with a smile, in which the woman spied the sadness. I'm no like to need the advice. She looked at him pitifully and paused. Gin you come this gate again, she said, you'll no gang by my door. I will no, replied Donal, and wishing her good-bye with a grateful heart, betook himself to his journey. He had not gone far when he found himself on a wide moor. He sat down on a big stone and began to turn things over in his mind. This is how his thoughts went. I can never be the man I was. The thought of my heart's taken from me. I cannot think about things as I used. There's nothing so bonny as afore. When the life slips from him, how can a man gang on living? Yet I'm not dead. That's what makes the difficulty of the situation. Gin I were dead, well, I cannot what then. I doubt there would be trouble still, though some things might be lighter. But that's neither here nor there. I maun live. I had no choice. I dinna make myself, and I'm not going to meddle with myself. I think mair o' myself nor dar that. 
But there's one question I'm on settle afore I gang farther, and that's this. Am I to be less or mair nor I was afore? It's agreed I cannot be the same. If I cannot be the same, I'm on either be less or greater than I was afore. Wilk o' them is it to be? I wouldn't have that question to spear mair nor once. I'll be mair nor I was. To sink to less would be to lose grip in my past as wills on my future. And how would I ever look her in the face gin I grew less because of her? A child like me let a bonny lassie think herself to blame for what I grew till. And there's a greater nor the last to be considered. Cause he sees na fit to give me her I would have. Is he not to have his will o' me? It's a grand thing to ken a lassie like yon, and a grander thing yet to be allowed to love her. To sit down and grate cause I'm not to marry her would be most ungrateful. What for should I threep but I ought to have her? What for should not I be disappointed as well as another? I have as good a right to any good it's to come o' that, I fancy. Gin it be a man's part to carry a sair heart, it canna be his part to sit down with it upon the roadside, and lay it upon his lap and grate o'er it, like a bairn with a cut it finger. He mun hold on his road. Who am I to differ for the lave o' my folk? I should be like the lave, and gin I greet, I win a gern. The Lord himself had to be crunt with pain. Eh, my bonny dove. But ye love a better man, and that's a sair comfort. Gin it had been otherwise, I did not think I could have borne the pain at my heart. But as it's good, and not ill it's come to ye, I had na you and myself too to grate for, and that's a sair comfort. Lord, I'll climb to thee, and gather o' the healing it grows for the nations in thy garden. I see the thing as plain as thing can be. The cure o' all ills just mere life. That's it. Life a bone and a yomp, the life it took the stroke. And gin through this heartbreak I come by mere life, it'll be just one of the throes of my heavenly birth. In the wilk the bairn has as many of the pains as the mither. That's maybe a differ between the two, the earthly and the heavenly. So now I had to begin fresh, and let the thing it's past and gone slip after ither dreams. Hey, but it's a bonny dream yet. It lies close ahind me, not to be forgotten, not to be looked at. Like one of the dreams of water in moonlight, it has no work in them. A body wouldn't lie on night and all day too in a dream of the soul's gloaming. Now, nah, Lord, make a me a strong man, and say and give me as muckle of the bonny as may please thee. Who am I to lip until, gin no to thee, my ain father and mother and grandfather and all body in one, for thou gids me them all? No, I am to begin again, a fresh life for this minute. I am to set out for this very point, like one of the youngest sons in the fairy tales, to seek my portion, and see what's coming to meet me as I gain to meet it. The world afore me's my story book. I canna see o'er the leaf till I come to the end of it. When I was a bairn, just able with sair endeavour to win at the heart a print, I never would look on afore. The one time I did it, I thought I had done a shameful thing, like looking in at a keyhole, as I did just once too, when I thank God my mither gave me sick a blessed lickin', and I kent it must be something dreadful I had done. So here's for what's coming. I ken where it mon come frae, and I shall make it welcome. My mither says the main mischief in the world is, it folk winna let the Lord have his own way, and so he has just to take it. Wilk makes it a sair thing for them. Therewith he rose to encounter that which was on its way to meet him. He is a fool who stands and lets life move past him like a panorama. He also is a fool who would lay hands on its motion and change its pictures. He can but distort and injure if he does not ruin them, and come upon awful shadows behind them. And lo, as he glanced around him, already something of the old mysterious loveliness, now for so long vanished from the face of the visible world, had returned to it. Not yet as it was before, but with dawning promise of a new creation, a fresh beauty, in welcoming which he was not turning from the old, but receiving the new that God sent him. He might yet be many a time sad, but to lament would be to act as if he were wronged, would be at best weak and foolish. He would look the new life in the face, and be what it should please God to make him. The scents the wind brought him from field and garden and moor seemed sweeter than ever wind-borne scents before. They were seeking to comfort him. He sighed, but turned from the sigh to God, and found fresh gladness and welcome. The wind hovered about him as if it would fain have something to do in the matter. The river rippled and shone as if it knew something worth knowing as yet unrevealed. The delight of creation is verily in secrets, but in secrets as truths on the way. All secrets are embryo revelations. On the far horizon, heaven and earth met as old friends, who, though never parted, were ever renewing their friendship. 
The world, like the angels, was rejoicing. If not over a sinner that had repented, yet over a man that had passed from a lower to a higher condition of life, out of its earth into its air. He was going to live above and look down on the inferior world. Ere the shades of evening fell that day around Donald Grant, he was in the new childhood of a new world. I do not mean such thoughts had never been present to him before, but to think a thing is only to look at it in a glass. To know it as God would have us know it, and as we must know it to live, is to see it as we see love in a friend's eyes, to have it as the love the friend sees in ours. To make things real to us is the end and the battle cause of life. We often think we believe what we are only presenting to our imaginations. The least thing can overthrow that kind of faith. The imagination is an endless help towards faith, but it is no more faith than a dream of food will make us strong for the next day's work. To know God as the beginning and end, the root and cause, the giver, the enabler, the love and joy and perfect good, the present one existence in all things and degrees and conditions, is life. And faith, in its simplest, truest, mightiest form, is to do his will. Donal was making his way towards the eastern coast, in the certain hope of finding work of one kind or another. He could have been well content to pass his life as a shepherd like his father, but for two things. He knew what it would be well for others to know, and he had a hunger after the society of books. A man must be able to do without whatever is denied him, but when his heart is hungry for an honest thing, he may use honest endeavor to obtain it. Donal desired to be useful and live for his generation, also to be with books. To be where was a good library would suit him better than buying books, for without a place in which to keep them, they are among the impedimenta of life. And Donal knew that in regard to books, he was in danger of loving after the fashion of this world. Books he had a strong inclination to accumulate and hoard, Therefore, the use of a library was better than the means of buying them. Books as possessions are also of the things that pass and perish, as surely as any other form of earthly having. They are of the playthings God lets men have that they may learn to distinguish between apparent and real possession. If having will not teach them, loss may. But who would have thought, meeting the youth as he walked the road with shoeless feet, that he sought the harbor of a great library in some old house, so as day after day to feast on the thoughts of men who had gone before him. For his was no antiquarian soul. It was a soul hungry after life, not after the mummy cloths and wrapping the dead. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 2 A Spiritual Footpad. He was now walking southward, but would soon, when the mountains were well behind him, turn toward the east. He carried a small wallet, filled chiefly with oat cake and hard skim milk cheese. About two o'clock, he sat down on a stone and proceeded to make a meal. A brook from the hills ran near, for that he had chosen the spot, his fare being dry. He seldom took any other drink than water. He had learned that strong drink at best, but discounted to him his own at a high rate. He drew from his pocket a small thick volume he had brought as the companion of his journey, and read as he ate. His seat was on the last slope of a grassy hill, where many huge stones rose out of the grass. A few yards beneath was a country road, and on the other side of the road a small stream, in which the brook that ran swiftly past, almost within reach of his hand, eagerly lost itself. On the further bank of the stream, perfuming the air, grew many bushes of meadow-sweet, or queen of the meadow, as it is called in Scotland, and beyond lay a lovely stretch of nearly level pasture. Farther eastward all was a plain, full of farms. Behind him rose the hill, shutting out his past. Before him lay the plain, open to his eyes and feet. God had walled up his past and was disclosing his future. When he had eaten his dinner, its dryness forgotten in the condiment his book supplied, he rose, and taking his cap from his head, filled it from the stream and drank heartily, 
then emptied it, shook the last drops from it, and put it again upon his head. "'Ho, ho, young man!' cried a voice. Donal looked, and saw a man in the garb of a clergyman regarding him from the road, and wiping his face with his sleeve. "'You should mind,' he continued, "'how you scatter your favours.' "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Donal, taking off his cap again. "'I had not a notion there was living creature near me.' "'It's a fine day,' said the minister. "'It is that, sir,' answered Donal. "'Which way are you going?' asked the minister, adding, as if in apology for his seeming curiosity, "'You're a scholar, I see,' with a glance towards the book he had left open on his stone. "'Na so muckle as I would fain be, sir,' answered Donal, then called to mind a resolve he had made to speak English for the future. "'A modest youth, I see,' returned the clergyman, but Donal hardly liked the tone in which he said it. "'That depends on what you mean by a scholar,' he said. "'Oh,' answered the minister, not thinking much about his reply, but in a bantering humour willing to draw the lad out. "'The learned man modestly calls himself a scholar.' "'Then there was no modesty in saying I was not so much of a scholar as I should like to be. Every scholar would say the same.' "'A very good answer,' said the clergyman patronizingly. "'You'll be a learned man some day.' And he smiled as he said it. "'When would you call a man learned?' asked Donal. "'That is hard to determine, seeing those that claim to be contradict each other so. "'What good, then, can there be in wanting to be learned? "'You get the mental discipline of study.' "'It seems to me,' said Donal, "'a pity to get a body's discipline on what may be worthless. "'It's just as good discipline to my teeth to dine on bread and cheese "'as it would be to exercise them on sheep's grass.' "'I've got hold of a humorist,' said the clergyman to himself." Donal picked up his wallet and his book and came down to the road. Then first the clergyman saw that he was barefooted. In his childhood he had himself often gone without shoes and stockings, yet the youth's lack of them prejudiced him against him. "'It must be the fellow's own fault,' he said to himself. "'He shan't catch me with his chaff.' Donal would rather have forded the river and gone to inquire his way at the nearest farmhouse, but he thought it polite to walk a little way with the clergyman. "'How far are you going?' "'asked the minister at length. "'As far as I can,' replied Donal. "'Where do you mean to pass the night? "'In some barn, perhaps, or on some hillside. "'I am sorry to hear you can do no better. "'You don't think, sir, what a decent bed costs. "'And a barn is generally, a hillside always clean. "'In fact, the hillside's the best. "'Many's the time I have slept on one. "'It's a strange notion some people have "'that it's more respectable to sleep under man's roof than God's. "'To have no settled abode.' said the clergyman, and paused. "'Like Abraham?' suggested Donal with a smile. "'An abiding city seems hardly necessary to pilgrims and strangers. "'I fell asleep once on the top of Glashgar. "'When I woke, the sun was looking over the edge of the horizon. "'I rose and gazed about me as if I were but that moment created. "'If God had called me, I should hardly have been astonished.' "'Or frightened?' asked the minister. "'No, sir. Why should a man fear the presence of his Saviour? "'You said God.' "'answered the minister. "'God is my saviour. "'Into his presence it is my desire to come. "'Under shelter of the atonement,' supplemented the minister. "'Gin ye mean by that, sir,' cried Donal, forgetting his English, "'anything to come atween my God and me, I'll had none of it. "'I'll had nothing hide me fra him who made me. "'I wouldna hide a thought fra him. "'The word it is, the mare need he see it.' "'What book is that you are reading?' asked the minister sharply. "'It's not your Bible, I'll be bound.' "'You never got such notions from it.' "'He was angry with the presumptuous youth. "'And no wonder, for the gospel the minister preached "'was a gospel but to the slavish and unfilial. "'It's Shelley,' answered Donal, recovering himself. "'The minister had never read a word of Shelley, "'but had a very decided opinion of him. "'He gave a loud, rude whistle. "'So, that's where you go for your theology. "'I was puzzled to understand you, but now all is plain. "'Young man, you are on the brink of perdition.' "'That book will poison your very vitals.' "'Indeed, sir, it will never go deep enough for that. "'But it came near touching them as I sat eating my bread and cheese.' "'He's an infidel,' said the minister fiercely. "'A kind of one,' returned Donal, "'but not of the worst sort. "'It's the people who call themselves believers "'that drive the like of poor Shelley to the mouth of the pit. "'He hated the truth,' said the minister. "'He was always seeking after it,' said Donal, "'though to be sure he didn't get to the end of the search.' "'Just listen to this, sir, and say whether it be very far from Christian.' Donal opened his little volume and sought his passage. 
The minister, but for curiosity and the dread of seeming absurd, would have stopped his ears and refused to listen. He was a man of not merely dry or stale, but of deadly doctrines. He would have a man love Christ for protecting him from God, not for leading him to God, in whom alone is bliss, out of whom all is darkness and misery. He had not a glimmer of the truth that eternal life is to know God. He imagined justice and love dwelling in eternal opposition, in the bosom of eternal unity. He knew next to nothing about God, and misrepresented him hideously. If God were such as he showed him, it would be the worst possible misfortune to have been created. Donal had found the passage. It was in the Mask of Anarchy. He read the following stanzas. Let a vast assembly be, and with great solemnity, declare with measured words that ye are as God has made ye free. Be your strong and simple words, keen to wound as sharpened swords, and wide as targes let them be, with their shade to cover ye. And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there, slash and stab and maim and hew, what they like, that let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes, and little fear and less surprise, look upon them as they slay, till their rage has died away. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. Ending, the reader turned to the listener. But the listener had understood little of the meaning, and less of the spirit. He hated opposition to the powers on the part of any below himself, yet scorned the idea of submitting to persecution. "'What think you of that, sir?' asked Donal. "'Sheer nonsense,' answered the minister. "'Where would Scotland be now but for resistance?' "'There's more than one way of resisting, though,' returned Donal. "'Enduring evil was the Lord's way. "'I don't know about Scotland, "'but I fancy there would be more Christians, "'and of a better stamp in the world, "'if that had been the mode of resistance "'always adopted by those that called themselves such. "'Anyhow, it was his way. "'Shelley's, you mean?' "'I don't mean Shelley's, I mean Christ's. "'In spirit, Shelley was far nearer the truth "'than those who made him despise "'the very name of Christianity "'without knowing what it really was. "'But God will give every man fair play. "'Young man!' said the minister, with an assumption of great solemnity and no less authority. I am bound to warn you that you are in a state of rebellion against God, and he will not be mocked. Good morning. Donal sat down on the roadside. He would let the minister have a good start of him. Took again his shabby little volume, held more talk with the book-embodied spirit of Shelley, and saw more and more clearly how he was misled in his every notion of Christianity and how different those who gave him his notions must have been from the evangelists and apostles. He saw in the poet a boyish nature striving after liberty, with scarce a notion of what liberty really was. He knew nothing of the law of liberty, oneness with the will of our existence, which would have us free with its own freedom. When the clergyman was long out of sight, he rose and went on, and soon came to a bridge by which he crossed the river. Then on he went, through the cultivated plain, his spirits never flagging. He was a pilgrim on his way to his divine fate. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Donald Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donald Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 3 The Moor The night began to descend, and he to be weary, and look about him for a place of repose. But there was a long twilight before him, and it was warm. For some time the road had been ascending, and by and by he found himself on a bare moor, among heather not yet in bloom, and a forest of bracken. Here was a great, beautiful chamber for him. And what better bed than God's heather? What better canopy than God's high, star-studded night, with its airy curtains of dusky darkness? Was it not in this very chamber that Jacob had his vision of the mighty stair leading up to the gate of heaven? Was it not under such a roof Jesus spent his last nights on the earth? For comfort and protection he sought no human shelter, but went out into his father's house, out under his father's heaven. The small and narrow were not to him the safe, but the wide and open. Thick walls cover men from the enemies they fear. The Lord sought space. 
There the angels come and go more freely than where roofs gather distrust. If ever we hear a far-off rumor of angel visit, is it not from some solitary plain with lonely children? Donal walked along the high tableland till he was weary, and rest looked blissful. Then he turned aside from the rough track into the heather and bracken. When he came to a little dry hollow, with a yet thicker growth of heather, its tops almost close as those of his bed at his father's cottage, he sought no further. Taking his knife, he cut a quantity of heather and ferns, and heaped it on the top of the thickest bush. Then, creeping in between the cut and the growing, he cleared the former from his face that he might see the worlds over him, and putting his knapsack under his head, fell fast asleep. When he woke, not even the shadow of a dream lingered to let him know what he had been dreaming. He woke with such a clear mind, such an immediate uplifting of the soul, that it seemed to him no less than to Jacob that he must have slept at the foot of the heavenly stair. The wind came round him like the stuff of thought unshaped, and every breath he drew seemed like God breathing afresh into his nostrils the breath of life. Who knows what the thing we call air is? We know about it, but it we do not know. The sun shone as if smiling at the self-importance of the sulky darkness he had driven away, and the world seemed content with a heavenly content. So fresh was Donal's sense that he felt as if his sleep within and the wind without had been washing him all the night. So peaceful, so blissful was his heart that it longed to share its bliss. But there was no one within sight, and he set out again on his journey. He had not gone far when he came to a dip in the moorland. A round hollow, with a cottage of turf in the middle of it, from whose chimney came a little smoke. There, too, the day was begun. He was glad he had not seen it before, for then he might have missed the repose of the open night. At the door stood a little girl in a blue frock. She saw him and ran in. He went down and drew near to the door. It stood wide open, and he could not help seeing in. A man sat at the table in the middle of the floor, his forehead on his hand. Donald did not see his face. He seemed waiting, like his father, for the book, while his mother got it from the top of the wall. He stepped over the threshold, and in the simplicity of his heart, said, "'Ye'll be going to have worship.' "'Na, nah, na,' nah, returned the man, raising his head, and taking a brief, hard stare at his visitor. "'We dinna set up for praying folk in this house. We lay that to them it kens what they had to be thankful for.' "'I made a mistake,' said Donal. "'I thought you might have been going to say good morning to your maker, and would I like it to join with ye, for I ken not what I had not to be thankful for. Good day to ye.' "'Ye can bide and take your porridge, can ye like?' "'Oh, na, nah, I thank ye. "'Ye might think I came for the porridge, and not for the prayers. "'I like as ill to be counted a hypocrite as gin I were one.' "'Ye can bide a hair worship with us, gin ye take the book yourself. "'I canna lead where is none to follow. "'Na, nah, I'll do better on the moor, my lone. "'But the good wife was a religious woman after her fashion. "'Who can be after anyone else's? "'She came with a Bible in her hand and silently laid it on the table.' Donal had never yet prayed aloud, except in a murmur by himself on the hill, but thus invited could not refuse. He read a psalm of trouble, breaking into hope at the close, then spoke as follows. "'Friends, I'm but young, as ye see, and never afore dared open my mouth in such fashion. But it comes to me to speak, and wi' your leave speak I will. I cannot help thinking the good men's in some trouble, sick like maybe as King David when he made the psalm I had been reading in your hearing.' Ye observed how it began like a stormy morning, but ye heard how it changed or all was done. The sun comes out bonny in the end, and ye hear the birds beginning to sing, telling nature to give o'er her greeting. And what brings a good man to his senses, do ye think? What but just the thought o' him it made him, him it cares about him, him it mung come to ill himself afore he let anything he made come to ill. Sir, let's gang down upon our knees, and commit the keeping of our souls to him as till a faithful creator who winna miss his part atween him and his. They went down on their knees, and Donal said, O Lord, our own Father and Saviour, the day ye has sent us has arrived bonny and grand, and we bless ye for sending it. But, eh, our Father, we need mere the light that shines in the darker place. We need the dawn of a spiritual day inside us, or the bonny day outside when again for muckle. Lord, our might, Speak a word of peaceful recall to any dog o' thine that may be worrying at the heart o' any sheep o' thine that's run away. But dinna call him back so as to leave the poor sheep behind him. 
Fest back dog and lamb together, O Lord. Hold us all for ill, and guide us all to good, and our morning prayers o'er. Amen. They rose from their knees, and sat silent for a moment. Then the good wife put the pot on the fire with the water for the porridge. But Donal rose and walked out of the cottage, half wondering at himself that he had dared as he had, yet feeling he had done but the most natural thing in the world. "'Who a body's the wind through the day, wantin' the lord of the day and the hour and the minute, is he aunt me?' he said to himself, and hastened away. Ere noon, the blue line of the far ocean rose on the horizon. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Donald Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen.《Donald Grant》by George MacDonald. • Chapter Four: The Town. Donald was queer. Some of my readers will think, and I admit it. For the man who regards the affairs of life from any other point than his own greedy self must be queer indeed in the eyes of all who are slaves to their imagined necessities and undisputed desires. It was evening when he drew nigh the place whither he had directed his steps, a little country town not far from a famous seat of learning. There he would make inquiry before going further. The minister of his parish knew the minister of Auker's and had given him a letter of introduction. The country around had not a few dwellings of distinction, and at one or another of these might be children in want of a tutor. The sun was setting over the hills behind him as he entered the little town. At first it looked but a village, for on the outskirts, through which the king's highway led, were chiefly thatched cottages, with here and there a slated house of one story and an attic, but presently began to appear houses of larger size, few of them, however, of more than two stories. Most of them looked as if they had a long and not very happy history. All at once he found himself in a street, partly of quaint gables with corbel steps. They called them here Corby Steps, in allusion perhaps to the raven sent out by Noah, for which lazy bird the children regarded these as places to rest. There were two or three curious gateways in it with some attempt at decoration, and one house with the pepper pot turrets which Scottish architecture has borrowed from the French chateau. The heart of the town was a yet narrower close-built street, with several short closes and winds opening out of it, all of which had ancient-looking houses. There were shops, not a few, but their windows were those of dwellings, as the upper parts of their buildings mostly were. In those shops was as good a supply of the necessities of life as in a great town, and cheaper. You could not get a coat so well cut, nor a pair of shoes to fit you so tight without hurting, but you could get first-rate work. The streets were unevenly paved with round, water-worn stones. Donal was not sorry that he had not to walk far upon them. The setting sun sent his shadow before him as he entered the place. He kept the middle of the street, looking on this side and that for the hostelry whither he had dispatched his chest before leaving home. A gloomy building, apparently uninhabited, drew his attention, and sent a strange thrill through him as his eyes fell upon it. It was of three low stories, the windows defended by iron stanchions, the door studded with great knobs of iron. A little way beyond, he caught sight of the sign he was in search of. It swung in front of an old-fashioned dingy building, with much of the old-world look that pervaded the town. The last red rays of the sun were upon it, lighting up a sorely faded coat of arms. The supporters, two red horses on their hind legs, were all of it he could make out. The crest above suggested a skate, but could hardly have been intended for one. A greedy-eyed man stood in the doorway, his hands in his trouser pockets. He looked with contemptuous scrutiny at the barefooted lad approaching him. He had black hair and black eyes. His nose looked as if a heavy finger had settled upon its point and pressed it downwards. Its nostrils swelled wide beyond their base. Underneath was a big mouth with a good set of teeth and a strong upturning chin an ambitious and greedy face. But ambition is a form of greed. "'A fine day, landlord,' said Donal. "'Aye,' answered the man, without changing the posture of one taking his ease against his own doorpost, or removing his hands from his pockets, but looking Donal up and down with conscious superiority, then resting his eyes on the bare feet and upturned trousers. 
"'This'll be the Morven Arms, I'm thinking,' said Donal. "'It takes no muckle thought to think that,' returned the innkeeper. "'When there they hang.' "'Aye,' rejoined Donal, glancing up. "'There is something there, and it's arms, I doubt not. "'But it's no obbody has the privilege of a knowledge of heraldry like yourself, landlord. "'I'm bound to confess, for what I ken, "'they might be the arms of any one of ten score Scots families.' There was one weapon with which John Glum was assailable, and that was ridicule. With all his self-sufficiency he stood in terror of it, and the more covert the ridicule, so long as he suspected it, the more he resented as well as dreaded it. He stepped into the street, and taking a hand from a pocket, pointed up to the sign. "'See till it,' he said. "'Dinna ye see the two red horse?' "'Aye,' answered Donal. "'I see them well enough. But I'm none the wiser nor gin they were two red whales.' Man, he went on, turning sharp round upon the fellow, you're not capable of conceiving the extent of my ignorance. It's as rampant as the red horse upon your sign. I'll yield to nobody in the amount of things I dinna ken. The man stared at him for a moment. I shall warrant, he said, you ken mair nor you care to let on. And what may that be o'er the head of him? A crest, call ye it? said Donal. It's a base pearl beset, answered the landlord. He had not a notion of what a base meant, or pearl beset, yet prided himself on his knowledge of the words. Eh, returned Donal, I took it for a skate. A skate, repeated the landlord with offended sneer, and turned towards the house. I was thinking to put up wi' ye the night, gin ye could accommodate me at a reasonable rate, said Donal. I do not ken, replied Glum, hesitating with his back to him, between unwillingness to lose a penny and resentment at the supposed badinage, which was indeed nothing but humour. What would you call reasonable? I wouldn't grudge a sixpence for my bed. A shillin' I would, answered Donal. Well, ninepence, then, for you seem not o'er come with siller. Na, answered Donal, I'm no that. Whatever my burden yon's no hit, the loss o' what I had would hardly make me lighter for my race. You're a queer customer, said the man. I'm not so queer, but I have a kist coming by the carrier, rejoined Donal, directed to the Morven Arms. "'It'll be here in time, doubtless.' "'We'll see when it comes,' remarked the landlord, implying the chest was easier invented than believed in. "'The worst of it is,' continued Donal, "'I cannot wheel show myself wantin' shoon. "'I have a pair in my kist, and another upon my back, but none for my feet.' "'There's suitors enough,' said the innkeeper. "'We'll, we'll see as we gang. "'I want a word with the minister. "'Would you direct me to the manse?' "'He's for home.' But it's a small consequence. He doesna care about tramps, honest man. He winna war muckle upon the likes o' you. The landlord was recovering himself, therefore his insolence. Donal gave a laugh. Those who are content with what they are have the less concern about what they seem. The ambitious like to be taken for more than they are, and may well be annoyed when they are taken for less. I'm thinking ye wouldna war muckle on a tramp either, he said. I would not, answered Glum. "'It's the part of the honest to discountenance lawlessness.' "'You wouldn't hang the poor creatures, would you?' asked Donal. "'I would hang a wee and mare of them. "'For not having a house over their heads. That's some hard. "'What gain you as one day to be in want of one yourself? "'We'll bide till the day comes. "'But what are you standing there for? "'Are you coming in or are you no?' "'It's a some cold welcome,' said Donal. "'I shall just take a look about afore I make up my mind. "'A tramp, you ken, needs na stand upon ceremony.' He turned away and walked further along the street. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 5. The Cobbler At the end of the street he came to a low-arched gateway in the middle of a poor-looking house. Within it sat a little bowed man, cobbling diligently at a boot. The sun had left behind him in the west a heap of golden refuse and cuttings of rose and purple which shone right in at the archway and let him see to work. Here was the very man for Donal. A respectable shoemaker would have disdained to patch up the shoes he carried, "'especially as the owner was in so much need of them. "'It's a bonny night,' he said. "'Ye may weel make the remark, sir. 
replied the cobbler without looking up, for a critical stitch occupied him. It's a balmy night. That's rather a bonny word to put till it, returned Donal. There's a kind of an air about the place I would hardly have thought balmy. But truth it's not the fault of the night. You're right there also, returned the cobbler, his use of the conjunction impressing Donal. Still, the weather has to do with the smell, with the mare or less of it, that is. It comes frae a tannery nearby. It's not an ill smell to them as used to it, and ye would hardly believe me, sir, but I smell the clover through it. Maybe I'm prejudiced, seeing but for the tan pits I couldn't a well drive my trade, but sitting here from morning to night, I get a kind o' of a habit o' looking out for my blessings. To recognize an old blessings most better nor to get a new one. A pair of shoon wheel cobbles, whiles full better nor a new pair. They are that, said Donal, but I dinna just see how your simile applies. Isn't it getting on a pair of old wheel kent and wheel men at shoon at when I nip your feet nor yet shuckle, like waking up till a blessing ye've been having for years, only ye dinna ken it for one? As he spoke, the cobbler lifted a little wizened face and a pair of twinkling eyes to those of the student, revealing a soul as original as his own. He was one of the inwardly inseparable, outwardly far divided company of Christian philosophers, among whom individuality as well as patience is free to work its perfect work. In that glance, Donal saw a ripe soul looking out of its tent door, ready to rush into the sunshine of the new life. He stood for a moment lost in eternal regard of the man. He seemed to have known him for ages. The cobbler looked up again. "'You'll be wanting a hand frae me a my ain line, I'm thinking,' he said, with a kindly nod towards Donal's shoeless feet. "'Small doot,' returned Donal. "'I had scarce started, but was o'er far to gang back, when the sole o' one shoe came off, and I had to tramp it with both my ain.' "'And ye think at the Lord for the old blessing of being born and brought up with souls o' your ain?' "'To tell the truth,' answered Donal. I have so many things to be thankful for. It's but small wonder I forget many one of them. But no, and I thank you for the exhortation. The Lord's name be praised. He gave me feet fit for ganging upon. He took his shoes from his back, and untying the string that bound them, presented the ailing one to the cobbler. That's what we may call death, remarked the cobbler, slowly turning the invalided shoe. Aye, death it is, answered Donal. It's a sair divorce of soul and body. It's a some old foreign joke, said the cobbler. But the fun into a thing doesn't away it out any mare of the poetry or the truth into it. Who will say there was no providence in the loss of my shoe soul, remarked Donald to himself. Here I am with a friend already. The cobbler was submitting the shoes, first the sickly one, now the sound one, to a thorough scrutiny. You dinna think them worth men, and I don't said Donal, with a touch of anxiety in his tone. "'I never thought that, where the leather would hold the stick,' replied the cobbler. "'But whiles, I confess, I'm just a wean tribble to ken how to charge for my work. It's no barely to consider the time it'll take me to cloot a pair, but what the wearer's like to get out of them. I cannot take mere nor the job'll be worth to the wearer. And yet the war the shoon, and the less to be made of them, the more time they take to make them worth anything of all. "'Surely you ought to be paid in proportion to your labor. In that case, I would whiles have to say to a poor body it hadna another pair in the world, at her one pair of shoon wasna worth minnin, and that would be a heartbreak and sair feet forby, to sick as couldna like yourself, sir, gang upon the Lord's own shoon. But who make ye live in that way? suggested Donal. Who it's the maister of the trade sees to my wages? And who may he be? asked Donal, well foreseeing the answer. He was never cobbler himself, but he was once carpenter and know he's lifted up to be head of all the trades. And there's one thing he can abide, and that's close peering. He stopped, but Donal held his peace, waiting, and he went on. To them it makes little, for reasons good, by their neighbor. He gives the better wages when they gang home. To them it makes all that they can, he says. Ye help it yourself. Help away. Ye had your reward. Only come na near me, for I can abide ye. But about the shoon o' yours, I dinna well ken. They're well enough worth doing the best I can for them. But the morn's Sunday, and what ha' you to put on? Nothing, till my kiss comes, and that I doubt winna be afore Monday, or maybe the day after. And ye winna be able to gang to the kirk. I'm not particular about going to the kirk, but gin I wanted to gang, or gin I thought I was bound to gang, think ye I would bide at home, cause I had no shoon to gang in. Would I fancy the Lord affront it with the bare feet he made himself? 
The cobbler caught up the worst shoe and began upon it at once. "'You shall have it, sir,' he said. "'Can I sit all night at it? "'The one'll do till Monday. "'You shall have it afore kirk time, "'but you maun come into the house to get it, "'for the folk would be scunnered to see me working upon the Sabbath day. "'They dinna understand that the master works Sunday and Saturday, "'and his father is well. "'You dinna think, then, there's anything wrong "'in men in a pair of shoon on the Sabbath day?' "'Wrong, in obeying my master, "'whose is the day as well as all the days. "'They would fain take it for the son of man, "'who is the lord of it, but they canna. "'He looked up over the old shoe with eyes that flashed. "'But then, excuse me,' said Donal, "'why shouldna ye hold your face till it "'and work openly in the name of God? "'We're tilt neither to do our good works afore men to be seen of them, "'nor yet to cast our pearls afore swine. "'I count cobbling your shoes, sir, "'a far better work nor going to the kirk.' "'and I would not have seen a man. "'Gin I were working for poverty, it would be another thing.' "'This last Donal did not understand, "'but learned afterwards what the cobbler meant. "'The day being for rest, "'the next duty to helping another was to rest himself. "'To work for fear of starving would be to distrust the father "'and act as if man lived by bread alone. "'When I think of it,' he resumed after a pause, "'be in Sunday. I'll take them home to you. "'Where will you be?' "'That's what I would fain how ye tell me,' answered Donal. "'I had thought to put up at the Morven Arms, "'but there's something I didna like about the landlord. "'Can ye any decent, clean place "'where they would give me a room to myself, "'and no seek mer nor I could pay them?' "'We have a bit roomy ourselves,' said the cobbler, "'at the service of any decent wayfaring man "'that can stand the smell and put up with our ways. "'For payment, ye can pay what ye think it's worth. "'We're never very particular.' "'I take your offer with thankfulness.' "'answered Donal. "'Weel, gang ye in at that door just afore ye, "'and ye'll see the good wife. "'There's none either to see. "'I would gang wi' ye myself, "'but I canna with this shoe o' yours "'to turn into a Sunday one.' "'Donal went to the door indicated. "'It stood wide open, "'for while the cobbler sat outside at his work, "'his wife would never shut the door. "'He knocked, but there came no answer. "'She's some dull o' hearin', said the cobbler, "'and called her by his own name for her. "'Dory!' Dory, he said. "'She canna be that diff, gin she hears ye,' said Donal, for he spoke hardly louder than usual. "'When God gives you a wife, may she be one to hear your lightest word,' answered the cobbler. Sure enough, he had scarcely finished the sentence when Dory appeared at the door. "'Did ye cry, Goodman?' she said. "'Na, nah, Dory, I canna say I cried, but I speck, and ye, as is your custom, hearken till my word. Here's a believing lad.' "'I'm thinking he maun be a gentleman, but I'm not sure. "'It's hard for a cobbler to ken a gentleman "'it comes till him wantin' shoon. "'But he may be a gentleman for all that, "'and there's no hurry to ken. "'He's welcome to me, gin he be welcome to you. "'Can ye gie him a night's lodging?' "'Weel that, and wi' all my heart,' said Dory. "'He's welcome to what we have.' "'Turning, she led the way into the house. "'End of chapter 5《ハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピーバーガーのハッピー straight not bowed like her husband otherwise she seemed at first exactly like him but ere the evening was over donal saw there was no featural resemblance between the two faces and was puzzled to understand how the two expressions came to be so like as they sat it seemed in the silence as if they were the same person thinking in two shapes and two places following the old woman donal ascended a steep and narrow stair which soon brought him to a landing where was light coming mainly through green leaves, for the window in the little passage was filled with plants. His guide led him into what seemed to him an enchanting room. Homely enough it was, but luxurious compared to what he had been accustomed to. He saw white walls and a brown-hued but clean-swept wooden floor, on which shone a keen-eyed little fire from a low grate. Two easy chairs, covered with some party-colored striped stuff, stood one on each side of the fire. A kettle was singing on the hob. The white deal table was set for tea, with a fat brown teapot and cups of a gorgeous pattern in bronze, 
that shone in the firelight like red gold. In one of the walls was a box bed. "'I'll let you see what accommodation we have at your service, sir,' said Dory. "'And gin that'll suit you, you to be welcome.' So saying, she opened what looked like the door of a cupboard at the side of the fireplace. It disclosed a neat little parlor with a sweet air in it. The floor was sanded, and so much the cleaner than if it had been carpeted. A small mahogany table, black with age, stood in the middle. On a side table, covered with a cloth of faded green, lay a large family Bible. Behind it were a few books and a tea caddy. In the side of the wall opposite the window was again a box bed. To the eyes of the shepherd-born lad, it looked the most desirable shelter he had ever seen. He turned to his hostess and said, "'I'm feared it's o'er good for me. What could you let me have it for by the week? I would fain bide with ye, but where and when I may get work I cannot tell, so I not take it any gate for mere nor a week.' "'Make yourself at ease till the morn be by,' said the old woman. "'You cannot do nothing till that be o'er. Upon the Monday morning we shall hold a council together, you and me and my man.' I can do nothing wantin' my man. We aye pull together, or not at all. Well content, and with hearty thanks, Donal committed his present fate into the hands of the humble pair, his heaven-sent helpers. And after much washing and brushing, all that was possible to him in the way of dressing, reappeared in the kitchen. Their tea was ready, and the cobbler seated in the window with a book in his hand, leaving for Donal his easy chair. "'I cannot take your own chair, fra ye,' said Donal. "'Hoots!' "'Returned the cobbler. "'What's anything ours for but to give the neighbour it stands in need of it?' "'But ye had a sore day's work. "'And you a sore day's travel. "'But I'm young, and I'm old and my labour the nearer o'er. "'But I'm strong. "'There's none the less need ye so be holdin' so. "'Sit ye down and waste not your backbone. "'My business is to look to the bodies of men, "'and specially to their poor feet it has to bide the weight "'and get sore pressed therein. "'Life's as hard upon the feet of a man as upon any part of him.' When they gang wrong, there is no muckle to be done till they be set right again. I'm sair honoured, I say to myself, whiles, to be set o'er the feet o' men. It's a fine ministration, full better than being a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, for the feet it gang out and in at it is mair nor the door. The Lord be praised, said Donal to himself. There's mair in the world like my father and mither. He took the seat appointed him. Come to the table, Andrew, said the old woman. "'Gin so be you can part with that book o' yours, "'and let your soul give place to your body's rights. "'I doubt, sir, gin he would ate or drink, "'gin I wasna at his elbow. "'Dory,' returned her husband, "'you cannot deny I gie you a bit now and then, "'specially when I come upon anything by or ne'er tasty. "'That you do, Anrew, "'or I dinna ken what would come o' my soul "'any murner o' your body. "'So you see, sir, we're like John Spratt and his wife. "'You'll ken the bairn say about them.' "'Aye, fine that,' replied Donal. "'You couldn't a well be better fitted.' "'God grant it,' she said. "'But we would fit better yet, "'gin I had but a wee mare brains.' "'The Lord kenned what brains you had "'when he brought you together,' said Donal. "'You never uttered a truer word,' replied the cobbler. "'Gin the Lord be content with the brains he's gin ye, "'and I be content with the brains ye give me, "'what right ha ye to be discontented "'with the brains ye had, Dory? "'Answer me that. "'But I should come to the table. "'Would ye allow me to speer after your name, sir?' "'My name's Donal Grant,' replied Donal. "'I thank you, sir, and I'll hold it in respect,' returned the cobbler. "'Mr. Grant, will you ask a blessing?' "'I would rather join in your asking,' replied Donal. The cobbler said a little prayer, and then they began to eat. First of oat cakes, baked by the old woman, then of loaf bread, as they called it. "'I'm sorry I had no jelly or jam to set afore you, sir,' said Dory. "'We are but simple folk, you see.' "'content to hold our earthly tabernacles in a habitable condition "'till we had notice to quit.' "'It's a fine thing to ken,' said the cobbler with a queer look. "'At when you leave it, your house falls down, "'and you had not to think of any damages to pay. "'For by it, gin it last at any time after you was out of it, "'there might be a wean devils taken up their abode into it.' "'Hoot, Andrew,' interposed his wife. "'There's nothing like that in Scripture.' "'Hoot, Dory,' returned Andrew. "'What ken you about what's not in Scripture?' "'Ye ken a heap I allow about what's in Scripture, "'but ye ken little about what's not into it. "'Well, isn't it best to ken what's into it? "'A yont a doubt. "'Well,' she returned in playful triumph. "'Donal saw that he had got hold of a pair of originals. "'It was a joy to his heart. "'He was himself an original, "'one, namely, that lived close to the simplicities of existence. 
Andrew Coman, before offering him house room, would never have asked anyone what he was, but he would have thought it was an equal lapse in breeding not to show interest in the history as well as the person of a guest. After a little more talk, so far from commonplace that the common would have found it mirth-provoking, the cobbler said, "'And what office may you hold yourself, sir, in the ministry of the temple?' "'I think I understand you,' replied Donal. "'My mother says curious things like you.' "'Curious things is whiles no that curious,' remarked Andrew. A pause following, he resumed. "'Can anything give you reason to prefer waiting till you can do you and me a bit better, sir?' he said. "'Count my ill-mannered question no spirit.' "'There's nothing,' answered Donal. "'I'll tell you anything or all thing about myself.' "'Till what you will, sir, and keep what you will,' said the cobbler. "'I was brought up a herd, laddie,' proceeded Donal, "'and whiles a shepherd one. "'For many a year I can't mare about the hillside nor the inglenook, "'but it's the same God and Father upon the hillside and in the king's palace. "'And ye'll ken all about the wind and the clothes "'and the ways of God outside the house. "'I ken something how he holds things gone inside the house.' "'In a body's heart, I mean. "'In mine and Doody's there. "'But I ken little about the way he gars things work "'it he's not so far been in.' "'You dinna surely think God fills not all thing?' "'exclaimed Donal. "'Na, na, I ken better nor that,' answered the cobbler. "'But ye mun allow a tod's holes "'not so deep as the throat of a burning mountain. "'God himself canna win so far been "'in a shallow place as in a deep place. "'He canna be so far been in the winds, "'though he gars them do as he likes, "'as he is, or should be, in your heart and mine, sir.' "'I see,' responded Donal. "'Could that have been how the Lord had to rebuke the wind and the waves, "'as gin they had been gone at their own free will, "'instead of the will at him that made them and set them gone?' "'Maybe, but I would have to think about it before I answered,' replied the cobbler. "'A silence intervened. "'Then said Andrew thoughtfully, "'I thought when I saw you first you was maybe a lad for a shop in the muckle town, "'or a clerk, as they call him, it sits making up accounts.' "'Nah, I'm not that, I thank God,' said Donal. "'What for thank you God for that?' asked Andrew. "'Our place is his. "'I wouldna how you thank God you're not a cobbler like me. "'You might, though, for it's little you can ken of the good of the calling. "'I'll tell you what for,' answered Donal. "'I ken well, town folk think it a heap better "'to have to do with figures nor with sheep. "'But I'm not o' their mind. "'And for one thing, the sheep's alive. "'I could well fancy an angel a shepherd, "'and he would count my father good company. "'Truth, he would want wings and arms and feet and all "'to look after the lamb's wiles.' But gin sick a one was a clerk in a cotton house, he would have to stow away the wings. I cannot see what use he would have for them there. He might be an angel all the time, and that not a fallen one. But he bud to lay aside something to fit the place. But you're not a shepherd the no, said the cobbler. Nah, replied Donal. Sep it be I'm set to look after another greater lamb. A friend, ye may a heard his name, Sir Gilbert Galbraith, made the beginning of a scholar of me, and know I have my degree for the old university at Inverdour. "'Dinna I think is muckle?' cried Mistress Coman triumphant. "'I had not time to say it to ye, Andrew, but I was sure he was for the college, "'and that was how his feet were so muckle worse furnished nor his head.' "'I have a pair of shoon in my kiss, though, when that comes,' said Donal, laughing. "'I only hope it winna be o'er muckle to win up our stair.' "'I dinna think it, but we'll leave it in the street afore it should come atween us,' said Donal. "'Gin ye'll have me, so long as I'm in the town I sae gang na other gate.' "'And you'll doubtless read the Greek like your mither tongue,' said the cobbler, with a longing admiration in his tone. "'Na, nah, not like that, but well enough to get good of it.' "'Well, that's just the one thing I grudge you. "'Na, nah, no grudge. I'm glad you have it. "'But the one thing I would fain be a scholar for myself, "'to think I cannot a cheap of the word spoken by the word himself.' "'But the letter of the word he made little of compare it with the spirit,' said Donal. "'Aye, that's true. "'And yet it's what a man may well be greedy and want to have all thing.' Who has the spirit would fain have the letter too. But it is no matter. I shall set to learning it the first thing when I gang up the stair. That is, gin it be the Lord's will. Hoots, said his wife. What would you do with Greek up there? I so warrant the folk there, I and the maester himself, speaks plain Scotch. What for no? What would they do there with Greek, at a body would have to warstle with from morning to night, and not make out the third part of it? Her husband laughed merrily, but Donal said, "'Deed, maybe you're not so far wrong, good wife. "'I'm thinking there mun be a grand mither tongue there. "'It'll soup up all the lave, "'and be better to understand nor a body's on, "'for it'll be yet more his on. "'Here till him,' cried the cobbler with hearty approbation. "'You can,' Donal went on. "'All the languages of the earth came, "'or look as gin they had come, for a one, "'though we're not just dog sure of that. 
There's my mother's ain Gaelic, for instance. It's as old, maybe older nor the Greek. Anyge, it has mere Greek nor Latin words into it, and ye ken the Greek's an older tongue nor the Latin. Well, gin we could work our way back to the oldest great grandmother tongue of all, I'm thinking it would come a kind of so easy to us, that with the improved faculties of our heavenly condition, we might be able in a few days to hold communication with one another in that same, on stammer or hummed and hawed. But there's been such a heap of things found out since then, in the mind of man as well as in the world outside, said Andrew, that such a language would be mere like a baron's tongue nor a mither's, I'm thinking, when set against all it would be to speak about. You're very right there, I do not doubt. But how easy would it be for Ilkwan to bring in the new word he wanted, having enough common afford to explain it with? Afore long the language would have into it ilk a word it was worth having in any language that ever was spoken since the Torah Babel. Eh, sirs, but it's dreadful to think of having to learn some muckle, said the old woman. I'm o'er old and dull. Her husband laughed again. I did not see what you had to laugh at, she said, laughing too. You'll be dull yourself gin ye live long enough. I'm thinking, said Andrew, but I dinna ken, and it maun be a man's own white gin age makes him dulled. Gin he's aye been holden by the truth, I dinna think he'll find the truth has no holden by him. But what I was laughing at was the thought of anybody being old up there. We'll all be young there, lass. It shall be as Lord Wolves, returned his wife. It shall. We want no more, and eh, we want no less, responded her husband. So the evening wore away. The talk was very to the mind of Donal who never loved wisdom so much as when she appeared in peasant garb. In that garb he had first known her, and in the form of his mother. "'I wonder,' said Dory at length, "'at young Eppie's no puttin' in her appearance. I was sure of her the night. She hasn't been near us all the week.' The cobbler turned to Donal to explain. He would not talk of things their guest did not understand. That would be like shutting him out after taking him in. "'Young Eppie's a grandchild, sir. The only one we have. She's a well-behaved lass,' though tain up with the things of this world mair nor her granny and me could wuss. She's in a place no far for here, not an easy one maybe to give satisfaction in, but she's doing no that ill. Hoot, Anru, she's doing just as well as any lassie of her years could in justice be expected, interposed the grandmother. It's seldom the Lord it sets old head upon young shoulders. The words were hardly spoken when a light foot was heard coming up the stair. But here she comes to answer for herself, she added cheerily. The door of the room opened, and a good-looking girl of about eighteen came in. "'Weel, young Eppie, ho's all with ye,' said the old man. The grandmother's name was Elspeth. The granddaughters had therefore always the prefix. "'Prawly, thank you, grandfather,' she answered. "'How's all with yourself?' "'Oh, weel, cobbled,' he replied. "'Sit ye down,' said the grandmother, "'by the spark of the fire. The night's some airy like.' "'Na, granny, I want na fire,' said the girl. I had run all the road to get a glimpse of ye for the week was out. How's things going up at the castle? Oh, sick like as usual. Only the housekeeper's some doughy, and that puts more upon the life of us. When she's well, she's not one to spare herself, or other folk either. I would not care, gin she would but lip into the body, concluded young Eppy, with a toss of her head. We mauna speak evil of dignities, young Eppy, said the cobbler with a twinkle in his eye. Call ye Mistress Brooks a dignity, grandfather, said the girl with a laugh that was nowise rude. "'I do,' he answered. "'Isn't it she or ye? Had not you to do as she tells you? Atween her and you, that's enough. She's one of the dignities spoken of.' "'I want to dispute it. But, eh, it's queer work, yonder.' "'Take ye care, young Eppie. We mun hold our tongues about things committed till our trust. One paid to serve in a house mun not treat the affairs of that house as gin they were her ain.' "'It would be well gin abadu about the house was as particular as ye would have me, grandfather.' "'Who's my lord, lass?' "'Ow, oh, muckle the same. "'I up the stair and down the stair the fore part of the night, "'and most invisible all day.' "'The girl cast a shy glance now and then at Donal, "'as if she claimed him on her side, "'though the older people must be humoured. "'Donal was not too simple to understand her. "'He gave her look no reception. "'Bethinking himself that they might have matters to talk about, "'he rose, and turning to his hostess, said, "'With your leave, good wife, I would gain to my bed.' I had travelled to matter a thirty mile the day upon my bare feet. Eh, sir, she answered, I ought to have considered that. Come, young Eppie, we mun get the gentleman's bed made up for him. With a toss of her pretty head, Eppie followed her grandmother to the next room, casting a glance behind her that seemed to ask what she meant by calling a lad without shoes or stockings a gentleman. Not the less readily or actively, however, did she assist her grandmother in preparing the tired wayfarer's couch. 
In a few minutes they returned, and telling him the room was quite ready for him, Doherty added a hope that he would sleep as sound as if his own mother had made the bed. He heard them talking for a while after the door was closed, but the girl soon took her leave. He was just falling asleep in the luxury of conscious repose, when the sound of the cobbler's hammer for a moment roused him, and he knew the old man was again at work on his behalf. A moment more and he was too fast asleep for any Cyclops's hammer to wake him. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 7 A Sunday Notwithstanding his weariness, Donal woke early, for he had slept thoroughly. He rose and dressed himself, drew aside the little curtain that shrouded the window, and looked out. It was a lovely morning. His prospect was the curious old main street of the town. The sun that had shone into it was now shining from the other side, but not a shadow of living creature fell upon the rough stones. Yes, there was a cat shooting across them like the culprit he probably was. If there was a garden to the house, he would go and read in the fresh morning air. He stole softly through the outer room and down the stair, found the back door and a water butt, then a garden consisting of two or three plots of flowers well cared for, and ended his discoveries with a seat surrounded and almost canopied with honeysuckle, where doubtless the cobbler sometimes smoked his pipe. Why does he not work here rather than in the archway, thought Donal. But dearly as he loved flowers and light and the free air of the garden, the old cobbler loved the faces of his kind better. His prayer for forty years had been to be made like his master. And if that prayer was not answered, how was it that every year he lived he found himself loving the faces of his fellows more and more? Ever as they passed, instead of interfering with his contemplations, they gave him more and more to think. Were these faces, he asked, the symbols of a celestial language in which God talked to him? Donal sat down and took his Greek testament from his pocket. But all at once, brilliant as was the sun, the light of his life went out, and the vision rose of the grey quarry and the girl turning from him in the wan moonlight. Then swift as thought followed the vision of the women weeping about the forsaken tomb, and with his risen lord he rose also, into a region far above the smoke and stir of this dim spot, a region where life is good even with its sorrow. The man who sees his disappointment beneath him is more blessed than he who rejoices in fruition. Then prayer awoke, and in the light of that morning of peace he drew nigh the living one, and knew him as the source of his being. Weary with blessedness, he leaned against the shadowing honeysuckle, gave a great sigh of content, smiled, wiped his eyes, and was ready for the day and what it should bring. But the bliss went not yet. He sat for a while in the joy of conscious loss in the higher life. With his meditations and feelings mingled now and then a few muffled blows of the cobbler's hammer. He was once more at work on his disabled shoe. Here is a true man, he thought, a godlike helper of his fellow. When the hammer ceased, the cobbler was stitching. When Donal ceased thinking, he went on feeling. Again and again came a little roll of the cobbler's drum, giving glory to God by doing his will. The sweetest and most acceptable music is that which rises from work a-doing. Its incense ascends as from the river in its flowing, from the wind in its blowing, from the grass in its growing. All at once he heard the voices of two women in the next garden close behind him, talking together. Eh, said one, there's that godless creature, Andrew Comyn, at his work again upon the Sabbath morning. Ay, lass, answered the other, I hear him. Eh, but it'll be an ill day for him when he has to appear before the judge of all. He wanna have his commandments broken that gate. Truth na, returned the former. It'll be a sair settling day for him. Donal rose and looking about him saw two decent elderly women on the other side of the low stone wall. He was approaching them with the request on his lips to know which of the Lord's commandments they supposed the cobbler to be breaking, when, seeing that he must have overheard them, they turned their backs and walked away. And now his hostess, having discovered he was in the garden, came to call him to breakfast, the simplest of meals, 
porridge, with a cup of tea after, because it was Sunday, and there was danger of sleepiness at the kirk. "'Your shoon's waiting you, sir,' said the cobbler. "'You'll find them a better job nor ye expected. "'They're a better job any gate nor I expected.' Donal made haste to put them on, and felt dressed for the Sunday. "'Are ye going to the kirk the day, Andrew?' asked the old woman, adding, as she turned to their guest, "'My man's rather peculiar about going to the kirk. "'Some days he'll gang three times, and some days he went again once. "'He kens himsel' what for,' she added with a smile, "'whose sweetness confessed that, whatever was the reason, "'it was to her the best in the world. "'I am going the day. "'I want to gang with our new friend,' he answered. "'I'll take him, gin ye dinna care to gang,' rejoined his wife. "'Oh, uh, I'll gang,' he persisted. "'It'll give us something to talk about, "'and so ken one another better, "'and maybe come a bit nearer one another, "'and so a bit nearer the maister. "'That's what we're here for, coming and going.' "'As ye please, Andrew. "'What's right to you is I right to me. "'On my own self I would be doubtful "'a sucker reason for going to the kirk, "'to get something to speak about.' "'It's a good reason, where you have not a better,' "'he answered. "'It's often I get at the kirk nothing but what angers me. "'Lays and lies again, my lord and my god.' But when there's one to talk it o'er with, one that has some care for God as well as for himself, there's some good sure to come out of it. Some revelation of the real righteousness. No what folk get gangs by the minister's calls righteousness. Is your shoon comfortable to your feet, sir? Ay, that they are. And I thank ye. They're full better nor new. Will we winna have worship this morning? When ye gang to the kirk, it's like eating mare nor is good for ye. Who tanneru? Ye dinna think a body can have o'er muckle o' the word, said his wife. "'anxious as to the impression he might make on Donal. "'Oh, na, nah. can a body take it in and digest it? "'But it's not a bonny thing to have the words sticking about your mouth "'and bagging out your poaches, not to say lying cold upon your stomach, "'and it for the life of men. "'The less you take upon what you put in practice, the better, "'and gin the thing said had nothing to do with practice, "'the less ye heed it, the better. "'Gin ye had done your breakfast, sir, we'll gang. "'Not at its freely kirk time yet, "'but the Sabbath's most the only day I get a bit of a walk.' "'And gin ye have no objection till a turn about the Lord's muckle house "'afore we gang into his little one. "'We call it his, but I doubt it. "'I'll be ready in a minute.' "'Donal willingly agreed, "'and the cobbler, already clothed in part of his Sunday best, "'a pair of corduroy trousers of a mouse colour, "'having endued an ancient tail-coat of blue with gilt buttons, "'they set out together, "'and for their conversation it was just the same "'as it would have been any other day. "'Where every day is not the Lord's, "'the Sunday is his least of all.' They left the town, and were soon walking in meadows through which ran a clear river, shining and speedy in the morning sun. Its banks were largely used for bleaching, and the long lines of white in the lovely green of the natural grass were pleasant both to eye and mind. All about, the rooks were feeding in peace, knowing their freedom that day from the persecution to which, like all other doers of good, they are in general exposed. Beyond the stream lay a level plain stretching towards the sea, divided into numberless fields and dotted with farmhouses and hamlets. On the side where the friends were walking, the ground was more broken, rising in places into small hills, many of them wooded. Half a mile away was one of a conical shape, on whose top towered a castle. Old and grey and sullen, it lifted itself from the foliage around it like a great rock from a summer sea, and stood out against the clear blue sky of the June morning. The hill was covered with wood, mostly rather young, but at the bottom were some ancient firs and beeches. At the top, round the base of the castle, the trees were chiefly delicate birches with moonlight skin, and feathery larches not thriving over well. "'What call they yon castle?' questioned Donal. "'It maun be a place of some importance.' "'They mostly call it just the castle,' answered the cobbler. "'It's old name's Graham's Grip. "'It's Lord Morven's place, and they call it Castle Graham. "'The family name's Graham, you ken.' They call themselves Graham Graham, just two ways of spelling the name putting together. The last lord, not upon the main branch, they tell me, spelled his name with a diphthong, and wasn't a willing to give it up altogether. So took the two of them. Yon's where young Eppie's at service. And that minds me, sir, ye hanna tell me yet what kind of a place ye would have yourself. It's not at a poor body like me can help, but it's I will to let folk ken what you're after. A word gangs spearin long after it's out of sight, and the answer may come from far. The Lord Wiles brings about things in the most unlikely fashion. "'I'm ready for anything I'm fit to do,' said Donal. "'But I had what's called a good education, 
though I had learned more from my own needs than for all my books. So I would rather till the human than the earthly soil, taking more interest in the schoolmaster's crops than in the farmer's. Would ye object to master one by himself, or maybe two? Na, surely. Can I saw myself fit? Eppy mentioned last night that there was word about the castle of a tutor for the youngest. Have ye any way of approaching the place? Not till the minister comes home, answered Donal. I have a letter to him. He'll be back by the middle of the week, I hear them say. Can ye tell me anything about the people at the castle? asked Donal. I could, answered Andrew. But some things is better found out nor ken aforehand. Ilka place has its own shape, and most things has to have some parent to gar them fit. That's what I tell young Eppy, many's the time. Here came a pause, and when Andrew spoke again it seemed on a new line. Did it ever occur to you, sir, he said, that maybe death might be the first waken to some folk? It has occurred to me, answered Donal, but many things come into Labody's head and he's not able to think out. They maun lie and bide their time. Let none of the lovers of law and letter persuade ye the Lord wadna have ye think though none but him it obeys can think with safety. We maun do first the thing that we can, and sen we may think about the thing that we dinna ken. I fancy at whiles the Lord would not say a thing, just not to stop folk thinking about it. He was I at getting them to make use of the candle of the Lord. It's my belief the main obstacles to the growth of the kingdom are first the unbelief of believers, and sen the way that they lay down the law. Afore they learnt the rudiments of the truth themselves, they begin to lay the grievous burden of their dullness and ill-conceived notions of holy things upon the minds and consciences of their neighbours. Fain you would think to hold them from growing any more nor themselves. Eh, man, but the Lord's wonderful. You may dare and dare, and not come in sight of him. The church stood a little way out of the town, in a churchyard overgrown with grass, which the wind blew like a field of corn. Many of the stones were out of sight in it. The church, a relic of old Catholic days, rose out of it like one that had taken to growing and so got the better of his ills. They walked into the musty, dingy, brown-atmosphered house. The cobbler led the way to a humble place behind a pillar. There Doherty was seated, waiting them. The service was not so dreary to Donal as usual. The sermon had some thought in it, and his heart was drawn to a man who would say he did not understand. "'Yon was a fine discourse,' remarked the cobbler as they went homeward. Donal saw nothing fine in it, but his experience was not so wide as the cobbler's. To him the discourse had hinted many things which had not occurred to Donal. Some people demand from the householder none but new things, others none but old, whereas we need in truth of all the sorts in his treasury. "'I had not a doubt it was all right, and as you say, Anru,' said his wife, "'but for myself I could make neither head nor tail of it.' "'I said not, Dory, it was all right,' returned her husband, that would be to say a heap for anything human. But it was a good, honest sermon. "'What was yon he said about the miracles not being types?' asked his wife. "'It was God's truth, that,' he said. "'Give me a share of the same, I beg o' ye, Andrew Coleman.' "'What the man said was this. At the sea it Peter got out upon, was not first and foremost to be looked upon as a type of the inward and spiritual troubles of the believer, still less the troubles of the Church of Christ.' The Lord deals with facts, none the less, that they cannot help being types. Here was terrible facts to Peter. Here was angry water and roaring wind. Here was danger and fear. The man had to trust or gang down. Gin the house be on fire, we maun trust. Gin the water gang o'er our heads, we maun trust. Gin the horse run away, we maun trust. Him it cannot trust in sick like conditions, I would not give a plaque for any other kind of faith he may have. God's not a mere thought in the world of thought but a living poor in all worlds alike. Him it gangs to God with a sair head, will the sooner gang to him with a sair heart. And them it thinks not he cares for the pains of their bodies, will ill believe he cares for the doubts and perplexities of their inquiring spirits. To my mind he spake the best of sense. I didn't hear him say anything like that, said Donal. Did you know? Well, I thought it came for him to me. Maybe I was not getting the best heed, said Donal. But what you say is as true as the sun. It stands to reason. The day passed in pleasure and quiet. Donal had found another father and mother. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 8 The Gate. The next day after breakfast, Donal said to his host, "'No, I mun pay ye for my shoon, for again I dinna pay at once I cannot tell how muckle to call my in, and what I had to gang by till I get more.' "'Na, na,' returned the cobbler. "'There's just one prejudice I had left concerning the Sabbath day. I firmly believe it a prejudice, for siller's the Lord's due, but I cannot win o'er it. I cannot bring myself to take siller for any work done upon it. So ye mun just be content to let that flay stick to the Lord's wall. You'll do as muckle for me some day.' "'There is nothing left me but to thank ye,' said Donal. "'There's the lodging and the board, though. "'I mun ken about them afore we gang farther.' "'They're none of my business,' replied Andrew. "'I leave all that to the good wife, "'and I counsel ye to do the same. "'She's a capital manager, and winna charge ye o'er muckle.' "'Donal could but yield, and presently went out for a stroll. "'He wandered along the bank of the river "'till he came to the foot of the hill on which stood the castle. "'Seeing a gate, he approached it and finding it open, went in. A slow ascending drive went through the trees, round and round the hill. He followed it a little way. An aromatic air now blew and now paused as he went. The trees seemed climbing up to attack the fortress above, which he could not see. When he had gone a few yards out of sight of the gate, he threw himself down among them and fell into a reverie. The ancient time arose before him, when, without a tree to cover the approach of an enemy, the castle rose defiant and bare in its strength, like an athlete stripped for the fight, and the little town huddled close under its protection. What wars had there blustered, what rumors blown, what fears whispered, what sorrows moaned? But were there not now just as many evils as then? Let the world improve as it may, the deeper ill only breaks out afresh in new forms. Time itself, the staring, vacant, unlovely time, is to many the one dread foe. Others have a house empty and garnished, in which neither love nor hope dwells, a self with no God to protect from it, a self unrulable, insatiable, makes of existence to some the hell called madness. Godless man is a horror of the unfinished, a hopeless necessity for the unattainable. The most discontented are those who have all the truthless heart desires. Thoughts like these were coming and going in Donald's brain, when he heard a slight sound somewhere near him, the lightest of sounds indeed, the turning of the leaf of a book. He raised his head and looked, but could see no one. At last, up through the tree boles on the slope of the hill, he caught the shine of something white. It was the hand that held an open book. He took it for the hand of a lady. The trunk of a large tree hid the reclining form. He would go back. There was the lovely cloth-striped meadow to lie in. He rose quietly, but not quietly enough to steal away. From behind the tree, a young man, rather tall and slender, rose and came towards him. Donal stood to receive him. "'I presume you are unaware that these grounds are not open to the public,' he said, not without a touch of haughtiness. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Donal. "'I found the gate open, and the shade of the trees was enticing.' "'It is of no consequence,' returned the youth, now with some condescension." "'Only my father is apt to be annoyed if he sees anyone.' He was interrupted by a cry from farther up the hill. "'Oh, there you are, Percy!' "'And there you are, Davy,' returned the youth kindly. A boy of about ten came towards them precipitately, jumping stumps and darting between stems. "'Take care, take care, Davy!' cried the other. "'You may slip on a root and fall.' "'Oh, I know better than that. "'But you are engaged.' "'Not in the least. Come along.' Donal lingered. The youth had not finished his speech. "'I went to Arky,' said the boy, "'but she couldn't help me. I can't make sense of this. I wouldn't care if it wasn't a story.' He had an old folio under one arm, with a finger of the other hand in its leaves. "'It is a curious taste for a child,' said the youth, turning to Donal, in whom he had recognized the peasant scholar. "'This little brother of mine reads all the dull old romances he can lay his hands on.' "'Perhaps,' suggested Donal, they are the only fictions within his reach. Could you not turn him loose upon Sir Walter Scott? A good suggestion, he answered, casting a keen glance at Donal. Will you let me look at the passage? said Donal to the boy, holding out his hand. 
The boy opened the book and gave it him. On the top of the page, Donal read, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. He had read of the book, but had never seen it. That's a grand book, he said. Horribly dreary, remarked the elder brother. The younger reached up and laid his finger on the page next him. There, sir, he said, that is the place. Do tell me what it means. I will try, answered Donal. I may not be able. He began to read at the top of the page. That's not the place, sir, said the boy. It is there. I must know something of what goes before it first, returned Donal. Oh, yes, sir. I see, he answered, and stood silent. He was a fair-haired boy, with ruddy cheeks and a healthy look, sweet-tempered, evidently. Donal presently saw both what the sentence meant and the cause of his difficulty. He explained the thing to him. "'Thank you! Thank you! Now I shall get on!' he cried, and ran up the hill. "'You seem to understand, boys,' said the brother. "'I have always had a sort of ambition to understand ignorance.' "'Understand ignorance. "'You know what queer shapes the shadows of the plainest things take. "'I never seem to understand anything till I understand its shadow.' "'The youth glanced keenly at Donal. "'I wish I had had a tutor like you,' he said. "'Why?' asked Donal. "'I should have done better.' "'Where do you live?' Donal told him he was lodging with Andrew Comyn, the cobbler. A silence followed. "'Good morning,' said the youth. "'Good morning, sir,' returned Donal, and went away. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donald Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 9 The Morven Arms On Wednesday evening, Donald went to the Morven Arms to inquire for the third time if his box was come. The landlord said if a great heavy tool chest was the thing he expected, it had come. Donald Grant would be the name upon it, said Donal. "'Deed I didna look,' said the landlord. "'It's in the back yard.' As Donal went through the house to the yard, he passed the door of a room where some of the townsfolk sat, and heard the earl mentioned. He had not asked Andrew anything about the young man he had spoken with, for he understood that his host held himself not at liberty to talk about the family in which his granddaughter was a servant. But what was said in public he surely might hear— he requested the landlord to let him have a bottle of ale, and went into the room and sat down. It was a decent parlour with a sanded floor. Those assembled were a mixed company from town and country, having a tumbler of whisky toddy together after the market. One of them was a stranger who had been receiving from the others various pieces of information concerning the town and its neighbourhood. "'I mind the old man Will,' a wrinkled grey-haired man was saying as Donal entered. "'A very different man for this present.' He would sit down as ready as no, that would he, with any poor body like myself, and give him his cracks, and hear his news, and drink his glass, and make nothing o't. But this man hath, who ever saw him change word with brother man? I never heard how he came to the title. They say he was but some far away cousin, remarked a farmer looking man, florid and stout. Hoots, he was earned brother to the last yearl. We write to the title, though none to the property. That he's but taken care o' till his niece comes o' age. He was a heap about the place afore his brother died, and they were friends as Wales brothers. They say at the Lady Arctura, hard ye ever sick a heathenish name for a lass, is born to marry the young lord. There's a sight o' clapper clash about the place, and their folk and their strange ways. They tell me none can be said to ken the yearl, but his own man. For myself I never came in their council, not even to the buying or selling o' a lamb. Well, said a fair haired, pale faced man, we ken for a scripture, at the sins of the fathers is visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And who can tell? Who can tell, rejoined another, who had a judicial look about him, in spite of an unshaven beard, and a certain general disregard to appearances. Who can tell but the sins of our fathers may be lying upon some of ourselves at this very moment? In our case I cannot see the thing would be fair, said a fifth. We didn't even ken what they did. We are not to interfere with the will of the Almighty, rejoined the former. It gangs its own gate, and mortal cannot tell what that gate is. His justice winna be countered. Donal felt that to be silent now would be to decline witnessing. 
He feared argument, lest he should fail and wrong the right, but he must not therefore hang back. He drew his chair towards the table. "'Would you let a stranger put in a word, friends?' he said. "'Oh, aye, and welcome. We set not up for the men at Gotham.' "'Well, I would spear a question, gin I may.' "'Spear away. Answer I winna ensure,' said the man unshaven. "'Well, would you please tell me what you call the justice of God?' "'Anybody could tell you that. It consists in the punishment of sin. He gives ilk a sinner what his sin deserves.' "'That seems to me a uncle one-sided definition of justice.' "'Well, what would ye make of it?' "'I would say justice means fair play. "'And the justice of God lies in this, "'at he gives ilk a man, beast, and devil fair play.' "'I'm doubtful about that,' said a drover-looking fellow. "'We maun gang by the word, "'and the word says he visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children "'to the third and fourth generation. "'I never could see the fair play of that.' "'Dinna ye meddle with things, John, ye dinna understand. "'Ye may wake in the wrong box.' said the old man. "'I want to understand,' returned John. "'I'm not saying he disna do right. "'I'm only saying I canna see the fair play of it. "'It may well be right, and you no see it. "'Aye, well that. "'But what for should I no say I dinna see it? "'Isna the blind man to say is blind?' "'This was unanswerable, and Donal again spoke. "'It seems to me,' he said, "'we need first to understand what's contained "'in the visiting of the sins of the fathers upon the children, "'afore we dar any judgment concerning it.' "'Aye, that's sense enough,' confessed a responsive murmur. "'I hadna seen muckle of this world yet, compared with you, sirs,' Donal went on. "'But I have been a heap my lawn with nought and sheep, "'when a heap of things go through my head, "'and I have seen something as well, though no that muckle. "'I have seen a man, all his life afore a deuce honest man, "'come to the heap of silver and gang to the dogs.' "'A second murmur seemed to indicate corroboration. "'He got all to the dogs, as I say,' continued Donal. "'and the bairns he left behind him when he died to drink "'came upon the Paris, or would a hungered "'but for some it kenned him when he was yet in honour and poverty. "'Now, would you not say this was a visiting of the sins of the father upon the children?' "'Aye, doubtless. "'Well, when I heard last about them, "'they were all like enough to turn out honest lads and lasses. "'Oh, I dare say. "'And what might you think the probability "'gin they had come into the lot of siller when their father died?' "'Maybe they might have gone the same gate he gaed. Was there injustice then, or was there favour in that visiting of the sins of their father upon them? There was no answer. The toddy went down their throats, and the smoke came out of their mouths, but no one dared acknowledge it might be a good thing to be born poor instead of rich. So entirely was the subject dropped, that Donal feared he had failed to make himself understood. He did not know the general objection to talking of things on eternal principles. We set up for judges of right, while our very selves are wrong. He saw that he had cast a wet blanket over the company, and judged it better to take his leave. Borrowing a wheelbarrow, he trundled his chest home, and unpacking it in the archway, carried his books and clothes to his room. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Donald Grant – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 10. The Parish Clergyman. The next day, Donal put on his best coat and went to call on the minister. Shown into the study, he saw seated there the man he had met on his first day's journey, the same who had parted from him in such displeasure. He presented his letter. Mr. Carmichael gave him a keen glance, but uttered no word until he had read it. "'Well, young man,' he said, looking up at him with concentrated severity, "'what would you have me do?' "'Tell me of any situation you may happen to know or hear of, sir,' said Donal. "'That is all I could expect.' "'All,' repeated the clergyman, with something very like a sneer. "'But what if I think that all a very great deal? "'What if I imagine myself set in charge over young minds and hearts? "'What if I know you better than the good man whose friendship for your parents "'gives him a kind interest in you? "'You little thought how you were undermining your prospects last Friday. "'My old friend would scarcely have me welcome to my parish, "'one he may be glad to see out of his own. "'You can go to the kitchen and have your dinner. "'I have no desire to render evil for evil.' "'but I will not bid you Godspeed, 
and the sooner you take yourself out of this young man, the better. Good morning, sir, said Donal, and left the room. On the doorstep he met a youth he had known by sight at the university. It was the minister's son, the worst behaved of all the students. Was this a case of the sins of the father being visited on the child? Does God never visit the virtues of the father on the child? A little ruffled, and not a little disappointed, Donal walked away. Almost unconsciously he took the road to the castle, and coming to the gate, leaned on the top bar and stood thinking. Suddenly, down through the trees came Davy bounding, pushed his hand through between the bars, and shook hands with him. "'I have been looking for you all day,' he said. "'Why?' asked Donal. "'Forgu sent you a letter.' "'I have had no letter. Eppy took it this morning. "'Ah, that explains. I have not been home since breakfast. "'It was to say my father would like to see you. "'I will go and get it. Then I shall know what to do. "'Why do you live there? The cobbler is a dirty little man. "'Your clothes will smell of leather.' "'He is not dirty,' said Donal. "'His hands do get dirty, very dirty with his work, "'and his face, too, and I dare say soap and water can't get them quite clean. "'But he will have a nice earth bath one day, "'and that will take all the dirt off. "'And if you could see his soul, that is as clean as clean can be, "'so clean it is quite shining.' "'Have you seen it?' said the boy, looking up at Donal, "'unsure whether he was making game of him "'or meaning something very serious. "'I have had a glimpse or two of it, I never saw a cleaner. You know, my dear boy, there's a cleanness much deeper than the skin. I know, said Davy, but stared as if he wondered he would speak of such things. Donal returned his gaze. Out of the fullness of his heart his eyes shone. Davy was reassured. Can you ride? he asked. Yes, a little. Who taught you? An old mare I was fond of. Ah, you are making game of me. I do not like to be made game of, said Davy, and turned away. "'No, indeed,' replied Donal. "'I never make game of anybody. "'But now I will go and find the letter.' "'I would go with you,' said the boy. "'But my father will not let me be on the grounds. "'I don't know why.' "'Donal hastened home and found himself eagerly expected, "'for the letter young Eppy had brought was from the Earl. "'It informed Donal that it would give his lordship pleasure to see him "'if he would favour him with a call. "'In a few minutes he was again on the road to the castle. "'End of chapter 10《ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハ to its crown of silvery birches, above which, as often as the slowly circling road brought him to the other side, he saw rise like a helmet the gray mass of the fortress. Turret and tower, pinnacle and battlement, appeared and disappeared as he climbed. Not until at last he stood almost on the top, and from an open space beheld nearly the whole front, could he tell what it was like. It was a grand pile, but looked a gloomy one to live in. He stood on a broad, grassy platform, from which rose a gravel terrace, and from the terrace the castle. He ran his eye along the front, seeking a door, but saw none. Ascending the terrace by a broad flight of steps, he approached a deep recess in the front, where two portions of the house of differing date nearly met. Inside this recess he found a rather small door, flush with the wall, thickly studded and plated with iron, surmounted by the Morven horses carved in grey stone, and surrounded with several mouldings. Looking for some means of announcing his presence, he saw a handle at the end of a rod of iron, and pulled, but heard nothing. The sound of the bell was smothered in a wilderness of stone walls. By and by, however, appeared an old servant, bowed and slow, with plentiful hair white as wool, and a mingled look of childishness and caution in his wrinkled countenance. "'The Earl wants to see me,' said Donal. "'What name?' said the man." Donal Grant, but his lordship will be nothing the wiser, I suspect. I don't think he knows my name. Tell him the young man he sent for to Andrew Comins. The man left him, and Donal began to look about him. The place where he stood was a mere entry, a cell in huge walls, with a second, a low, round-headed door, like the entrance to a prison by which the butler had disappeared. 
There was nothing but bare stone around him, with again the Morven arms cut deep into it on one side. The ceiling was neither vaulted nor groined nor flat, but seemed determined by the accidental concurrence of ends of stone stairs and corners of floors on different levels. It was full ten minutes before the man returned and requested him to follow him. Immediately Donal found himself in a larger and less irregular stone case, adorned with heads and horns and skins of animals. Crossing this, the man opened a door covered with red cloth, which looked strange in the midst of the cold, hard stone, and Donal entered an octagonal space, its doors of dark, shining oak, with carved stone lintels and doorposts, and its walls adorned with arms and armor almost to the domed ceiling. Into it, as if it descended suddenly out of some far height, but dropping at last like a gently alighting bird, came the end of a turnpike stair, of slow sweep and enormous diameter, such a stair as in wildest Gothic tale he had never imagined. Like the revolving center of a huge shell it went up out of sight, with plain promise of endless convolutions beyond. It was of ancient stone, but not worn as would have been a narrow stair. A great rope of silk, a modern addition, ran up along the wall for a handrail, and with slow-moving withered hand upon it, up the glorious ascent climbed the serving man, suggesting to Donal's eye the crawling of an insect, to his heart the redemption of the sons of God. With the stair yet ascending above them as if it would never stop, the man paused upon a step no broader than the rest, and opening a door in the round of the well said, "'Mr. Grant, my lord,' and stood aside for Donal to enter. He found himself in the presence of a tall, bowed man, with a large-featured white face, thin and worn, and a deep sunken eye that gleamed with an unhealthy life. His hair was thin, but covered his head, and was only streaked with grey. His hands were long and thin and white. His feet in large shoes, looking the larger that they came out from narrow trousers, which were of shepherd tartan. His coat was of light blue, with a high collar of velvet, and much too wide for him. A black silk neckerchief tied carelessly about his throat, and a waistcoat of pineapple shawl stuff, completed his dress. On one long little finger shone a stone which Donal took for an emerald. He motioned his visitor to a seat, and went on writing, with a rudeness more like that of a successful contractor than a nobleman. But it gave Donal the advantage of becoming a little accustomed to his surroundings. The room was not large, was wainscoted, and had a good many things on the walls. Donal noted two or three riding whips, a fishing rod, several pairs of spurs, a sword with golden hilt, a strange-looking dagger like a flame of fire, one or two old engravings, and what seemed a plan of the estate. At the one window, small, with a stone mullion, the summer sun was streaming in. The earl sat in its flood, and in the heart of it seemed cold and bloodless. He looked about sixty years of age, and as if he rarely or never smiled. Donal tried to imagine what a smile would do for his face, but failed. He was not in the least awed by the presence of the great man. What is rank to the man who honors everything human? Has no desire to look what he is not. Has nothing to conceal and nothing to compass. Is fearful of no tomorrow and does not respect riches. Towards such ends of being, the tide of Donal's life was at least setting. So he sat neither fidgeting nor staring, but quietly taking things in. The earl raised himself, pushed his writing from him, turned towards him, and said with courtesy, "'Excuse me, Mr. Grant. I wish to talk to you with the ease of duty done.' More polite his address could not have been, but there was a something between him and Donal that was not to be passed, a nameless gulf of the negative. "'My time is at your lordship's service,' replied Donal, with the ease that comes of simplicity. "'You have probably guessed why I sent for you?' "'I have hoped, my lord.' There was something of old-world breeding about the lad that commended him to the earl. Such breeding is not rare among Celt-born peasants. "'My sons told me that they had met a young man in the grounds, for which I beg your lordship's pardon,' said Donal. "'I did not know the place was forbidden. "'I hope you will soon be familiar with it. "'I am glad of your mistake. "'From what they said, I supposed you might be a student in want of a situation, "'and I had been looking out for a young man to take charge of the boy.' It seemed possible you might serve my purpose. I do not question you can show yourself fit for such an office. I presume it would suit you. Do you believe yourself one to be so trusted? 
Donal had not a glimmer of false modesty. He answered immediately, I do, my lord. Tell me something of your history. Where were you born? What were your parents? Donal told him all he thought it of any consequence he should know. His lordship did not once interrupt him with question or remark. When he had ended, Well, he said, I like all you tell me. You have testimonials? I have, from the professors, my lord, and one from the minister of the parish, who knew me before I went to college. I could get one from Mr. Sclater, too, whose church I attended while there. Show me what you have, said his lordship. Donal took the papers from the pocket-book his mother had made him, and handed them to him. The earl read them with some attention, returning each to him without remark as he finished it, only saying with the last, "'Quite satisfactory.' "'But,' said Donal, "'there is one thing I should be more at ease if I told your lordship. "'Mr. Carmichael, the minister of this parish, "'would tell you I was an atheist, or something very like it, "'therefore an altogether unsafe person. "'But he knows nothing of me.' "'On what grounds, then, would he say so?' "'asked the earl, showing not the least discomposure. "'I thought you were a stranger to this place.' "'Donal told him how they had met, "'what had passed between them, and how the minister had behaved in consequence. His lordship heard him gravely, was silent for a moment, and then said, "'Should Mr. Carmichael address me on the subject, which I do not think likely, he will find me already too much prejudiced in your favour. But I can imagine his mistaking your freedom of speech. You are scarcely prudent enough. Why say all you think?' "'I fear nothing, my lord.' The earl was silent. His grey face seemed to grow greyer. But it might be that just then the sun went under a cloud, and he was suddenly folded in shadow. After a moment he spoke again. "'I am quite satisfied with you so far, Mr. Grant, and as I should not like to employ you in direct opposition to Mr. Carmichael, not that I belong to his church, we will arrange matters before he can hear of the affair. What salary do you want?' Donal replied he would prefer leaving the salary to his lordship's judgment upon trial. "'I am not a wealthy man,' returned his lordship, "'and would prefer an understanding. "'Try me, then, for three months, my lord. "'Give me my board and lodging, the use of your library, "'and at the end of the quarter a ten-pound note. "'By that time you will be able to tell whether I suit you.' "'The earl nodded agreement, and Donal rose at once. "'With a heart full of thankfulness and hope, "'he walked back to his friends. "'He had before him pleasant work, "'plenty of time and book help, "'an abode full of interest,' and something for his labour. "'Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee,' said the cobbler, rejoicing against the minister. "'The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain.' In the afternoon, Donal went into the town to get some trifles he wanted before going to the castle. As he turned to the door of a draper's shop, he saw at the counter the minister talking to him. He would rather have gone elsewhere, but for unwillingness to turn his back on anything. He went in. Beside the minister stood a young lady, who, having completed her purchases, was listening to their conversation. The draper looked up as he entered. A glance passed between him and the minister. He came to Donal, and having heard what he wanted, left him, went back to the minister, and took no more notice of him. Donal found it awkward, and left the shop. "'High and mighty,' said the draper, annoyed at losing the customer to whose dispraise he had been listening." "'Far beyond dissent, John,' said the minister, pursuing a remark. "'Doubtless, sir, it is that,' answered the draper. "'I'm thankful to say I never harboured a doubt myself, "'but I took what I was told on argle bargle. "'What how we suck as yourself said o'er us for, "'gin it be not to hold us in the straight path "'o what we're to believe and not to believe. "'It's a fine thing not to be accountable.' "'The minister was an honest man "'so far as he knew himself and honesty, "'and did not relish this form of submission.' but he did not ask himself where was the difference between accepting the word of man and accepting man's explanation of the word of God. He took a huge pinch from his black snuff-box and held his peace. In the evening Donal would settle his account with Mistress Comyn. He found her demand so much less than he had expected that he expostulated. She was firm, however, and assured him she had gained, not lost. As he was putting up his things, "'Leave a book or two, sir,' she said, uh, when you look in, the place may look home-like. We shall call the room yours. Come as often as you can. It does my Andrew's heart good to have a crack with one at ken something o' what the master would be at. Many one'll call him lord, but few will take the trouble to ken what he would have o' them. But there's my Andrew. He'll sit yonder at his work, thinking by the oar together, or something the master said it he cannot win at the rights of. 
"'Depend upon it,' he says, Wiles. "'Depend upon it, lass. "'What anything he says does no look right to us. "'It maun be it we had not one at it.' "'As she ended, her husband came in "'and took up what he fancied the thread of the dialogue. "'And what are we to think of the man?' he said. "'It's content not to understand what he was at the trouble to say. "'Would he say things that he didn't mean folk to understand when he said them?' "'Weel, Anneroo,' said his wife. "'There's many a thing he said it I cannot understand.' "'Neither am I muckle the better for your explaining of the same. "'I maun just let it sit.' "'Andrew laughed his quiet, pleased laugh. "'Weel, lass,' he said, "'the doing o' one thing's better nor the understanding o' twenty. "'Nor will ye be long on understand muckle it's dark to ye now, "'for the maester likes none but the doer o' the word, "'and her he likes well. "'Be blithe, lass. "'You sa have your fill o' understanding yet.' "'I'm fain to believe ye speak the truth, Anneroo.' "'It's great truth,' said Donal. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of Donald Grant。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 12. THE CASTLE The next morning came a cart from the castle to fetch his box, and after breakfast he set out for his new abode. He took the path by the riverside. The morning was glorious. The sun and the river and the birds were jubilant, and the wind gave life to everything. It rippled the stream and fluttered the long webs bleaching in the sun. They rose and fell like white waves on the bright green lake, and women— Homely myriads of the grassy sea were besprinkling them with spray. There were dull sounds of wooden machinery near, but they made no discord with the sweetness of the hour, speaking only of activity, not labor. From the long bleaching meadows by the riverside rose the wooded base of the castle. Donal's bosom swelled with delight. Then came a sting. Was he already forgetting his inextinguishable grief? But, he answered himself, God is more to me than any woman. When he puts joy in my heart, shall I not be glad? When he calls my name, shall I not answer? He stepped out joyfully, and was soon climbing the hill. He was again admitted by the old butler. I will show you at once, he said, how to go and come at your own will. He led him through doors and along passages to a postern opening on a little walled garden at the east end of the castle. This door, he said, is, you observe, at the foot of Balliol's tower, and in that tower is your room. I will show it you. He led the way up a spiral stair that might almost have gone inside the newel of the great staircase. Up and up they went, until Donal began to wonder, and still they went up. You're young, sir, said the butler, and sound of wind and limb, so you'll soon think nothing of it. I never was up so high before, except on a hillside, returned Donal. The college tower is nothing to this. In a day or two you'll be shooting up and down it like a bird. I used to do so myself. I got into the way of keeping a shoulder foremost and screwing up as if I was a blob of air. Old age does make fools of us. You don't like it, then? No, I do not. Who does? It's only that you get spent as you go up. The fresh air at the top of the stair will soon revive you, said Donal. But his conductor did not understand him. That's all very well, so long as you're young— but when it has got you, you'll pant and grumble like the rest of us. In the distance, Donal saw age coming slowly after him, to claw him in his clutch, as the old song says. Please God, he thought, by the time he comes up, I'll be ready to try a fall with him. O oh, thou eternally young, the years have no hold on thee. Let them have none on thy child. I too shall have life eternal. Ere they reached the top of the stair, the man halted and opened a door. Donal entering saw a small room, nearly round, a portion of the circle taken off by the stair. On the opposite side was a window projecting from the wall, whence he could look in three different directions. The wide country lay at his feet. He saw the winding road by which he had ascended, the gate by which he had entered, the meadow with its white stripes through which he had come, and the river flowing down. He followed it with his eyes. Lo, there was the sea, shining in the sun like a diamond shield. It was but the little German ocean, yet one with the great world ocean. He turned to his conductor. 
"'Yes,' said the old man, answering his look. "'It's a glorious sight. "'When first I looked out there, I thought I was in eternity.' "'The walls were bare even of plaster. "'He could have counted the stones in them, "'but they were dry as a bone. "'You are wondering,' said the old man, "'how you are to keep warm in the winter. "'Look here. "'You shut this door over the window. "'See how thick and strong it is. "'There is your fireplace, "'and for fuel there's plenty below. "'It is a labor to carry it up, I grant, "'but if I was you I would set to a night's "'when nobody was about, "'and carry till I had a stock laid in.' "'But,' said Donal, "'I should fill up my room.' "'I like to be able to move about a little.' "'Ah,' replied the old man, "'you don't know what a space you have up here all to yourself. "'Come this way.' Two turns more up the stair, and they came to another door. It opened into wide space. From it Donal stepped on a ledge or bartizan, without any parapet, that ran round the tower, passing above the window of his room. It was well he had a steady brain, for he found the height affect him more than that of a precipice on Glashgar. Doubtless he would get used to it, for the old man had stepped out without the smallest hesitation. Round the tower he followed him. On the other side, a few steps rose to a watchtower, a sort of ornate sentry-box in stone, where one might sit and regard with wide vision the whole country. Avoiding this, another step or two led them to the roof of the castle, of great stone slabs. A broad passage ran between the rise of the roof and a battlemented parapet. By this time they came to a flat roof, on to which they descended by a few steps. Here stood two rough sheds, with nothing in them. "'There's stowage,' said the old man. "'Yes, indeed,' answered Donal, to whom the idea of his airy was growing more and more agreeable. "'But would there be no objection to my using the place for such a purpose?' "'What objection?' returned his guide. "'I doubt if a single person but myself knows it.' "'And shall I be allowed to carry up as much as I please?' "'I allow you,' said the butler, with importance. "'Of course you will not waste. I am dead against waste. But as to what is needful, use your freedom. Dinner will be ready for you in the schoolroom at seven. At the door of his room the old man left him, and after listening for a moment to his descending steps, Donal re-entered his chamber. Why they put him so apart, Donal never asked himself. That he should have such command of his leisure as this isolation promised him was a consequence very satisfactory he proceeded at once to settle himself in his new quarters. Finding some shelves in a recess of the wall, he arranged his books upon them, and laid his few clothes in the chest of drawers beneath. He then got out his writing material, and sat down. Though his window was so high, the warm, pure air came in full of the aromatic odors rising in the hot sunshine from the young pine trees far below, and from a lark far above descended news of heaven gate. The scent came up, and the song came down all the time he was writing to his mother, a long letter. When he had closed and addressed it, he fell into a reverie. Apparently he was to have his meals by himself. He was glad of it. He would be able to read all the time. But how was he to find the schoolroom? Someone would surely fetch him. They would remember he did not know his way about the place. It wanted yet an hour to dinner time, when, finding himself drowsy, he threw himself on his bed, where presently he fell fast asleep. The night descended, and when he came to himself, its silences were deep around him. It was not dark, there was no moon, but the twilight was clear. He could read the face of his watch. It was twelve o'clock. No one had missed him. He was very hungry. But he had been hungrier before, and survived it. In his wallet were still some remnants of oatcake. He took it in his hand, and stepping out on the bartizan, crept with careful steps round to the watchtower. There he seated himself in the stone chair, and ate his dry morsels in the starry presences. Sleep had refreshed him, and he was wide awake, yet there was on him the sense of a strange existence. Never before had he so known himself. Often had he passed the night in the open air, but never before had his night consciousness been such. Never had he felt the same way alone. He was parted from the whole earth, like the ship-boy on the giddy mast. Nothing was below but a dimness. The earth and all that was in it was massed into a vague shadow. It was as if he had died and gone where existence was independent of solidity and sense. Above him was domed the vast of the starry heavens. He could neither flee from it nor ascend to it. For a moment he felt it the symbol of life, yet an unattainable, hopeless thing. He hung suspended between heaven and earth, 
an outcast of both, a denizen of neither. The true life seemed ever to retreat, never to await his grasp. Nothing but the beholding of the face of the Son of Man could set him at rest as to its reality. Nothing less than the assurance from his own mouth could satisfy him that all was true, all well. Life was a thing so essentially divine that he could not know it in itself till his own essence was pure. But alas, how dreamlike was the old story! Was God indeed to be reached by the prayers, affected by the needs of men? How was he to feel sure of it? Once more, as often heretofore, he found himself crying into the great world to know whether there was an ear to hear. What if there should come to him no answer? How frightful, then, would be his loneliness! But to seem not to be heard might be part of the discipline of his darkness. It might be for the perfecting of his faith that he must not yet know how near God was to him. Lord, he cried, eternal life is to know thee and thy father. I do not know thee and thy father. I have not eternal life. I have but life enough to hunger for more. Show me plainly of the father whom thou alone knowest. And as he prayed, something like a touch of God seemed to begin and grow in him till it was more than his heart could hold and the universe about him was not large enough to hold in its hollow the heart that swelled with it. God is enough, he said, and sat in peace. End of chapter 12「all at once came to his ear through the night a strange something. Whence or what it was he could not even conjecture. Was it a moan of the river from below? Was it a lost music tone that had wandered from afar and grown faint? Was it one of those mysterious sounds he had read of as born in the air itself and not yet explained of science? Was it the fluttered skirt of some angelic song of lamentation? For if the angels rejoice, they surely must lament. Or was it a stilled human moaning? Was any wrong being done far down in the white gleaming meadows below, by the banks of the river whose platinum glimmer he could descry through the molten amethystine darkness of the starry night? Presently came a long-drawn musical moan. It must be the sound of some muffled instrument. Verily night was the time for strange things. Could sounds be begotten in the fir trees by the rays of the hot sun, and born in the stillness of the following dark, as the light which the diamond receives in the day glows out in the gloom? There are parents and their progeny that never exist together. Again the sound, hardly to be called sound, it resembled a vibration of organ pipe too slow and deep to affect the hearing. Only this seemed rather too high, as if only his soul heard it. He would steal softly down the dumb stone stair. Some creature might be in trouble and needing help. He crept back along the bartizan. The stair was dark as the very heart of the night. He groped his way down. The spiral stair is the safest of all. You cannot tumble far ere brought up by the enclosing cylinder. Arrived at the bottom, and feeling about, he could not find the door to the outer air which the butler had shown him. It was wall wherever his hands fell. He could not find again the stair he had left. He could not tell in what direction it lay. He had got into a long windowless passage connecting two wings of the house, and in this he was feeling his way, fearful of falling down some stair or trap. He came at last to a door, low-browed like almost all in the house. Opening it, was it a thinner darkness or the faintest gleam of light he saw? And was that again the sound he had followed, fainter and farther off than before, a downy wind-wafted plume from the skirt of some stray harmony? At such a time of the night, surely it was strange. It must come from one who could not sleep, and was solacing himself with sweet sounds, breathing a soul into the uncompanionable silence. If so it was, he had no right to search farther. But how was he to return? He dared hardly move, lest he should be found wandering over the house in the dead of night like a thief, 
or one searching after its secrets. He must sit down and wait for the morning. Its earliest light would perhaps enable him to find his way to his quarters. Feeling about him a little, his foot struck against the step of a stair. Examining it with his hands, he believed it the same he had ascended in the morning. Even in a great castle, could there be two such royal stairs? He sat down upon it, and leaning his head on his hands, composed himself to a patient waiting for the light. Waiting pure is perhaps the hardest thing for flesh and blood to do well. The relations of time to mind are very strange. Some of their phenomena seem to prove that time is only of the mind, belonging to the intellect as good and evil belong to the spirit. Anyhow, if it were not for the clocks of the universe, one man would live a year, a century, where another would live but a day. But the mere motion of time, not to say the consciousness of empty time, is fearful. It is this empty time that the fool is always trying to kill. His effort should be to fill it. Yet nothing but the living God can fill it, though it be but the shape our existence takes to us. Only where he is, emptiness is not. Eternity will be but an intense present to the child with whom is the father. Such thoughts alighted, flitted, and passed for the first few moments through the mind of Donal, as he sat half-consciously waiting for the dawn. It was thousands of miles away, over the great round of the sunward-turning earth. His imagination woke, and began to picture the great hunt of the shadows, fleeing before the arrows of the sun, over the broad face of the mighty world, its mountains, seas, and plains in turn confessing the light, and submitting to him who slays for them the haunting demons of their dark. Then again the moments were the small cogs on the wheels of time, whereby the dark castle in which he sat was rushing ever towards the light. The cogs were caught, and the wheels turned swiftly, and the time and the darkness sped. He forgot the labor of waiting. If now and then he fancied a tone through the darkness, it was to his mind the music march of the morning to his rescue from the dungeon of the night. But that was no musical tone which made the darkness shudder around him. He sprang to his feet. It was a human groan, a groan as of one in dire pain, the pain of a soul's agony, it seemed to have descended the stair to him. The next instant Donal was feeling his way up, cautiously, as if on each succeeding step he might come against the man who had groaned. Tales of haunted houses rushed into his memory. What if he were but pursuing the groan of an actor in the past, a creature the slave of his own conscious memory, a mere haunter of the present which he could not influence, one without physical relation to the embodied, save in the groans he could yet utter, but it was more in awe than in fear that he went. Up and up he felt his way, all about him as still as darkness and the night could make it. A ghostly cold crept through his skin. It was drawn together as by a gently freezing process, and there was a pulling at the muscles of his chest, as if his mouth were being dragged open by a martingale. As he felt his way along the wall, sweeping its great endless circle round and round in spiral ascent, all at once his hand seemed to go through it. He started and stopped. It was the door of the room into which he had been shown to meet the earl. It stood wide open. A faint glimmer came through the window from the star-filled sky. He stepped just within the doorway. Was not that another glimmer on the floor, from the back of the room, through a door he did not remember having seen yesterday? There again was the groan, and nigh at hand. Someone must be in sore need. He approached the door and looked through. A lamp, nearly spent, hung from the ceiling of a small room which might be an office or study, or a place where papers were kept. It had the look of an antechamber, but that it could not be, for there was but the one door. In the dim light he descried a vague form leaning up against one of the walls, as if listening to something through it. As he gazed it grew plainer to him, and he saw a face, its eyes staring wide, which yet seemed not to see him. It was the face of the earl. Donal felt as if in the presence of the disembodied. He stood fascinated, nor made attempt to retire or conceal himself. The figure turned its face to the wall, put the palms of its hands against it, and moved them up and down, and this way and that, then looked at them and began to rub them against each other. Donal came to himself. He concluded it was a case of sleepwalking, he had read that it was dangerous to wake the sleeper, 
but that he seldom came to mischief when left alone, and was about to slip away as he had come, when the faint sound of a far-off chord crept through the silence. The earl again laid his ear to the wall, but there was only silence. He went through the same dumb show as before, then turned as if to leave the place. Donal turned also, and hurriedly felt his way to the stair. Then first he was in danger of terror, for in stealing through the darkness from one who could find his way without his eyes, he seemed pursued by a creature not of this world. On the stair he went down a step or two, then lingered, and heard the earl come on it also. He crept close to the newel, leaving the great width of the stair free, but the steps of the earl went upward. Donal descended, sat down again at the bottom of the stair, and began again to wait. No sound came to him through the rest of the night. The slow hours rolled away, and the slow light drew nearer. Now and then he was on the point of falling into a doze, but would suddenly start wide awake, listening through a silence that seemed to fill the whole universe and deepen around the castle. At length he was aware that the darkness had, unobserved of him, grown weaker, that the approach of the light was sickening it. The day-spring was about to take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of its lap. He sought the long passage by which he had come, and felt his way to the other end. It would be safer to wait there if he could get no farther. But somehow he came to the foot of his own stair, and sped up as if it were the ladder of heaven. He threw himself on his bed, fell fast asleep, and did not wake till the sun was high. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Fourteen The Schoolroom. Old Simmons, the butler, woke him. I was afraid something was the matter, sir. They tell me you did not come down last night, and breakfast has been waiting you two hours. I should not have known where to find it, said Donal. The knowledge of an old castle is not intuitive. How long will you take to dress? asked Simmons. Ten minutes if there is any hurry, answered Donal. I will come again in twenty, or, if you are willing to save an old man's bones, I will be at the bottom of the stair at that time to take charge of you. I would have looked after you yesterday, but his lordship was poorly and I had to be in attendance on him till after midnight. Donal thought it impossible he should of himself have found his way to the schoolroom. With all he could do to remember the turnings, he found the endeavor hopeless, and gave it up with a not unpleasing despair. Through strange passages, through doors in all directions, upstairs and down they went, and at last came to a long, low room, barely furnished, with a pleasant outlook and immediate access to the open air. The windows were upon a small grassy court, with a sundial in the center. A door opened on a paved court. At one end of the room a table was laid with ten times as many things as he could desire to eat, though he came to it with a good appetite. The butler himself waited upon him. He was a good-natured old fellow, with a nose somewhat too red for the ordinary wear of one in his responsible position. "'I hope the Earl is better this morning,' said Donal. "'Well, I can't say.' He's but a delicate man as the Earl, and has been so long as I have known him. He was with the army in India, and the son, they say, give him a stroke, and ever since he have headaches that bad. But in between he seems pretty well, and nothing displeases him more than ask after his health, or how he slept the night. But he's a good master, and I hope to end my days with him. I'm not one as likes new faces and new places. One good place is enough for me, says I, so long as it is a good one. Take some of this game pie, sir." Donal made haste with his breakfast, and to Simmons' astonishment had ended when he thought him just well begun. "'How shall I find Master Davy?' he asked. "'He is wild to see you, sir. When I've cleared away, just have the goodness to ring this bell out of that window, and he'll be with you as fast as he can lay his feet to the ground.' Donal rang the handbell. A shout mingled with the clang of it. Then came the running of swift feet over the stones of the court, and Davy burst into the room. "'Oh, sir,' he cried, "'I am glad. It is good of you to come.' "'Well, you see, Davy,' returned Donal, "'everybody has got to do something to carry the world on a bit. 
My work is to help make a man of you. Only I can't do much except you help me. And if I find I am not making a good job of you, I shan't stop many hours after the discovery. If you want to keep me, you must mind what I say, and so help me to make a man of you. It will be long before I am a man, said Davy rather disconsolately. It depends on yourself. The boy that is longest in becoming a man is the boy that thinks himself a man before he is a bit like one. Come then, let us do something, said Davy. Come away, rejoined Donal. What shall we do first? I don't know. You must tell me, sir. What would you like best to do? I mean, if you might do what you pleased. Davy thought a little, then said, I should like to write a book. What kind of a book? A beautiful story. Isn't it just as well to read such a book? Why should you want to write one? Because then I should have it go just as I wanted it. I am always, almost always, disappointed with a thing that comes next. But if I wrote it myself, then I shouldn't get tired of it. It would be what pleased me, and not what pleased somebody else. Well, said Donal, after thinking for a moment, suppose you begin to write a book. Oh, that will be fun, much better than learning verbs and nouns. But the verbs and nouns are just the things that go to make a story. With not a few adjectives and adverbs and a host of conjunctions, and, if it be a very moving story, a good many interjections. These all you have got to put together with good choice, or the story will not be one you would care to read. Perhaps you had better not begin till I see whether you know enough about those verbs and nouns to do the thing decently. Show me your school books. There they all are, on that shelf. I haven't opened one of them since Percy came home. He laughed at them all, and so Arky, that's Lady Arctura, told him he might teach me himself, and he wouldn't and she wouldn't, with him to laugh at her, and I've had such a jolly time ever since, reading books out of the library. Have you seen the library, Mr. Grant? No, I've seen nothing yet. Suppose we begin with a holiday, and you begin by teaching me. Teaching you, sir? I'm not able to teach you. Why didn't you as much as offer to teach me the library? Can't you teach me this great old castle? And aren't you going to teach yourself to me? That would be a funny lesson, sir. The least funny. The most serious lesson you could teach me. You are a book God has begun, and he has sent me to help him go on with it. So I must learn what he has written already before I try to do anything. But you know what a boy is, sir. Why should you want to learn me? You might as well say that because I have read one or two books, I must know every book. To understand one boy helps to understand another. But every boy is a new boy, different from every other boy, and every one has to be understood. Yes, for sometimes Arky won't hear me out, and I feel so cross with her I should like to give her a good box on the ear. What king was it, sir, that made the law that no lady, however disagreeable, was to have her ears boxed? Do you think it a good law, sir? It is good for you and me, anyhow. And when Percy says, Oh, go away, don't bother, I feel as if I could hit him hard. Yet if I happen to hurt him, I am so sorry. And why then should I want to hurt him? There's something in this little fellow said Donal to himself. Ah, why indeed, he answered. You see, you don't understand yourself yet. No, indeed. Then how could you think I should understand you all at once? And a boy must be understood, else what's to become of him? Fancy a poor boy living all day and sleeping all night and nobody understanding him. That would be dreadful. But you will understand me? Only a little. I'm not wise enough to understand any boy. Then... "'But isn't that what you said you came for? "'I thought—' "'Yes,' answered Donal. "'That is what I came for. "'But if I fancied I quite understood any boy, "'that would be a sure sign I did not understand him. "'There is one who understands every boy, "'as well as if there were no other boy in the whole world. "'Then why doesn't every boy go to him "'when he can't get fair play? "'Ah, why? "'That is just what I want you to do. "'He can do better than give you fair play, even.' He can make you give other people fair play, and delight in it. Tell me where he is. That is what I have to teach you. Mere telling is not much use. Telling is what makes people think they know when they do not, and makes them foolish. What is his name? I will not tell you that just yet, for then you would think you knew him, when you knew next to nothing about him. Look here. Look at this book, he went on, pulling a copy of Boethius from his pocket. Look at the name on the back of it. It is the name of the man that wrote the book. Davy spelled it out. 
Now you know all about the book, don't you? No, sir. I don't know anything about it. Well, then, my father's name is Robert Grant. You know now what a good man he is. No, I don't. I should like to see him, though. You would love him if you did. But you see now that knowing the name of a person does not make you know the person. But you said, sir, that if you told me the name of that person, I should fancy I knew all about him. I don't fancy I know all about your father now you have told me his name. You have me there, answered Donal. I did not say quite what I ought to have said. I should have said that when we know a little about a person, and are used to hearing his name, then we are ready to think we know all about him. I heard a man the other day, a man who had never spoken to your father, talk as if he knew all about him. I think I understand, said Davy. To confess ignorance is to lose respect with the ignorant who would appear to know. But there is a worse thing than to lose the respect even of the wise, to deserve to lose it. And that he does who would gain a respect that does not belong to him. But a confession of ignorance is a ground of respect with a well-bred child, and even with many ordinary boys will raise a man's influence. They recognize his loyalty to the truth. Act truth is infinitely more than fact truth. The love of the truth infinitely beyond the knowledge of it. They went out together, and when they had gone the round of the place outside, Davy would have taken him over the house, but Donal said they would leave something for another time, and made him lie down for ten minutes. This the boy thought a great hardship, but Donal saw that he needed to be taught to rest. Ten times in those ten minutes he was on the point of jumping up, but Donal found a word sufficient to restrain him. When the ten minutes were over, he set him an addition sum. The boy protested he knew all the rules of arithmetic. But, said Donal, I must know that you know them. That is my business. Do this one, however easy it is. The boy obeyed and brought him the sum, incorrect. Now, Davy, said Donal, you said you knew all about addition, but you have not done this sum correctly. I have only made a blunder, sir. But a rule is no rule if it is not carried out. Everything goes on the supposition of its being itself, and not something else. People that talk about good things without doing them are left out. You are not master of addition until your addition is to be depended upon. The boy found it hard to fix his attention. To fix it on something he did not yet understand would be too hard. He must learn to do so in the pursuit of accuracy where he already understood. Then he would not have to fight two difficulties at once, that of understanding and that of fixing his attention. But for a long time he never kept him more than a quarter of an hour at work on the same thing. When he had done the sum correctly, and a second without need of correction, he told him to lay his slate aside, and he would tell him a fairy story. Therein he succeeded tolerably, in the opinion of Davy, wonderfully. What a tutor this was, who let fairies into the schoolroom. The tale was of no very original construction, the youngest brother gaining in the path of righteousness what the elder brothers lose through masterful selfishness. A man must do a thing because it is right, even if he die for it. But truth were poor indeed if it did not bring at last all things subject to it. As beauty and truth are one, so are truth and strength one. Must God be ever on the cross that we poor worshippers may pay him our highest honor? Is it not enough to know that if the devil were the greater, yet would not God do him homage, but would hang forever on his cross? Truth is joy and victory. The true hero is a judge to bliss, nor can in the nature of things, that is, of God, escape it. He who holds by life and resists death must be victorious. His very life is a slaying of death. A man may die for his opinion, and may only be living to himself. A man who dies for the truth dies to himself and to all that is not true. "'What a beautiful story!' cried Davy when it ceased. "'Where did you get it, Mr. Grant?' "'Where all stories come from.' "'Where is that?' "'The Think Book.' "'What a funny name. I never heard it. Will it be in the library?' "'No, it is in no library. It is the book God is always writing at one end and blotting out at the other. It is made of thoughts, not words.' It is the think book. Now I understand. You got the story out of your own head. Yes, perhaps. But how did it get into my head? I can't tell that. Nobody can tell that. Nobody can that never goes up above his own head. 
that never shuts the think book and stands upon it. When one does, then the think book swells to a great mountain and lifts him up above all the world. Then he sees where the stories come from and how they get into his head. Are you to have a ride today? I ride or not, just as I like. Well, we will now do just as we both like, I hope, and it will be two likes instead of one. That is, if we are true friends. We shall be true friends. That we shall. How can that be, between a little boy like you and a grown man like me? By me being good. By both of us being good. No other way. If one of us only was good, we could never be true friends. I must be good as well as you, else we shall never understand each other. How kind you are, Mr. Grant. You treat me just like another one, said Davy. But we must not forget that I am the big one and you the little one, and that we can't be the other one to each other except the little one does what the big one tells him. That's the way to fit into each other. Oh, of course, answered Davy, as if there could not be two minds about that. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Fifteen. Horse and Man. During the first day and the next, Donald did not even come in sight of any other of the family. But on the third day, after their short early school, for he seldom let Davy work till he was tired, and never after, going with him through the stable yard, they came upon Lord Forgue as he mounted his horse, a nervous, fiery, thin skinned thoroughbred. The moment his master was on him, he began to back and rear. Forgue gave him a cut with his whip. He went wild, plunging and dancing and kicking. The young lord was a horseman in the sense of having a good seat but he knew little about horses. They were to him creatures to be compelled, not friends with whom to hold sweet concert. He had not learned that to rule ill is worse than to obey ill. Kings may be worse than it is in the power of any subject to be. As he was raising his arm for a second useless, cruel, and dangerous blow, Donald darted to the horse's head. "'You mustn't do that, my lord,' he said. "'You'll drive him mad.' But the worst part of Forgue's nature was uppermost— in his rage, all the vices of his family rushed to the top. He looked down on Donal with a fury checked only by contempt. "'Keep off,' he said, "'or it will be the worse for you. What do you know about horses? Enough to know that you are not fair to him. I will not let you strike the poor animal. Just look at this water chain. Hold your tongue and stand away, or by—' "'You will not fright me, sir,' said Donal, whose English would, for years upon any excitement, turn cowardly and run away." "'leaving his mother-tongue to bear the brunt. "'I'm no timmersome.' "'Forgue brought down his whip "'with a great stinging blow upon Donal's shoulder and back. "'The fierce blood of the highland Celt rushed to his brain, "'and had not the man in him held by God and trampled on the devil, "'there might then have been miserable work. "'But though he clenched his teeth, "'he fettered his hands and ruled his tongue, "'and the master of men was master still. "'My lord,' he said, after one instant's thunderous silence, "'There's that in me would think as little of throttling ye "'as you do at ill using your poor beast. "'But I'm not going to drop his quarrel and take up my own. "'That would be cordly.' "'Here he patted the creature's neck, "'and recovering his composure and his English, went on. "'I tell you, my lord, the curb chain is too tight. "'The animal is suffering as you can have no conception of, "'or you would pity him.' "'Let him go,' cried Forgue, "'or I will make you.' "'He raised his whip again, the more enraged that the groom stood looking on with his mouth open. "'I tell your lordship,' said Donal, "'it is my turn to strike, "'and if you hit the animal again before that chain is slackened, "'I will pitch you out of the saddle.' For answer, Forgue struck the horse over the head. The same moment he was on the ground. Donal had taken him by the leg and thrown him off. He was not horseman enough to keep hold of the reins, and Donal led the horse a little way off and left him to get up in safety. The poor animal was pouring with sweat, "'shivering and trembling, yet throwing his head back every moment. "'Donal could scarcely undo the chain. "'It was twisted. "'His lordship had fastened it himself. "'And sharp edges pressed his jaw at the least touch of the rein. "'He had not yet rehooked it, "'when Forgue was upon him with a second blow of his whip. 
The horse was scared afresh at the sound, and it was all he could do to hold him. But he succeeded at length in calming him. When he looked about him, Forgu was gone. He led the horse into the stable, put him in his stall, and proceeded to unsaddle him. Then first he was re-aware of the presence of Davy. The boy was stamping, with fierce eyes and white face, choking with silent rage. "'Davy, my child,' said Donal, and Davy recovered his power of speech. "'I'll go and tell my father,' he said, and made for the stable door. "'Which of us are you going to tell upon?' asked Donal, with a smile. "'Percy, of course,' he replied, almost with a scream. "'You are a good man, Mr. Grant, and he is a bad fellow. My father will give it him well. He doesn't often, but, oh, can't he just, to dare to strike you. I'll go to him at once, whether he's in bed or not.' "'No, you won't, my boy. Listen to me. "'Some people think it's a disgrace to be struck. "'I think it a disgrace to strike. "'I have a right over your brother by that blow, "'and I mean to keep it, for his good. "'You didn't think I was afraid of him. "'No, no, anybody could see you weren't a bit afraid of him. "'I would have struck him again if he had killed me for it. "'I don't doubt you would, "'but when you understand, you will not be so ready to strike. "'I could have killed your brother more easily than held his horse. "'You don't know how strong I am.' or what a blow of my fist would be to a delicate fellow like that. I hope his fall has not hurt him. I hope it has. A little, I mean. Only a little, said the boy, looking in the face of his tutor. But tell me why you did not strike him. It would be good for him to be well beaten. It will, I hope, be better for him to be well forgiven. He will be ashamed of himself the sooner, I think. But why I did not strike him was that I am not my own master. But my father, I am sure, would not have been angry with you, he would have said you had a right to do it. Perhaps, but the earl is not the master I mean. Who is then? Jesus Christ. Oh, oh. He says I must not return evil for evil, a blow for a blow. I don't mind what people say about it. He would not have me disgrace myself. He never even threatened those that struck him. But he wasn't a man, you know. Not a man. What was he then? He was God, you know. "'And isn't God a man, and ever so much more than a man?' "'The boy made no answer, and Donal went on. "'Do you think God would have his child do anything disgraceful? "'Why, Davy, you don't know your own father. "'What God wants of us is to be downright honest, "'and do what he tells us without fear.' "'Davy was silent. "'His conscience reproved him, "'as the conscience of a true-hearted boy will reprove him "'at the very mention of the name of God.' until he sets himself consciously to do his will. Donal said no more, and they went for their walk. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 16 Colloquies In the evening, Donal went to see Andrew Comyn. "'Well, how are you getting on with the earl?' asked the cobbler. "'You set me a good example of saying nothing about him,' answered Donal, "'and I will follow it. "'at least till I know more. "'I have scarce seen him yet.' "'That's right,' returned the cobbler with satisfaction. "'I'm thinking ye'll be one of the few "'that can rule their own house. "'That is, hold their own tongues "'till the hour for speech be come. "'Stick ye to that, my dear sir, "'and more'll be whale nor in general as whale. "'I'm come to ye for a bit of help, though. "'I want light upon a question "'that's long troubled me. "'What think ye? "'How far does the command laid upon us "'as to warfare between man and man reach?' "'Are we never to raise the hand to human being, think ye?' "'Well, I have thought a heap about it, "'and I dare not say that I'm just absolute clear upon the matter. "'But there may be part clear where all's not clear, "'and by what we understand we come the nearer to what we do not understand. "'There's one thing, Uncle Plain, "'at we're on no account to return evil for evil. "'Anybody that calls himself a Christian mun understand that, Muckle. "'We're to give no place to revenge, inside or out. "'Therefore we're no to give blow for blow.' "'Gin a man hit ye, you're to take it in God's name. "'But whether things may not come to a point "'where at your bone still in God's name "'to defend the life God has given ye, I cannot say. 
I had not the light to justify me in denying it. There mun surely, I have said to myself, be a time when a man may have to do what God does so often, make use of the strong hand. But it's clear he munna do it in rage. That's o'er near hate, and hates the devil's own. A man may, gin he live very near the Lord, be whiles angry on sinned. But the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, and the wrath that rises in the midst of encounter is no like to be of the nature of divine wrath. To win at it, gin it be possible, let's consider the Lord, how he did. There's no word of him ever lift in hand to protect himself. The only thing like it was for others. To gar them let his disciples alone, maybe till they were like enough to themselves not to run, he put out Murner's hand upon them that came to take him. He struck them, sir, with the power itself that moves our arms. But not very, sir, neither. He but knock at them down. Just to let them ken they were to do as he bade them, and let his folk be. And maybe to let them ken it, gin he let them take him. It was not that he couldna hinder them, gin he liked. I canna help thinking we may stand up for other folk. And I'm not saying that we are not to defend ourselves for a set attack with design. But there's something of mere importance yet, nor ken in the right of any question. What can that be? What can be of more importance nor doing right in the sight of God? said Donal. Being right with the very thought of God, so that we cannot mistake but mon kin just what he would have done. That's the big right, the mother of all the love of the rights. That's to be as the maester was. On a gate, whatever we do, it mon be suckers to be done, and it mon be done in the name of God. When we do nothing, we mon do that nothing in the name of God. A body may wheel say, O oh Lord, thou hast not letting me see what I ought to do, so I'll do nothing. Gin a man ought to defend himself, but does not do it, cause he thinks God wouldn't have him do it. Will God leave him undefent for that? Or gin a body stands up in the name of God, and fronts an army of enemies, do you think God'll forsake him cause he's made a mistake? Whatever's done wantin faith mon be sin, it cannot help it. Whatever's done in faith cannot be sin, though it may be a mistake. Only let not a man take presumption for faith. That's a fearsome mistake, for it's just the opposite. I thank you, said Donal. I'll consider with my best endeavour what you have said. But of all things, resumed the cobbler, look at ye love fair play. Fair play's a wonderful word, a grand thing constantly lost sight of. Man, I have been trying to win at the doing of the right this many a year, but I dare not yet let myself act upon the spur of the moment where my own interest's concerned. My own side might yet blind me to the other man's side of the business. Anybody can understand his own right, but it takes trouble and thought to understand what another counts his right. Two rights cannot wheel clash. It's a wrong and a right, or part wrong and a part right it clashes. Ganabody did that. I doubt there would be few fortunes made, said Donal. About that I cannot say, no kinnin. I dare not discover a law where I had not knowledge. But this same fair play lies, along with love, at the very root and foundation of the universe. The theologians had a glimmer of the fact when they made so muckle of justice. Only their justice is such a miserable small bit plaster image of justice, and it must gars an honest body laugh. They seem to me like shepherds that rave down the doorposts and sign block up the door with them. Donald told him of the quarrel he had had with Lord Forgue, and asked him whether he thought he had done right. Well, answered the cobbler, I'm as far for blaming you as I am for justifying the young lord. He seems to me a fine kind of a lad said Donal, though some o'er barren. The likes of him are mere to be excused for that nor other folk, for they had great disadvantages in the position and the upbringing. It's not easy for him that's brought up a lord to believe he's just one with the lave. Donal went for a stroll through the town, and met the minister, but he took no notice of him. He was greatly annoyed at the march which he said the fellow had stolen upon him, and regarded him as one who had taken an unfair advantage of him. But he had little influence at the castle, the earl never by any chance went to church. His niece, Lady Arctura, did, however, and held the minister for an authority at things spiritual, one of whom living water was to be had without money and without price. But what she counted spiritual things were very common earthly stuff, and for the water it was but stagnant water from the ditches of a sham theology. Only what was a poor girl to do who did not know how to feed herself, but apply to one who pretended to be able to feed others? How was she to know that he could not even feed himself? Out of many a difficulty she thought he helped her, only the difficulty would presently clasp her again, and she must deal with it as she best could, until a new one made her forget it, and go to the minister, or rather to his daughter, again. She was one of those who feel the need of some help to live. 
some upholding that is not of themselves, but who, through the stupidity of teachers unconsciously false, men so unfit that they do not know they are unfit, direct their efforts first towards having correct notions, then to work up the feelings that belong to those notions. She was an honest girl so far as she had been taught, perhaps not so far as she might have been without having been taught. How was she to think aright with scarce a glimmer of God's truth? How was she to please God, as she called it, who thought of him in a way repulsive to every loving soul? How was she to be accepted of God, who did not accept her own neighbor, but looked down, without knowing it, upon so many of her fellow creatures? How should such a one either enjoy or recommend her religion? It would have been the worse for her if she had enjoyed it, the worse for others if she had recommended it. Religion is simply the way home to the Father. There was little of the path in her religion except the difficulty of it. The true way is difficult enough because of our unchildlikeness, uphill, steep, and difficult. But there is fresh life on every surmounted height, a purer air gained, ever more life for more climbing. But the path that is not the true one is not therefore easy. Uphill is hard walking, but through a bog is worse. Those who seek God with their faces not even turned towards Him, who, instead of beholding the Father in the Son, take the stupidest opinions concerning Him and His ways from other men, what should they do but go wandering on dark mountains, spending their strength in avoiding precipices and getting out of bogs, mourning and sighing over their sins, instead of leaving them behind and fleeing to the Father, whom to know is eternal life? Did they but set themselves to find out what Christ knew and meant and commanded, and then to do it, they would soon forget their false teachers. But alas, they go on bowing before long-faced, big-worded authority, the more fatally when it is embodied in a good man who, himself a victim to faith in men, sees the Son of God only through the theories of others, and not with the sight of his own spiritual eyes. Donal had not yet seen the lady. He neither ate, sat, nor held intercourse with the family. Away from Davy, he spent his time in his tower chamber, or out of doors. All the grounds were open to him, except a walled garden on the southeastern slope, looking towards the sea, which the earl kept for himself, though he rarely walked in it. On the side of the hill, away from the town, was a large park reaching down to the river, and stretching a long way up its bank, with fine trees and glorious outlooks to the sea in one direction, and to the mountains in the other. Here Donal would often wander, now with a book, now with Davy. The boy's presence was rarely an interruption to his thoughts when he wanted to think. Sometimes he would throw himself on the grass and read aloud. Then Davy would throw himself beside him and let the words he could not understand flow over him in a spiritual cataract. On the river was a boat, and though at first he was awkward enough in the use of the oars, he was soon able to enjoy thoroughly a row up or down the stream, especially in the twilight. He was alone with his book under a beech tree on a steep slope to the river the day after his affair with Lord Forgu. Reading aloud, he did not hear the approach of his lordship. "'Mr. Grant,' he said, "'if you will say you are sorry you threw me from my horse, I will say I am sorry I struck you.' "'I am very sorry,' said Donal, rising, "'that it was necessary to throw you from your horse, "'and perhaps your lordship may remember that you struck me before I did so. "'That has nothing to do with it.' I propose an accommodation, or compromise, or what you choose to call it. If you will do the one, I will do the other. What I think I ought to do, my lord, I do without bargaining. I am not sorry I threw you from your horse, and to say so would be to lie. Of course everybody thinks himself in the right, said his lordship with a small sneer. It does not follow that no one is ever in the right, returned Donal. Does your lordship think you were in the right, either towards me or the poor animal who could not obey you because he was in torture? "'I don't say I do. "'Then everybody does not think himself in the right. "'I take your lordship's admission as an apology. "'By no means. "'When I make an apology, I will do it. "'I will not sneak out of it.' "'He was evidently at strife with himself. "'He knew he was wrong, "'but could not yet bring himself to say so. "'It is one of the poorest of human weaknesses "'that a man should be ashamed of saying he has done wrong, "'instead of so ashamed of having done wrong,' that he cannot rest till he has said so, for the shame cleaves fast until the confession removes it. Forgu walked away a step or two, and stood with his back to Donal, poking the point of his stick into the grass. All at once he turned and said, 
"'I will apologize if you will tell me one thing.' "'I will tell you whether you apologize or not,' said Donal. "'I have never asked you to apologize. "'Tell me, then, why you did not return either of my blows yesterday.' "'I should like to know why you ask. "'But I will answer you. "'Simply because to do so would have been to disobey my master. "'That's the sort of thing I don't understand. "'But I only wanted to know it was not cowardice. "'I could not make an apology to a coward.' "'If I were a coward, you would owe me an apology all the same, "'and he is a poor creature who will not pay his debts. "'But I hope it is not necessary I should either thrash or insult your lordship "'to convince you I fear you no more than that blackbird there.' "'Forgu gave a little laugh. "'A moment's pause followed. "'Then he held out his hand, but in a half-hesitating, almost sheepish way. "'Well, well, shake hands,' he said. "'No, my lord,' returned Donal. "'I bear your lordship not the slightest ill-will.' "'but I will shake hands with no one in a half-hearted way, "'and no other way is possible while you are uncertain "'whether I am a coward or not.' "'So saying, he threw himself again upon the grass, "'and Lord Forgue walked away, offended afresh. "'The next morning he came into the schoolroom "'where Donal sat at lessons with Davy. "'He had a book in his hand. "'Mr. Grant,' he said, "'will you help me with this passage in Xenophon?' "'With all my heart,' answered Donal and in a few moments had him out of his difficulty. But instead of going, his lordship sat down a little way off and went on with his reading, sat until master and pupil went out and left him sitting there. The next morning he came with a fresh request, and Donal found occasion to approve warmly of a translation he proposed. From that time he came almost every morning. He was no great scholar, but with the prospect of an English university before him, thought it better to read a little. The housekeeper at the castle was a good woman, and very kind to Donal, feeling perhaps that he fell to her care the more that he was by birth of her own class, for it was said in the castle, the tutor makes no pretense to being a gentleman. Whether he was the more or the less of one on that account, I leave my reader to judge according to his capability. Sometimes when his dinner was served, Mistress Brooks would herself appear, to ensure proper attention to him, and would sit down and talk to him while he ate ready to rise and serve him if necessary. Their early days had had something in common, though she came from the southern highlands of green hills and more sheep. She gave him some rather needful information about the family, and he soon perceived that there would have been less peace in the house but for her good temper and good sense. Lady Arctura was the daughter of the last Lord Morven, and left sole heir to the property. Forgu and his brother Davy were the sons of the present earl. The present lord was the brother of the last, and had lived with him for some years before he succeeded. He was a man of peculiar and studious habits. Nobody ever seemed to take to him, and since his wife's death, his health had been precarious. Though a strange man, he was a just, if not generous, master. His brother had left him guardian to Lady Arctura, and he had lived in the castle as before. His wife was a very lovely but delicate woman, and latterly all but confined to her room. Since her death, a great change had passed upon her husband. Certainly his behavior was sometimes hard to understand. "'He never gangs to the kirk, not once in a twelve-month, said Mrs. Brooks. "'Folks would be decent, and who ever heard a decent folk it didn't gang to the kirk once in the Sabbath? I do not hold with going twice, Miss Hill. You had no time to read your own chapters, can you do that? But the man's a well-behaved man, so far as you see, neither saying nor doing the thing he shouldna. What he may think, who's to say?' The more tender conscience counts itself the worst sinner, and I'm not going to think what I can of ken. There's some it says he led a gay low's kind of a life afore he came to bide with the old Yarl. He was with the army of foreign parts, they say. But about that I ken nothing. The old Yarl was something of a saint himself, rest the bones of him. We're not the judges of the living, any more nor of the dead. But I'm on a way to look after things. A minute's an hour lost with the fool lasses. You're a friend of Andrew Coleman's, they tell me, sir. I dinna ken what to do with his lass. She's that upsettin'. You would think she was one of the family whiles, and other whiles she's that silly. I'm sorry to hear it, said Donal. Her grandfather and grandmother are the best of good people. I dare say, but there's just what I ha' seen. Them it's brought up their own well enough. Their sons bear and they'll just let gang. Either they're tired of the thing, or they think they're safe. They ha' lippit till young Eppy a heap or muckle. But I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, as the minister said last Sunday, and said well, honest man, for it's the plain truth. He's not one of the major nor yet the minor ones. But hold him out of the pulpit, and he does not that ill. 
His daughter's not an ill lass either, and a great friend of my lady's. But I'm clean ashamed of myself to gang on this gate. Have you done with your dinner, Mr. Grant? Well, I'll just send a clear away and let you till your lessons. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of Donal Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen.《Donal Grant》by George MacDonald.《Chapter Seventeen》Lady Arctura. It was now almost three weeks since Donal had become an inmate of the castle and he had scarcely set his eyes on the lady of the house. Once he had seen her back, and more than once had caught a glimpse of her profile, but he had never really seen her face, and they had never spoken to each other. One afternoon he was sauntering along under the overhanging boughs of an avenue of beeches, formerly the approach to a house in which the family had once lived, but which had now another entrance. He had in his hand a copy of the Apocrypha, which he had never seen till he found this in the library. In his usual fashion he had begun to read it through, and was now in the book called The Wisdom of Solomon, at the seventeenth chapter, narrating the discomfiture of certain magicians. Taken with the beauty of the passage, he sat down on an old stone roller and read aloud. Parts of the passage were these. They will enrich my page. For they that promised to drive away terrors and troubles from a sick soul were sick themselves of fear, worthy to be laughed at. For wickedness, condemned by her own witness, is very timorous, and being pressed with conscience, always forecasteth grievous things. But they sleeping the same sleep that night, which was indeed intolerable, and which came upon them out of the bottoms of inevitable hell, were partly vexed with monstrous apparitions, and partly fainted, their heart failing them. For a sudden fear, and not looked for, came upon them. So then whosoever there fell down was straightly kept, shut up in a prison without iron bars. For whether he were husbandman, or shepherd, or a laborer in the field, he was overtaken, and endured that necessity which could not be avoided. For they were all bound with one chain of darkness. Whether it were a whistling wind, or a melodious noise of birds among the spreading branches, or a pleasing fall of water running violently, or a terrible sound of stones cast down, or a running that could not be seen of skipping beasts, or a roaring voice of most savage wild beasts, or a rebounding echo from the hollow mountains. These things made them to swoon for fear. For the whole world shined with clear light, and none were hindered in their labor. Over them only was spread a heavy night, an image of that darkness which should afterward receive them but yet were they unto themselves more grievous than the darkness. He had read so much and stopped to think a little, for through the incongruity of it, which he did not doubt arose from poverty of imagination in the translator, rendering him unable to see what the poet meant, ran yet an indubitable vein of awful truth. Whether fully intended by the writer or not mattered little to such a reader as Donal. When, lifting his eyes, he saw Lady Arctura standing before him with a strange listening look. A spell seemed upon her. Her face was white, her lips white and a little parted. Attracted, as she was about to pass him, by the sound of what was nonetheless like the Bible from the solemn crooning way in which Donal read it to the congregation of his listening thoughts, yet was certainly not the Bible, she was presently fascinated by the vague terror of what she heard, and stood absorbed. Without much originative power, she had an imagination prompt and delicate and strong in response. Donal had but a glance of her. His eyes returned again at once to his book, and he sat silent and motionless, though not seeing a word. For one instant she stood still. Then he heard the soft sound of her dress as, with noiseless foot, she stole back and took another way. I must give my reader a shadow of her. She was rather tall, slender, and fair, but her hair was dark, and so crinkly that, when merely parted, it did all the rest itself. Her forehead was rather low, her eyes were softly dark, and her features very regular, her nose perhaps hardly large enough, or her chin. Her mouth was rather thin-lipped, 
but would have been sweet except for a seemingly habitual expression of pain. A pair of dark brows overhung her sweet eyes, and gave a look of doubtful temper, yet restored something of the strength, lacking a little in nose and chin. It was an interesting, not a quite harmonious face, and in happiness might, Donal thought, be beautiful even. Her figure was eminently graceful, as Donal saw when he raised his eyes at the sound of her retreat. He thought she needed not have run away as from something dangerous. Why did she not pass him like any other servant of the house? But what seemed to him like contempt did not hurt him. He was too full of realities to be much affected by opinion, however shown. Besides, he had had his sorrow and had learned his lesson. He was a poet, but one of the few without any weak longing after listening ears. The poet whose poetry needs an audience can be but little of a poet. Neither can the poetry that is of no good to the man himself be of much good to anybody else. There are the song poets and the life poets, or rather, the god poems. Sympathy is lovely and dear, chiefly when it comes unsought. But the fame after which so many would be, yea, so many real poets sigh, is poorest froth. Donal could sing his songs like the birds, content with the blue heaven or the sheep for an audience or any passing angel that cared to listen. On the hillsides he would sing them aloud, but it was of the merest natural necessity. A look of estrangement on the face of a friend, a look of suffering on that of any animal, would at once and sorely affect him, but not a disparaging expression on the face of a comparative stranger, were she the loveliest woman he had ever seen. He was little troubled about the world, because little troubled about himself. Lady Arctura and Lord Forgue lived together like brother and sister, apparently without much in common, and still less of misunderstanding. There would have been more chance of their taking a fancy to each other if they had not been brought up together. They were now little together, and never alone together. Very few visitors came to the castle, and then only to call. Lord Morven seldom saw anyone, his excuse being his health. But Lady Arctura was on terms of intimacy with Sophia Carmichael, the minister's daughter, to whom her father had communicated his dissatisfaction with the character of Donal, and poured out his indignation at his conduct. He ought to have left the parish at once, whereas he had instead secured for himself the best, the only situation in it, without giving him a chance of warning his lordship. The more injustice her father spoke against him, the more Miss Carmichael condemned him, for she was a good daughter, and looked up to her father as the wisest and best man in the parish. Very naturally, therefore, she repeated his words to Lady Arctura. She, in her turn, conveyed them to her uncle. He would not, however, pay much attention to them. The thing was done, he said. He had himself seen and talked with Donal, and liked him. The young man had himself told him of the clergyman's disapprobation. He would request him to avoid all reference to religious subjects. Therewith he dismissed the matter, and forgot all about it. Anything requiring an effort of the will an arrangement of ideas or thought as to mode, his lordship would not encounter. Nor was anything to him of such moment that he must do it at once. Lady Arctura did not again refer to the matter. Her uncle was not one to take liberties with, least of all to press to action. But she continued painfully doubtful whether she was not neglecting her duty, trying to persuade herself that she was waiting only till she should have something definite to say of her own knowledge against him. And now what was she to conclude from his reading the Apocrypha? The fact was not to be interpreted to his advantage. Was he not reading what was not the Bible, as if it were the Bible, and when he might have been reading the Bible itself? Besides, the Apocrypha came so near the Bible when it was not the Bible. It must be at least rather wicked. At the same time, she could not drive from her mind the impressiveness both of the matter she had heard and his manner of reading it. The strong sound of judgment and condemnation in it came home to her. She could not have told how or why, except generally because of her sins. She was one of those, not very few, I think, who from conjunction of a lovely conscience with an ill-instructed mind are doomed for a season to much suffering. She was largely different from her friend. The religious opinions of the latter, they were in reality rather metaphysical than religious, and bad either way, though she clung to them with all the tenacity of a creature with claws, occasioned her not an atom of mental discomposure. Perhaps that was in part why she clung to them. They were as she would have them. 
She did not trouble herself about what God required of her, beyond holding the doctrine the holding of which guaranteed, as she thought, her future welfare. Conscience toward God had very little to do with her opinions, and her heart still less. Her head, on the contrary, perhaps rather her memory, was considerably occupied with the matter. Nothing she held had ever been by her regarded on its own merits, that is, on its individual claim to truth. If it had been handed down by her church, that was enough. To support it, she would search out text after text and press it into the service. Any meaning but that which the church of her fathers gave to a passage must be of the devil, and every man opposed to the truth who saw in that meaning anything but truth. It was indeed impossible Miss Carmichael should see any meaning but that, even if she had looked for it. She was no wise qualified for discovering truth, not being herself true. What she saw and loved in the doctrines of her church was not the truth, but the assertion. And whoever questioned, not to say the doctrine, but even the proving of it by any particular passage, was a dangerous person, and unsound. All the time her acceptance and defense of any doctrine made not the slightest difference to her life, as indeed how should it? Such was the only friend Lady Arctura had. But the conscience and heart of the younger woman were alive to a degree that boded ill either for the doctrine that stinted their growth, or the nature unable to cast it off. Miss Carmichael was a woman about six and twenty, and had been a woman, like too many Scotch girls, long before she was out of her teens. A human flower, cut and dried. An unpleasant specimen, and by no means valuable from its scarcity. Self-sufficient, assured, with scarce shyness enough for modesty. Handsome and hard, she was essentially a self-glorious Philistine. Nor would she be anything better, till something was sent to humble her, though what spiritual engine might be equal to the task was not for man to imagine. She was clever, but her cleverness made nobody happier. She had great confidence, but her confidence gave courage to no one, and took it from many. She had little fancy, and less imagination than any other I ever knew. The divine wonder was that she had not yet driven the delicate, truth-loving Arctura mad. From her childhood, she had had the ordering of all her opinions. Whatever Sophie Carmichael said, Lady Arctura never thought of questioning. A lie is indeed a thing in its nature unbelievable. But there is a false belief always ready to receive the false truth, and there is no end to the mischief the two can work. The awful punishment of untruth in the inward parts is that the man is given over to believe a lie. Lady Arctura was in herself a gentle creature, who shrank from either giving or receiving a rough touch. But she had an inherited pride, by herself unrecognized as such, which made her capable of hurting as well as being hurt. Next to the doctrines of the Scottish Church, she respected her own family. It had in truth no other claim to respect than that its little good and much evil had been done before the eyes of a large part of many generations. When she was born to think herself distinguished, and to imagine a claim for the acknowledgment of distinction upon all, except those of greatly higher rank than her own. This inborn arrogance was in some degree modified by respect for the writers of certain books, not one of whom was of any regard in the eyes of the thinkers of the age. Of any writers of power, beyond those of the Bible, either in this country or another, she knew nothing. Yet she had a real instinct for what was good in literature, and of the writers to whom I have referred, she not only liked the worthiest best, but liked best their best things. I need hardly say they were all religious writers, for the keen conscience and obedient heart of the girl had made her very early turn herself towards the quarter where the sun ought to rise, the quarter where all night long gleams the auroral hope. But unhappily she had not gone direct to the heavenly well in earthly ground, the words of the master himself. How could she? From very childhood, her mind had been filled with traditionary utterances concerning the divine character and the divine plans. The merest inventions of men far more desirous of understanding what they were not required to understand than of doing what they were required to do. Whence their crude and false utterances concerning a god of their own fancy, in whom it was a good man's duty, in the name of any possible god, to disbelieve. And just because she was true, authority had immense power over her, the very sweetness of their nature forbids such to doubt the fitness of others. 
she had besides had a governess of the orthodox type, a large proportion of whose teaching was of the worst heresy, for it was lies against him who is light, and in whom is no darkness at all. Her doctrines were so many smoked glasses held up between the mind of her pupil and the glory of the living God, nor had she once directed her gaze to the very likeness of God, the face of Jesus Christ. Had Arctura set herself to understand him the knowledge of whom is eternal life, she would have believed none of these false reports of him. But she had not yet met with anyone to help her to cast aside the doctrines of men, and go face to face with the Son of Man, the visible God. First lie of all, she had been taught that she must believe so and so before God would let her come near him or listen to her. The old cobbler could have taught her differently, but she would have thought it improper to hold conversation with such a man, even if she had known him for the best man in Ockers. She was in sore and sad earnest to believe as she was told she must believe. Therefore, instead of beginning to do what Jesus Christ said, she tried hard to imagine herself one of the chosen, tried hard to believe herself the chief of sinners. There was no one to tell her that it is only the man who sees something of the glory of God, the height and depth and breadth and length of his love and unselfishness, not a child dabbling in stupid doctrines that can feel like St. Paul. She tried to feel that she deserved to be burned in hell forever and ever, and that it was boundlessly good of God, who made her so that she could not help being a sinner, to give her the least chance of escaping it. She tried to feel that, though she could not be saved without something which the God of perfect love could give her if he pleased, but might not please to give her, yet if she was not saved it would be all her own fault, and so ever the round of a great miserable treadmill of contradictions. For a moment she would be able to say this or that she thought she ought to say. The next the feeling would be gone, and she as miserable as before. Her friend made no attempt to imbue her with her own calm indifference, nor could she have succeeded had she attempted it. But though she had never been troubled herself, and that because she had never been in earnest, she did not find it the less easy to take upon her the role of a spiritual adviser, and gave no end of counsel for the attainment of assurance. She told her truly enough that all her trouble came of want of faith, but she showed her no one fit to believe in. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter eighteen. A Clash. All this time, Donal had never again seen the Earl. Neither had the latter shown any interest in Davy's progress. But Lady Arctura was full of serious anxiety concerning him. Heavily prejudiced against the tutor, she dreaded his influence on the mind of her little cousin. There was a small recess in the schoolroom. It had been a bay window, but from an architectural necessity arising from decay, it had, all except a narrow eastern light, been built up. And in this recess Donal was one day sitting with a book, while Davy was busy writing at the table in the middle of the room. It was past school hours, but the weather did not invite them out of doors, and Donal had given Davy a poem to copy. Lady Arctura came into the room. She had never entered it before since Donal came, and thinking he was alone began to talk to the boy. She spoke in so gentle a tone that Donal, busy with his book, did not for some time distinguish a word she said. He never suspected she was unaware of his presence. By degrees her voice grew a little louder, and by and by these words reached him. "'You know, Davy, dear, every sin, whatever it is, deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. And if it had not been that Jesus Christ gave himself to turn away his anger and satisfy his justice by bearing the punishment for us, God would send us all to the place of misery for ever and ever. It is for his sake, not for ours, that he pardons us.' She had not yet ceased when Donal rose in the wrath of love and came out into the room. "'Lady Arctura,' he said, "'I dare not sit still and hear such false things uttered against the blessed God.' Lady Arctura started in dire dismay, but in virtue of her breed and her pride recovered herself immediately, drew herself up and said, "'Mr. Grant, you forget yourself.' "'I'm very willing to do that, my lady,' 
answered Donal. "'But I must not forget the honour of my God. "'If you were a heathen woman, "'I might think whether the hour was come for enlightening you further. "'But to hear one who has had the Bible in her hands from her childhood "'say such things about the God who made her and sent his son to save her, "'without answering a word for him, would be cowardly. "'What do you know about such things? "'What gives you a right to speak?' said Lady Arctura. "'Her pride strength was already beginning to desert her. "'I had a Christian mother,' answered Donal. "'Have her yet, thank God, "'who taught me to love nothing but the truth. "'I have studied the Bible from my childhood, "'often whole days together "'when I was out with the cattle or the sheep, "'and I have tried to do what the Lord tells me, "'from nearly the earliest time I can remember. "'Therefore I am able to set to my seal "'that God is true, that he is light, "'and there is no darkness of unfairness "'or selfishness in him. "'I love God with my whole heart and soul, my lady.' "'Arctura tried to say she too loved him so, but her conscience interfered, and she could not. "'I don't say you don't love him,' Donal went on, "'but how you can love him and believe such things of him I don't understand. "'Whoever taught them first was a terrible liar against God, "'who is lovelier than all the imaginations of all his creatures can think.' "'Lady Arctura swept from the room, though she was trembling from head to foot. "'At the door she turned and called Davy. "'The boy looked up in his tutor's face, mutely asking if he should obey her. "'Go,' said Donal. In less than a minute he came back, his eyes full of tears. "'Arky says she is going to tell Papa. Is it true, Mr. Grant, that you are a dangerous man? I do not believe it, though you do carry such a big knife.' Donal laughed. "'It is my grandfather's skin do,' he said. "'I mend my pens with it, you know. But it is strange, Davy, that when a body knows something other people don't, they should be angry with him. They will even think he wants to make them bad when he wants to help them to be good.' "'But Arky is good, Mr. Grant.' "'I am sure she is. "'But she does not know so much about God as I do, "'or she would never say such things of him. "'We must talk about him more after this.' "'No, no, please, Mr. Grant. "'We won't say a word about him, "'for Arky says, except you promise never to speak of God, "'she will tell Papa and he will send you away.' "'Davy,' said Donal with solemnity, "'I would not give such a promise for the castle and all it contains. "'No, not to save your life and the life of everybody in it.' For Jesus says, Whosoever denieth me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. And rather than that, I would jump from the top of the castle. Why, Davy, would a man deny his own father or mother? I don't know, answered Davy. I don't remember my mother. I'll tell you what, said Donal with sudden inspiration. I will promise not to speak about God at any other time, if she will promise to sit by when I do speak of him. Say once a week. "'Perhaps we shall do what he tells us all the better "'that we don't talk so much about him.' "'Oh, thank you, Mr. Grant. "'I will tell her,' cried Davy, jumping up relieved. "'Oh, thank you, Mr. Grant,' he repeated. "'I could not bear you to go away. "'I should never stop crying if you did. "'And you won't say any wicked things, will you? "'For Arky reads her Bible every day.' "'So do I, Davy.' "'Do you?' returned Davy. "'I'll tell her that, too, "'and then she will see she must have been mistaken.' He hurried to his cousin with Donal's suggestion. It threw her into no small perplexity, first from doubt as to the propriety of the thing proposed, next because of the awkwardness of it, then from a sudden fear lest his specious tongue should lead herself into the bypaths of doubt and to the castle of giant despair, at which, indeed, it was a gracious wonder she had not arrived ere now. What if she should be persuaded of things which it was impossible to believe and be saved? She did not see that such belief as she desired to have was in itself essential damnation. For what can there be in heaven or earth for a soul that believes in an unjust God? To rejoice in such a belief would be to be a devil, and to believe what cannot be rejoiced in is misery. No doubt a man may not see the true nature of the things he thinks he believes, but that cannot save him from the loss of not knowing God, whom to know is alone eternal life. For who can know him that believes evil things of him? That many a good man does believe such things only argues his heart not yet won towards him. To make his belief possible he must dwell on the good things he has learned about God and not think about the bad things. And what would Sophia say? Lady Arctura would have sped to her friend for counsel before giving any answer to the audacious proposal, but she was just then from home for a fortnight, and she must resolve without her. 
She reflected also that she had not yet anything sufficiently definite to say to her uncle about the young man's false doctrine, and for herself concluded that, as she was well grounded for argument, knowing thoroughly the shorter catechism, with the proofs from scripture of every doctrine it contained, it was foolish to fear anything from one who went in the strength of his own ignorant and presumptuous will, regardless of the opinions of the fathers of the church, and accepting only such things as were pleasing to his unregenerate nature. But she hesitated, and after waiting for a week without receiving any answer to his proposal, Donal said to Davy, "'We shall have a lesson in the New Testament tomorrow. You had better mention it to your cousin.' The next morning he asked him if he had mentioned it. The boy said he had. "'What did she say, Davy?' "'Nothing. Only looked strange,' answered Davy. When the hour of noon was past, and Lady Arctura did not appear, Donal said, "'Davy, we'll have our New Testament lesson out of doors. That is the best place for it.' "'It is the best place,' responded Davy, jumping up. "'But you're not taking your book, Mr. Grant. Never mind. I will give you a lesson or two without book first. Just as they were leaving the room, appeared Lady Arctura with Miss Carmichael. "'I understood,' said the former, with not a little haughtiness, "'that you—' She hesitated, and Miss Carmichael took up the word. "'We wish to form our own judgment,' she said, "'on the nature of the religious instruction you give your pupil.' "'I invited Lady Arctura to be present when I taught him about God,' said Donal. "'Then are you not now going to do so?' said Arctura. "'As your ladyship made no answer to my proposal, and school hours were over, I concluded you were not coming.' "'And you would not give the lesson without her ladyship,' said Miss Carmichael. "'Very right.' "'Excuse me,' returned Donal. "'We were going to have it out of doors.' "'But you had agreed not to give him any so-called religious instruction but in the presence of Lady Arctura.' "'By no means. I only offered to give it in her presence if she chose. There was no question of the lessons being given.' Miss Carmichael looked at Lady Arctura, as much as to say, "'Is he speaking the truth?' and if she replied, it was in the same fashion. Donal looked at Miss Carmichael. He did not at all relish her interference. He had never said he would give his lesson before any who chose to be present. But he did not see how to meet the intrusion. Neither could he turn back into the schoolroom, sit down, and begin. He put his hand on Davy's shoulder and walked slowly towards the lawn. The ladies followed in silence. He sought to forget their presence, and be conscious only of his pupils and his masters. On the lawn he stopped suddenly. Davy, he said, where do you fancy the first lesson in the New Testament ought to begin? At the beginning, replied Davy. When a thing is perfect, Davy, it is difficult to say what is the beginning of it. Show me one of your marbles. The boy produced from his pocket a pure white one, a real marble. That is a good one for the purpose, remarked Donal. "'very smooth and white, with just one red streak in it. "'Now, where is the beginning of this marble?' "'Nowhere,' answered Davy. "'If I should say everywhere?' suggested Donal. "'Ah, yes,' said the boy. "'But I agree with you that it begins nowhere.' "'It can't do both.' "'Oh, yes, it can. "'It begins nowhere for itself, but everywhere for us. "'Only all its beginnings are endings, "'and all its endings are beginnings.' Look here. Suppose we begin at this red streak. It is just there we should end again. That is because it is a perfect thing. Well, there was one who said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first Greek letter and the last, you know. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. All the New Testament is about him. He is perfect, and I may begin about him where I best can. Listen, then, as if you had never heard anything about him before. Many years ago, about fifty or sixty grandfathers off, there appeared in the world a few men who said that a certain man had been their companion for some time and had just left them, that he was killed by cruel men and buried by his friends, but that, as he had told them he would, he lay in the grave only three days and left it on the third alive and well, and that after forty days, during which they saw him several times, he went up into the sky and disappeared." It wasn't a very likely story, was it? No, replied Davy. The ladies exchanged looks of horror. Neither spoke, but each leaned eagerly forward in fascinated expectation of worse to follow. 
"'But, Davy,' Donal went on, "'however unlikely it must have seemed to those who heard it, "'I believe every word of it.' "'A ripple of contempt passed over Miss Carmichael's face. "'For,' continued Donal, "'the man said he was the Son of God, "'come down from his father to see his brothers, "'his father's children, "'and take home with him to his father those who would go.' "'Excuse me,' interrupted Miss Carmichael, with a pungent smile. "'What he said was that if any man believed in him, he should be saved.' "'Run along, Davy,' said Donal. "'I will tell you more of what he said next lesson. "'Don't forget what I've told you now.' "'No, sir,' answered Davy, and ran off. "'Donal lifted his hat and would have gone towards the river. "'But Miss Carmichael, stepping forward, said, "'Mr. Grant, I cannot let you go till you answer me one question.' "'Do you believe in the atonement?' "'I do,' answered Donal. "'Favour me, then, with your views upon it,' she said. "'Are you troubled in your mind on the subject?' asked Donal. "'Not in the least,' she replied, with a slight curl of her lip. "'Then I see no occasion for giving you my views. "'But I insist,' Donal smiled. "'Of what consequence can my opinions be to you, ma'am? "'Why should you compel a confession of my faith?' "'As the friend of this family,' "'and the daughter of the clergyman of this parish, "'I have a right to ask what your opinions are. "'You have a most important charge committed to you, "'a child for whose soul you have to account. "'For that I am accountable, but pardon me, not to you. "'You are accountable to Lord Morven for what you teach his child. "'I am not. "'What? "'He will turn you away at a moment's notice if you say so to him. "'I should be quite ready to go. "'If I were accountable to him for what I taught, "'I should, of course, teach only what he pleased.' "'But do you suppose I would take any situation on such a condition?' "'It is nothing to me, or his lordship either, I presume, "'what you would or would not do. "'Then I see no reason why you should detain me. "'Lady Arctura, I did not offer to give my lesson "'in the presence of any other than yourself. "'I will not do so again. "'You will be welcome, for you have a right to know what I am teaching him. "'If you bring another, except to be my lord Morvan, "'I will take David to my own room.' "'With these words he left them.' Lady Arctura was sorely bewildered. She could not but feel that her friend had not shown to the better advantage, and that the behaviour of Donal had been dignified. But surely he was very wrong. What he said to Davy sounded so very different from what was said at church, and by her helper, Miss Carmichael. It was a pity they had heard so little. He would have gone on if only Sophie had had patience and held her peace. Perhaps he might have spoken better things if she had not interfered. It would hardly be fair to condemn him upon so little. He had said that he believed every word of the New Testament, or something very like it. "'I have heard enough,' said Miss Carmichael. "'I will speak to my father at once.' The next day Donal received a note to the following effect. "'Sir, in consequence of what I felt bound to report to my father of the conversation we had yesterday, he desires that you will call upon him at your earliest convenience. He is generally at home from three to five. "'Yours truly, Sophia Agnes Carmichael.' "'To this Donal immediately replied, "'Madam, notwithstanding the introduction I brought him from another clergyman, "'your father declined my acquaintance, "'passing me afterwards as one unknown to him. "'From this fact, and from the nature of the report "'which your behaviour to me yesterday justifies me "'in supposing you must have carried to him, "'I can hardly mistake his object in wishing to see me. "'I will attend the call of no man to defend my opinions.' Your father's I have heard almost every Sunday since I came to the castle, and have been from childhood familiar with them. Yours truly, Donal Grant. Not a word more came to him from either of them. When they happened to meet, Miss Carmichael took no more notice of him than her father. But she impressed it upon the mind of her friend that, if unable to procure his dismission, she ought at least to do what she could to protect her cousin from the awful consequences of such false teaching. If she was present... He would not say such things as he would in her absence, for it was plain he was under restraint with her. She might even have some influence with him if she would but take courage to show him where he was wrong. Or she might find things such that her uncle must see the necessity of turning him away. As the place belonged to her, he would never go dead against her. She did not see that that was just the thing to fetter the actions of a delicate-minded girl. Continually haunted, however, with the feeling that she ought to do something, Lady Arctura felt as if she dared not absent herself from the lesson, however disagreeable it might prove. That much she could do. 
Upon the next occasion, therefore, she appeared in the schoolroom at the hour appointed, and with a cold bow took the chair Donal placed for her. "'Now, Davy,' said Donal, "'what have you done since our last lesson?' Davy stared. "'You didn't tell me to do anything, Mr. Grant?' "'No. But what then did I give you the lesson for? Where is the good of such a lesson if it makes no difference to you? What was it I told you?' Davy, who had never thought about it since, the lesson having been broken off before Donal could bring it to its natural fruit, considered, and said, "'That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Well, where is the good of knowing that?' Davy was silent. He knew no good of knowing it, neither could imagine any. The catechism, of which he had learned about half, suggested nothing. "'Come, Davy, I will help you. Is Jesus dead, or is he alive?' Davy considered. Alive, he answered. What does he do? Davy did not know. What did he die for? Here Davy had an answer, a cut and dried one. To take away our sins, he said. Then what does he live for? Davy was once more silent. Do you think that if a man died for a thing, he would be likely to forget it the minute he rose again? No, sir. Do you not think he would just go on doing the same thing as before? I do, sir. Then, as he died to take away our sins, he lives to take them away. Yes, sir. What are sins, Davy? Bad things, sir. Yes, the bad things we think, and the bad things we feel, and the bad things we do. Have you any sins, Davy? Yes, I am very wicked. Oh, are you? How do you know it? Arky told me. What is being wicked? Doing bad things. What bad things do you do? I don't know, sir. Then you don't know that you are wicked. You only know that Arky told you so. Lady Arctura drew herself up, but Donal was too intent to perceive the offence he had given. I will tell you, Donal went on, something you did wicked today. Davy grew rosy red. When we find out one wicked thing we do, it is a beginning to finding out all the wicked things we do. Some people would rather not find them out, but have them hidden from themselves and from God too. But let us find them out, every one of them, that we may ask Jesus to take them away, and help Jesus to take them away, by fighting them with all our strength. This morning you pulled the little pup's ears till he screamed. Davy hung his head. You stopped a while, and then did it again. So I knew it wasn't that you didn't know. Is that a thing Jesus would have done when he was a little boy? No, sir. Why? Because it would have been wrong. I suspect, rather, it is because he would have loved the little pup. He didn't have to think about its being wrong. He loves every kind of living thing. He wants to take away your sin because he loves you. He doesn't merely want to make you not cruel to the little pup, but to take away the wrong think that doesn't love him. He wants to make you love every living creature. Davy, Jesus came out of the grave to make us good. Tears were flowing down Davy's cheeks. The lesson's done, Davy, said Donal, and rose and went, leaving him with Lady Arctura. But ere he reached the door, he turned with sudden impulse and said, Davy, I love Jesus Christ and his Father more than I can tell you, more than I can put in words, more than I can think, and if you love me, you will mind what Jesus tells you. What a good man you must be, Mr. Grant! Mustn't he, Arky? sobbed Davy. Donal laughed. "'What, Davy?' he exclaimed. "'You think me very good for loving the only good person in the whole world. "'That is very odd. "'Why, Davy, I should be the most contemptible creature, knowing him as I do, "'not to love him with all my heart. "'Yes, with all the big heart I shall have one day when he is done making me.' "'Is he making you still, Mr. Grant? "'I thought you were grown up.' "'Well, I don't think he will make me any taller,' answered Donal. "'But the live part of me, the thing I love you with.' the thing I think about God with, the thing I love poetry with, the thing I read the Bible with, that thing God keeps on making bigger and bigger. I do not know where it will stop. I only know where it will not stop. That thing is me, and God will keep on making it bigger to all eternity, though he has not even got it into the right shape yet. Why is he so long about it? I don't think he is long about it, but he could do it quicker if I were as good as by this time I ought to be, with the father and mother I have, and all my long hours on the hillsides with my New Testament and the sheep. 
I prayed to God on the hill and in the fields, and he heard me, Davy, and made me see the foolishness of many things, and the grandeur and beauty of other things. Davy, God wants to give you the whole world and everything in it. When you have begun to do the things Jesus tells you, then you will be my brother, and we shall both be his little brothers and the sons of his father God, and so the heirs of all things. With that he turned again and went. The tears were rolling down Arctura's face without her being aware of it. He is a well-meaning man, she said to herself, but dreadfully mistaken. The Bible says believe, not do. The poor girl, though she read her Bible regularly, was so blinded by the dust and ashes of her teaching that she knew very little of what was actually in it. The most significant things slipped from her as if they were merest words without shadow of meaning or intent. They did not support the doctrines she had been taught, and therefore said nothing to her. The story of Christ and the appeals of those who had handled the word of life had another end in view than making people understand how God arranged matters to save them. God would have us live. If we live, we cannot but know. All the knowledge in the universe could not make us live. Obedience is the road to all things, the only way in which to grow able to trust him. Love and faith and obedience are sides of the same prism. Regularly after that, Lady Arctura came to the lesson, always intending to object as soon as it was over. But always before the end came, Donal had said something that went so to the heart of the honest girl that she could say nothing. As if she too had been a pupil, as indeed she was, far more than either knew, she would rise when Davy rose and go away with him. But it was to go alone into the garden, or to her room, not seldom finding herself wishing things true, which yet she counted terribly dangerous. Listening to them, might not she, as well as Davy, fail miserably of escape from the wrath to come? End of chapter 18《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッ but closed at one end by a built-up gate and at the other by a high wall, between which two points it stretched quite a mile, was a favorite resort of Donal's, partly for its beauty, partly for its solitude. The arms of the great trees crossing made of it a long aisle, its roof a broken vault of leaves, upheld by irregular pointed arches, which affected one's imagination like an ever-shifting dream of architectural suggestion. Having ceased to be away, it was now all but entirely deserted, and there was eeriness in the vanishing vista that showed nothing beyond. When the wind of the twilight sighed in gusts through its moanful crowd of fluttered leaves, or when the wind of the winter was tormenting the ancient haggard boughs, and the trees looked as if they were weary of the world, and longing after the garden of God, yet more when the snow lay heavy upon their branches, sorely trying their aged strength to support its oppression, and giving the onlooker a vague sense of what the world would be if God were gone from it. Then the old avenue was a place from which one with more imagination than courage would be ready to haste away, and seek instead the abodes of men. But Donal, though he dearly loved his neighbor, and that in the fullest concrete sense, was capable of loving the loneliest spots, for in such he was never alone. It was altogether a neglected place, Long grass grew over its floor from end to end, cut now and then for hay, or to feed such animals as had grass in their stalls. Along one border, outside the trees, went a footpath, so little used that, though not quite conquered by the turf, the long grass often met over the top of it. Finding it so lonely, Donal grew more and more fond of it. It was his outdoor study, his prosuke, a little aisle of the great temple. Seldom indeed was his reading or meditation there interrupted by sight of human being. About a month after he had taken up his abode at the castle, he was lying one day in the grass with a book companion, under the shade of one of the largest of its beeches, when he felt through the ground, ere he heard through the air, the feet of an approaching horse. 
As they came near, he raised his head to see. His unexpected appearance startled the horse. His rider nearly lost his seat and did lose his temper. Recovering the former and holding the excited animal, which would have been off at full speed, he urged him towards Donal, whom he took for a tramp. He was rising, deliberately, that he might not do more mischief, and was yet hardly on his feet, when the horse, yielding to the spur, came straight at him, its rider with his whip lifted. Donal took off his bonnet, stepped a little aside, and stood. His bearing and countenance calmed the horseman's rage. There was something in them to which no gentleman could fail of response. The rider was plainly one who had more to do with affairs bucolic than with those of cities or courts, but withal a man of conscious dignity, socially afloat, and able to hold his own. "'What the devil!' he cried, for nothing is so irritating to a horseman as to come near losing his seat, except perhaps to lose it altogether. An indignation against the cause of an untoward accident is generally a mortal's first consciousness thereupon. However foolishly, he feels himself injured. But there, having better taken in Donal's look, he checked himself. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Donal. "'It was foolish of me to show myself so suddenly. I might have thought it would startle most horses.' I was too absorbed to have my wits about me. The gentleman lifted his hat. I beg your pardon in return, he said with a smile which cleared every cloud from his face. I took you for someone who had no business here, but I imagine you are the tutor at the castle, with as good a right as I have myself. You guess well, sir. Pardon me that I forget your name. My name is Donal Grant, returned Donal, with an accent on the my, intending a wish to know in return that of the speaker. I am a Graeme answered the other, one of the clan, and factor to the earl. Come and see where I live. My sister will be glad to make your acquaintance. We lead rather a lonely life here, and don't see too many agreeable people. You call this lonely, do you? said Donal thoughtfully. It is a grand place, anyhow. You are right, as you see it now. But wait till winter. Then perhaps you will change your impression a little. Pardon me if I doubt whether you know what winter can be so well as I do. This east coast is by all accounts a bitter place, but I fancy it is only upon a great hillside you can know the heart and soul of a snowblast. I yield that, returned Mr. Graham. It is bitter enough here, though, and a mercy we can keep warm indoors. Which is often more than we shepherd folk can do, said Donal. Mr. Graham used to say afterwards he was never so immediately taken with a man. It was one of the charms of Donal's habit of being— that he never spoke as if he belonged to any other than the class in which he had been born and brought up. This came partly of pride in his father and mother, partly of inborn dignity, and partly of religion. To him the story of our Lord was the reality it is, and he rejoiced to know himself so nearly on the same social level of birth as the master of his life and aspiration. It was Donal's one ambition, to give the high passion a low name, to be free with the freedom which was his natural inheritance, and which is to be gained only by obedience to the words of the master. From the face of this aspiration fled every kind of pretense as from the light flies the darkness. Hence he was entirely and thoroughly a gentleman. What if his clothes were not even of the next to the newest cut? What if he had not been used to what is called society? He was far above such things. If he might but attain to the manners of the high countries, manners which appear because they exist, because they are all through the man. He did not think what he might seem in the eyes of men. Courteous, helpful, considerate, always seeking first how far he could honestly agree with any speaker, opposing never, save sweetly and apologetically, except indeed some utterance flagrantly unjust were in his ears. There was no man of true breeding, in or out of society, who would not have granted that Donal was fit company for any man or woman. Mr. Graham's eye glanced down over the tall, square-shouldered form, a little stooping from lack of drill and much meditation, but instantly straightening itself upon any inward stir, and he said to himself, This is no common man. They were moving slowly along the avenue, Donal by the rider's near knee, talking away like men not unlikely soon to know each other better. You don't make much use of this avenue, said Donal. No, its use is an old story. The castle was for a time deserted, and the family, then passing through a phase of comparative poverty, lived in the house we are in now, to my mind much the more comfortable. What a fine old place it must be if such trees are a fit approach to it. They were never planted for that. 
They are older far. Either there was a wood here, and the rest were cut down and these left, or there was once a house much older than the present. The look of the garden, and some of the offices, favor the latter idea. I have never seen the house, said Donal. You have not then been much about yet, said Mr. Graham. I have been so occupied with my pupil, and so delighted with all that lay immediately around me, that I have gone nowhere, except indeed to see Andrew Coman, the cobbler. Ah, you know him. I have heard of him as a remarkable man. There was a clergyman here from Glasgow, I forget his name, so struck with him he actually seemed to take him for a prophet. He said he was a survival of the old mystics. For my part I have no turn for extravagance. But, said Donal, in the tone of one merely suggesting a possibility, a thing that from the outside may seem an extravagance may look quite different when you get inside it. The more reason for keeping out of it. If acquaintance must make you in love with it, the more air between you and it the better. Would not such precaution as that keep you from gaining a true knowledge of many things? Nothing almost can be known from what people say. True, but there are things so plainly nonsense. Yes, but there are things that seem to be nonsense, because the man thinks he knows what they are when he does not. Who would know the shape of a chair who took his idea of it from its shadow on the floor? What idea can a man have of religion who knows nothing of it except from what he hears at church? Mr. Graham was not fond of going to church, yet went. He was the less displeased with the remark. But he made no reply, and the subject dropped. End of chapter 19「They turned at right angles, skirted the wall for some distance, then turned again with it. It was a somewhat dreary wall, of grey stone, with mortar as grey, not like the rich-coloured walls of old red brick one meets in England. But its roof-like coping was crowned with tufts of wall plants, and a few lichens did something to relieve the greyness. It guided them to a farmyard. Mr. Graham left his horse at the stable, and led the way to the house. They entered it by a back door whose porch was covered with ivy, and going through several low passages came to the other side of the house. There Mr. Graham showed Donal into a large, low-ceilinged, old-fashioned drawing-room, smelling of ancient rose-leaves, their odour of sad hearts rather than of withered flowers, and leaving him went to find his sister. Glancing about him, Donal saw a window open to the ground, and went to it. Beyond lay a more fairy-like garden than he had ever dreamed of. But he had read of, though never looked on such, and seemed to know it from times of old. It was laid out in straight lines, with soft walks of old turf, and in it grew all kinds of straight aspiring things. Their ambition seemed to get up, not to spread abroad. He stepped out of the window, drawn as by the enchantment of one of childhood's dreams, and went wandering down a broad walk his foot sinking deep in the velvety grass, and the loveliness of the dream did not fade. Hollyhocks, gloriously impatient, whose flowers could not wait to reach the top ere they burst into the flame of life, making splendid blots of colour all along their ascending stalks, received him like stately dames of fairy, and enticed him, gently eager for more, down the long walks between rows of them, deep red and creamy white, primrose and yellow, Sure they were leading him to some wonderful spot, some nest of lovely dreams and more lovely visions. The walk did lead to a bower of roses, a bed surrounded with a trellis, on which they climbed and made a huge bonfire, altar of incense, rather, glowing with red and white flame. It seemed more glorious than his brain could receive. Seeing was hardly believing, but believing was more than seeing, though nothing is too good to be true. Many things are too good to be grasped. Poor misbelieving birds of God, he said to himself, we hover about a whole wood of the trees of life, venturing only here and there a peck, as if their fruit might be poison, and the design of our creation was our ruin. We shake our wise owl-feathered heads and declare they cannot be the trees of life, 
that were too good to be true. Ten times more consistent are they who deny there is a God at all than they who believe in a middling kind of God, except indeed that they place in him a fitting faith. The thoughts rose gently in his full heart, as the flowers one after the other stole in at his eyes, looking up from the dark earth like the spirits of its hidden jewels, which themselves could not reach the sun, exhaled in longing. Over grass which fondled his feet like the lap of an old nurse, he walked slowly round the bed of the roses, turning again towards the house. But there, halfway between him and it, was the lady of the garden descending to meet him, not ancient like the garden, but young like its flowers, light-footed and full of life. Prepared by her brother to be friendly, she met him with a pleasant smile, and he saw that the light which shone in her dark eyes had in it rays of laughter. She had a dark yet clear complexion, a good forehead, a nose after no recognized generation of noses, yet an attractive one, a mouth larger than to human judgment might have seemed necessary, yet a right pleasing mouth with two rows of lovely teeth. All this Donal saw approach without dismay. He was no more shy with women than with men, while none the less his feeling towards them partook largely of the reverence of the ideal knight-errant. He would not indeed have been shy in the presence of an angel of God, for his only courage came of truth, and clothed in the dignity of his reverence, he could look in the face of the lovely without perturbation. He would not have sought to hide from him whose voice was in the garden, but would have made haste to cast himself at his feet. Bonnet in hand, he advanced to meet Kate Graham. She held out to him a well-shaped, good-sized hand, not ignorant of work, capable indeed of milking a cow to the cow's satisfaction. Then he saw that her chin was strong, and her dark hair not too tidy, that she was rather tall, and slenderly conceived, though plumply carried out. Her light approach pleased him. He liked the way her foot pressed the grass. If Donal loved anything in the green world, it was neither roses nor hollyhocks, nor even sweet peas, but the grass that is trodden underfoot, that springs in all waste places, and has so often to be glad of the dews of heaven to heal the hot cut of the scythe. He had long abjured the notion of anything in the vegetable kingdom being without some sense of life, without pleasure and pain also, in mild form and degree. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 21 A First Meeting He took her hand and felt it an honest one. A safe, comfortable hand. "'My brother told me he had brought you,' she said. "'I am glad to see you.' "'You are very kind,' said Donal. "'How did either of you know of my existence? "'A few minutes back I was not aware of yours.' "'Was it a rude utterance?' "'He was silent a moment with the silence that promises speech. "'Then added, "'Has it ever struck you how many born friends there are in the world who never meet? "'Persons to love each other at first sight.' "'but who never in this world have that sight?' "'No,' returned Miss Graham, "'with a merrier laugh than quite responded to the remark. "'I certainly never had such a thought. "'I take the people that come "'and never think of those who do not. "'But of course it must be so.' "'To be in the world is to have a great many "'brothers and sisters you do not know,' said Donal. "'My mother told me,' she rejoined, "'of a man who had had so many wives and children "'that his son, whom she had met, "'positively did not know all his brothers and sisters.' "'I suspect,' said Donal, "'we have to know our brothers and sisters.' "'I do not understand. "'We have even got to feel a man is our brother the moment we see him,' pursued Donal, enhancing his former remark. "'That sounds alarming,' said Miss Graham, with another laugh. "'My little heart feels not large enough to receive so many.' "'The worst of it is,' continued Donal, who once started was not ready to draw rein, "'that those who chiefly advocate this extension of the family bonds,' begin by loving their own immediate relations less than anybody else. Extension with them means slackening, as if anyone could learn to love more by loving less, or go on to do better without doing well. He who loves his own little will not love others much. 
"'But how can we love those who are nothing to us?' objected Miss Graham. "'That would be impossible. The family relations are for the sake of developing a love rooted in a far deeper, though less recognized, relation. But I beg your pardon, Miss Graham. Little Davy alone is my pupil, and I forget myself.' "'I am very glad to listen to you,' returned Miss Graham. "'I cannot say I am prepared to agree with you, but it is something in this out-of-the-way corner to hear talk from which it is even worth while to differ.' "'Ah, you can have that here, if you will.' "'Indeed. I mean talk from which you would probably differ. "'There is an old man in the town who can talk better than ever I heard man before. "'But he is a poor man, with a despised handicraft, and none heed him. "'No community recognizes its great men till they are gone. "'Where is the use, then, of being great?' said Miss Graham. "'To be great,' answered Donal, "'to which the desire to be known of men is altogether destructive.' To be great is to seem little in the eyes of men. Miss Graham did not answer. She was not accustomed to consider things seriously. A good girl, in a certain true sense, she had never yet seen that she had to be better, or indeed to be anything. But she was able to feel, though she was far from understanding him, that Donal was in earnest, and that was much. To recognize that a man means something is a great step towards understanding him. "'What a lovely garden this is,' remarked Donal after the sequent pause. "'I have never seen anything like it.' "'It is very old-fashioned,' she returned. "'Do you not find it very stiff and formal? "'Stately and precise, I should rather say. "'I do not mean I can help liking it, in a way. "'Who could help liking it that took his feeling from the garden itself, "'not from what people said about it? "'You cannot say it is like nature. "'Yes, it is very like human nature. "'Man ought to learn of nature.' but not to imitate nature. His work is, through the forms that nature gives him, to express the idea or feeling that is in him. That is far more likely to produce things in harmony with nature than the attempt to imitate nature upon the small human scale. "'You are too much of a philosopher for me,' said Miss Graham. "'I dare say you are quite right, but I have never read anything about art, and I cannot follow you. "'You have probably read as much as I have. "'I am only talking out of what necessity.' the necessity for understanding things, has made me think. One must get things brought together in one's thoughts, if only to be able to go on thinking. This, too, was beyond Miss Graham. The silence again fell, and Donal let it lie, waiting for her to break it this time. End of chapter 21「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 22. A Talk About Ghosts. But again he was the first. They had turned and gone a good way down the long garden, and had again turned towards the house. "'This place makes me feel as I never felt before,' he said. "'There is such a wonderful sense of vanished life about it. "'The whole garden seems dreaming about things of long ago, "'when troops of ladies, now banished into pictures, "'wandered about the place, "'each full of her own thoughts and fancies of life, "'each looking at everything with ways of thinking "'as old-fashioned as her garments. "'I could not be here after nightfall,' without feeling as if every walk were answering to unseen feet, as if every tree might be hiding some lovely form, returned to dream over old memories. Where is the good of fancying what is not true? I can't care for what I know to be nonsense. She was glad to find a spot where she could put down the foot of contradiction, for she came of a family known for what the neighbors called common sense, and in the habit of casting contempt upon everything characterized as superstition, she had now something to say for herself. "'How do you know it is nonsense?' asked Donal, looking round in her face with a bright smile. "'Not nonsense to keep imagining what nobody can see. "'I can only imagine what I do not see. "'Nobody ever saw such creatures as you suppose in any garden. "'Then why fancy the dead so uncomfortable, "'or so ill-looked after that they come back to plague us?' "'Plainly they have never plagued you much,' rejoined Donal, laughing." "'But how often have you gone up and down these walks at dead of night?' "'Never once,' answered Miss Graham, not without a spark of indignation. "'I never was so absurd. 
"'Then there may be a whole night world that you know nothing about. "'You cannot tell that the place is not then thronged with ghosts. "'You have never given them a chance of appearing to you. "'I don't say it is so, for I know nothing, or at least little about such things. "'I have had no experience of the sort any more than you, "'and I have been out whole nights on the mountains when I was a shepherd. "'Why then should you trouble your fancy about them? "'Perhaps just for that reason. "'I do not understand you.' I mean because I can come into no communication with such a world as may be about me. I therefore imagine it. If, as often as I walked abroad at night, I met and held converse with the disembodied, I should use my imagination little, but make many notes of facts. When what may be makes no show, what more natural than to imagine about it? What is the imagination here for? I do not know. The less one has to do with it, the better. Then the thing, whatever it be, should not be called a faculty but a weakness. Yes. But the history of the world shows it could never have made progress without suggestions upon which to ground experiments. Whence may these suggestions come if not from the weakness or impediment called the imagination? Again there was silence. Miss Graeme began to doubt whether it was possible to hold rational converse with a man who, the moment they began upon anything, went straight aloft into some high-flying region of which she knew and for which she cared nothing. But Donal's unconscious desire was in reality to meet her upon some common plane of thought. He always wanted to meet his fellow, and hence that abundance of speech, which, however poetic the things he said, not a few called prosiness. "'I should think,' resumed Miss Graham, "'if you want to work your imagination, you will find more scope for it at the castle than here. This is a poor modern place compared to that.' "'It is a poor imagination,' returned Donal, "'that requires age or any mere accessory to rouse it, the very absence of everything external, the bareness of the mere humanity involved, may in itself be an excitement greater than any accompaniment of the antique or the picturesque. But in this old-fashioned garden, in the midst of these old-fashioned flowers, with all the gentlenesses of old-fashioned life suggested by them, it is easier to imagine the people themselves than where all is so cold, hard, severe, so much on the defensive as in that huge sullen pile on the hilltop. "'I am afraid you find it dull up there,' said Miss Graham. "'Not at all,' replied Donal. "'I have there a most interesting pupil. "'But indeed, one who has been used to spend day after day alone, "'clouds and heather and sheep and dogs his companions, "'does not depend much for pastime. "'Give me a chair and a table, fire enough to keep me from shivering, "'the few books I like best and writing materials, "'and I am absolutely content. "'But beyond these things I have at the castle a fine library.' "'useless, no doubt, for most purposes of modern study, "'but full of precious old books. "'There I can at any moment be in the best of company. "'There is more of the marvellous in an old library "'than ever any magic could work.' "'I do not quite understand you,' said the lady. "'But she would have spoken nearer the truth "'if she had said she had not a glimmer of what he meant. "'Let me explain,' said Donal. "'What could necromancy, which is one of the branches of magic, "'do for one at the best?' "'Well,' exclaimed Miss Graham, "'but I suppose if you believe in ghosts "'you may as well believe in raising them. "'I did not mean to start any question about belief. "'I only wanted to suppose necromancy for the moment a fact "'and put it at its best. "'Suppose the magician could do for you all he professed. "'What would it amount to? "'Only this, to bring before your eyes "'a shadowy resemblance of the form of flesh and blood, "'itself but a passing shadow, "'in which the man moved on the earth "'and was known to his fellow men?' At best the necromancer might succeed in drawing from him some obscure utterance concerning your future, far more likely to destroy your courage than enable you to face what was before you, so that you would depart from your peep into the unknown, merely less able to encounter the duties of life. "'Whoever has a desire for such information must be made very different from me,' said Miss Graham. "'Are you sure of that? Did you never make yourself unhappy about what might be on its way to you, and wish you could know beforehand something to guide you how to meet it?' I should have to think before answering that question. Now tell me, what can the art of writing, and its expansion, or perhaps its development rather, in printing, do in the same direction as necromancy? May not a man, well long after personal communication with this or that one of the greatest who have lived before him? I grant that in respect of some it can do nothing. But in respect of others, instead of mocking you with an airy semblance of their bodily forms, and the murmur of a few doubtful words from their lips, it places in your hands a key to their inmost thoughts. 
Some would say this is not personal communication, but it is far more personal than the other. A man's personality does not consist in the clothes he wears. It only appears in them. No more does it consist in his body, but in him who wears it. As he spoke, Miss Graham kept looking him gravely in the face, manifesting, however, more respect than interest. She had been accustomed to a very different tone in young men. She had found their main ambition to amuse. To talk sense about other matters than the immediate uses of this world was an out-of-the-way thing. I do not say Miss Graham, even on the subject last in hand, appreciated the matter of Donal's talk. She perceived he was in earnest, and happily was able to know a deep pond from a shallow one. But her best thought concerning him was, what a strange new specimen of humanity was here. The appearance of her brother coming down the walk put a stop to the conversation. End of chapter 22「I am glad to see you two getting on so well. How do you know we are? asked his sister, with something of the antagonistic tone which both in jest and earnest is too common between near relations. Because you have been talking incessantly ever since you met. We have been only contradicting each other. I could tell that too by the sound of your voices, but I took it for a good sign. I fear you heard mine almost only, said Donal. I talk too much. "'and I fear I have gathered the fault in a way that makes it difficult to cure.' "'How was it?' asked Mr. Graham. "'By having nobody to talk to. "'I learned it on the hillside with the sheep, and in the meadows with the cattle. "'At college I thought I was nearly cured of it, "'but now, in my comparative solitude at the castle, it seems to have returned.' "'Come here,' said Mr. Graham, "'when you find it getting too much for you. "'My sister is quite equal to the task of re-curing you. "'She has not begun to use her power yet.' "'remarked Donal, as Miss Graham, in hoydenish yet not ungraceful fashion, "'made an attempt to box the ear of her slanderous brother, "'a proceeding he had anticipated, and so was able to frustrate. "'When she knows you better,' he said, "'you will find my sister Kate more than your match.' "'If I were a talker,' she answered, "'Mr. Grant would be too much for me. "'He quite bewilders me. "'What do you think? "'He has been actually trying to persuade me. "'I beg your pardon, Miss Graham. "'I have been trying to persuade you of nothing.' "'What, not to believe in ghosts and necromancy and witchcraft "'and the evil eye and ghouls and vampires "'and I don't know what all out of nursery stories and old annuals?' "'I give you my word, Mr. Graham,' returned Donal, laughing. "'I have not been persuading your sister of any of these things. "'I am certain she could be persuaded of nothing "'of which she did not first see the common sense. "'What I did dwell upon, without a doubt she would accept it, "'was the evident fact that writing and printing "'have done more to bring us into personal relations with the great dead,' Then necromancy, granting the magician the power he claimed, could ever do. For do we not come into contact with the being of a man when we hear him pour forth his thoughts of the things he likes best to think about into the ear of the universe? In such a position does the book of a great man place us. That was what I meant to convey to your sister. And, said Mr. Graham, she was not such a goose as to fail of understanding you, however she may have chosen to put on the garb of stupidity. "'I am sure,' persisted Kate, "'Mr. Grant talked so as to make me think "'he believed in necromancy and all that sort of thing.' "'That may be,' said Donal, "'but I did not try to persuade you to believe.' "'Oh, if you hold me to the letter,' cried Miss Graham, "'coloring a little. "'It would be impossible to get on with such a man,' she thought, "'for he not only preached when you had no pulpit "'to protect you from him, "'but stuck so to his text "'that there was no amusement to be got out of the business.' "'She did not know that if she could have met him,' breaking the ocean tide of his thoughts with fitting opposition, his answers would have come short and sharp as the flashes of waves on rocks. "'If Mr. Grant believes in such things,' said Mr. Graham, "'he must find himself at home in the castle, every room of which may well be the haunt of some weary ghost.' "'I do not believe,' said Donal, "'that any work of man's hands, however awful with crime done in it, can have nearly such an influence for belief in the marvellous as the still presence of live nature.' I never saw an old castle before, 
at least not to make any close acquaintance with it, but there is not an aspect of the grim old survival up there, interesting as every corner of it is, that moves me like the mere thought of a hillside with the veil of the twilight coming down over it, making of it the last step of a stair for the descending foot of the Lord. "'Surely, Mr. Grant, you do not expect such a personal advent,' said Miss Graham. "'I should not like to say what I do or don't expect,' answered Donal, and held his peace, for he saw he was but casting stumbling blocks. The silence grew awkward, and Mr. Graham's good breeding called on him to say something. He supposed Donal felt himself snubbed by his sister. "'If you are fond of the marvellous, though, Mr. Grant,' he said, "'there are some old stories about the castle would interest you. One of them was brought to my mind the other day in the town. It is strange how superstition seems to have its ebbs and flows. A story or legend will go to sleep, and after a time revive with fresh interest. No one knows why.' Probably, said Donal, it is when the tale comes to ears fitted for its reception. They are now in many counties trying to get together and store the remnants of such tales. Possibly the wind of some such inquiry may have set old people recollecting, and young people inventing. That would account for a good deal, would it not? Yes, but not for all, I think. There has been no such inquiry made anywhere near us, so far as I am aware. I went to the Morven Arms last night to meet a tenant and found the tradesmen were talking over their toddy of various events at the castle, and especially of one, the most frightful of all. It should have been forgotten by this time, for the ratio of forgetting increases. "'I should like much to hear it,' said Donal. "'Do tell him, Hector,' said Miss Graham, "'and I will watch his hair.' "'It is the hair of those who mock at such things you should watch,' returned Donal. "'Their imagination is so rarely excited that when it is, it affects their nerves more than the belief of others affects theirs. "'Now I have you,' cried Miss Graham. "'There you confess yourself a believer. "'I fear you have come to too general a conclusion. "'Because I believe the Bible, "'do I believe everything that comes from the pulpit? "'Some tales I should reject with a contempt "'that would satisfy even Miss Graham. "'Of others I should say, "'These seem as if they might be true. "'And of still others, "'These ought to be true, I think. "'But do tell me the story.' "'It is not,' replied Mr. Graham, "'a very peculiar one, "'certainly not peculiar to our castle, "'though unique in some of its details. "'A similar legend belongs to several houses in Scotland, "'and is to be found, I fancy, "'in other countries as well. "'There is one not far from here, "'around whose dark basements, "'or hoary battlements, who shall say which, "'floats a similar tale. "'It is of a hidden room, "'whose position or entrance nobody knows. "'Whether it belongs to our castle by right, "'I cannot tell.' A species of report, said Donal, very likely to arise by a kind of cryptogamic generation. The common people, accustomed to the narrowest dwellings, gazing on the huge proportions of the place, and upon occasion admitted, and walking through a succession of rooms and passages, to them as intricate and confused as a rabbit warren, must be very ready, I should think, to imagine the existence within such a pile of places unknown even to the inhabitants of it themselves. But I beg your pardon. Do tell us the story. "'Mr. Grant,' said Kate, "'you perplex me. "'I begin to doubt if you have any principles. "'One moment you take one side, and the next the other. "'No, no, but I love my own side too well "'to let any traitors into its ranks. "'I would have nothing to do with lies. "'They are all lies together. "'Then I want to hear this one,' said Donal. "'I dare say you have heard it before,' remarked Mr. Graham, and began. "'It was in the earldom of a certain recklessly wicked wretch.' who not only robbed his poor neighbours, and even killed them when they opposed him, but went so far as to behave as wickedly on the Sabbath as on any other day of the week. Late one Saturday night, a company were seated in the castle playing cards and drinking, and all the time Sunday was drawing nearer and nearer and nobody heeding. At length one of them, seeing the hands of the clock at a quarter to twelve, made the remark that it was time to stop. He did not mention the sacred day, but all knew what he meant. The earl laughed, and said if he was afraid of the Kirk session he might go, and another would take his hand. But the man sat still, and said no more till the clock gave the warning. Then he spoke again, and said the day was almost out, and they ought not to go on playing into the Sabbath. And as he uttered the word, his mouth was pulled all on one side. But the earl struck his fist on the table and swore a great oath that if any man rose he would run him through. "'What care I for the Sabbath?' he said. I gave you your chance to go, he added, turning to the man who had spoken, 
who was dressed in black like a minister, and you would not take it. Now you shall sit where you are. He glared fiercely at him, and the man returned him an equally fiery stare. And now first they began to discover what, through the fumes of the whiskey and the smoke of the pine torches, they had not observed. Namely, that none of them knew the man, or had ever seen him before. They looked at him, and could not turn their eyes from him, and a cold terror began to creep through their vitals. He kept his fierce, scornful look fixed on the earl for a moment, and then spoke. "'And I gave you your chance,' he said, "'and you would not take it. "'Now you shall sit still where you are, "'and no Sabbath shall you ever see.' "'The clock began to strike, "'and the man's mouth came straight again. "'But when the hammer had struck eleven times, "'it struck no more, and the clock stopped. "'This day twelve month, said the man, "'you shall see me again, "'and so every year till your time is up. "'I hope you will enjoy your game.' The earl would have sprung to his feet, but could not stir, and the man was nowhere to be seen. He was gone, taking with him both door and windows of the room. Not as Samson carried off the gates of Gaza, however, for he left not the least sign of where they had been. From that day to this, no one has been able to find the room. There the wicked earl and his companions still sit, playing with the same pack of cards and waiting their doom. It has been said that, on that same day of the year, only, unfortunately, testimony differs as to the day. Shouts of drunken laughter may be heard issuing from somewhere in the castle. But as to the direction whence they come, none can ever agree. That is the story. A very good one, said Donal. I wonder what the ground of it is. It must have had its beginning. Then you don't believe it, said Miss Graham. Not quite, he replied. But I have myself had a strange experience up there. What? Have you seen something? cried Miss Graham, her eyes growing bigger. "'No, I have seen nothing,' answered Donal. "'Only heard something. "'One night, the first I was there indeed, "'I heard the sound of a far-off musical instrument, "'faint and sweet.' "'The brother and sister exchanged looks. "'Donal went on. "'I got up and felt my way down the winding stair. "'I sleep at the top of Balliol's tower, "'but at the bottom lost myself "'and had to sit down and wait for the light. "'Then I heard it again, but seemed no nearer to it than before. I have never heard it since, and have never mentioned the thing. I presume, however, that speaking of it to you can do no harm. You at least will not raise any fresh rumors to injure the respectability of the castle. Do you think there is any instrument in it from which such a sound might have proceeded? Lady Arctura is a musician, I am told, but surely was not likely to be at her piano in the dead waste in middle of the night. It is impossible to say how far a sound may travel in the stillness of the night when there are no other sound waves to cross and break it. "'That is all very well, Hector,' said his sister. "'But you know Mr. Grant is neither the first nor the second that has heard that sound.' "'One thing is pretty clear,' said her brother. "'It can have nothing to do with the revellers at their cards. "'The sound reported is very different from any attributed to them.' "'Are you sure,' suggested Donal, "'that there was not a violin shut up with them? "'Even if none of them could play, there has been time enough to learn.' The sound I heard might have been that of a ghostly violin. Though like that of a stringed instrument, it was different from anything I had ever heard before, except perhaps certain equally inexplicable sounds occasionally heard among the hills. They went on talking about the thing for a while, pacing up and down the garden, the sun hot above their heads, the grass cool under their feet. "'It is enough,' said Miss Graham, with a rather forced laugh, "'to make one glad the castle does not go with the title.' "'Why so?' asked Donal. "'Because,' she answered, "'were anything to happen to the boys up there, "'Hector would come in for the title.' "'I'm not of my sister's mind,' said Mr. Graham, "'laughing more genuinely. "'A title with nothing to keep it up is a simple misfortune. "'I certainly should not take out the patent. "'No wise man would lay claim to a title "'without the means to make it respected.' "'Have we come to that?' exclaimed Donal. "'Must even the old titles of the country "'be buttressed into respectability with money?' Away in quiet places, reading old history books, we peasants are accustomed to think differently. If some millionaire moneylender were to buy the old keep of Arundel Castle, you would respect him just as much as the present earl. I would not, said Mr. Graham. I confess you have the better of me. But is there not a fallacy in your argument? he added, thinkingly. I believe not. If the title is worth nothing without the money, the money must be more than the title. If I were Lazarus, Donal went on, and the inheritor of a title, I would use it. 
if only for a lesson to dives upstairs. I scorn to think that honor should wait on the heels of wealth. You may think it is because I am and always shall be a poor man, but if I know myself it is not therefore. At the same time a title is but a trifle, and if you had given any other reason for not using it than homage to mammon I should have said nothing. For my part, said Miss Graham, I have no quarrel with riches, except that they do not come my way. I should know how to use and not abuse them. Donal made no other reply than to turn a look of divinely stupid surprise and pity upon the young woman. It was of no use to say anything. Were argument absolutely triumphant, Mammon would sit just where he was before. He had marked the great indifference of the Lord to the convincing of the understanding. When men knew the thing itself, then and not before would they understand its relations and reasons. If truth belongs to the human soul, then the soul is able to see it and know it. If it do the truth, it takes therein the first possible and almost the last necessary step towards understanding it. Miss Graham caught his look, and must have perceived its expression, for her face flushed a more than rosy red, and the conversation grew crumbly. It was a half-holiday, and he stayed to tea, and after it went over the arm buildings with Mr. Graham, revealing such a practical knowledge of all that was going on that his entertainer soon saw his opinion must be worth something, whether his fancies were or not. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Four Stephen Kennedy. The great comforts of Donal's life, next to those of the world in which his soul lived, the eternal world, whose doors are ever open to him who prays, were the society of his favorite books, the fashioning of his thoughts into sweetly ordered sounds in the lofty solitude of his chamber, and not infrequent communion with the cobbler and his wife. To these he had as yet said nothing of what went on at the castle. He had learned the lesson the cobbler himself gave him. But many a lesson of greater value did he learn from the philosopher of the lapstone. He who understands because he endeavors, is a freed man of the realm of human effort. He who has no experience of his own, to him the experience of others is a sealed book. The convictions that in Donal rose vaporous were rapidly condensed and shaped when he found his new friend thought likewise. By degrees he made more and more of a companion of Davy, and such was the sweet relation between them that he would sometimes have him in his room even when he was writing. When it was time to lay in his winter fuel, he said to him, up here, Davy, we must have a good fire when the nights are long. The darkness will be like solid cold. Simmons tells me I may have as much coal and wood as I like. Will you help me to get them up? Davy sprang to his feet. He was ready that very minute. I shall never learn my lessons if I am cold, added Donal, who could not bear a low temperature so well as when he was always in the open air. Do you learn lessons, Mr. Grant? Yes, indeed I do, replied Donal. One great help to the understanding of things is to brood over them as a hen broods over her eggs. Words are thought eggs, and their chickens are truths. And in order to brood, I sometimes learn by heart. I have set myself to learn, before the winter is over if I can, the Gospel of John in the Greek. "'What a big lesson!' exclaimed Davy. "'Ah, but how rich it will make me,' said Donal, and that set Davy pondering. They began to carry up the fuel— Donal taking the coals, and Davy the wood. But Donal got weary of the time it took, and set himself to find a quicker way. So next Saturday afternoon, the rudimentary remnant of the Jewish Sabbath, and the schoolboy's weekly carnival before Lent, he directed his walk to a certain fishing village, the nearest on the coast, about three miles off, and there succeeded in hiring a spare boat spar with a block and tackle. The spar he ran out, through a notch of the battlement near the sheds, and having stayed it well back, rove the rope through the block at the peak of it, and lowered it with a hook at the end. A moment of Davy's help below, and a bucket filled with coals was on its way up. This part of the roof was over a yard belonging to the household offices, and Davy filled the bucket from a heap they had there made. "'Stand back, Davy!' Donal would cry, and up would go the bucket, to the ever-renewed delight of the boy. When it reached the block, 
Donal, by means of a guy, swung the spar on its butt end, and the bucket came to the roof through the next notch of the battlement. There he would empty it, and in a moment it would be down again to be refilled. When he thought he had enough of coal, he turned to the wood, and thus they spent an hour of a good many of the cool evenings of autumn. Davy enjoyed it immensely, and it was no small thing for a boy delicately nurtured to be helped out of the feeling that he must have everything done for him. When after a time he saw the heap on the roof, he was greatly impressed with the amount that could be done by little and little. In return, Donal told him that if he worked well through the week, he should every Saturday evening spend an hour with him by the fire he had thus helped to provide, and they would then do something together. After his first visit, Donal went again and again to the village. He had made acquaintance with some of the people, and liked them. There was one man, however, who, although attracted by his look despite its apparent sullenness he had tried to draw him into conversation, seemed to avoid, almost to resent his advances. But one day, as he was walking home, Stephen Kennedy overtook him, and saying he was going in his direction, walked alongside of him, to the pleasure of Donal, who loved all humanity, and especially the portion of it acquainted with hard work. He was a middle-sized young fellow, with a slouching walk, but a well-shaped and well-set head, and a not uncomely countenance. He was brown as sun and salt sea winds could make him, and had very blue eyes and dark hair, telling of Norwegian ancestry. He lounged along with his hands in his pockets, as if he did not care to walk, yet got over the ground as fast as Donal, who, with yet some remnant of the peasant's stride, covered the ground as if he meant walking. After their greeting, a great and enduring silence fell, which lasted till the journey was halfway over. Then all at once the fisherman spoke. "'There's a lass at the castle, sir,' he said. "'They call Epicomen.' "'There is,' answered Donal. "'Do ye ken the lass, sir? "'To speak till her, I mean.' "'Surely,' replied Donal. "'I know her grandfather and grandmother well.' "'Decent folk,' said Stephen. "'They are that,' responded Donal. "'As good people as I know.' "'Would you do them a good turn?' asked the fisherman. "'Indeed I would.' "'Well, it's this, sir. "'I had great doubts gin all be gone very well with the lass at the castle.' "'As he said the words, he turned his head aside,' and spoke so low and in such a muffled way that Donal could but just make out what he said. "'You must be a little plainer if you would have me do anything,' he returned. "'I'll be right plain with you, sir,' answered Stephen, and then fell silent as if he would never speak again. Donal waited, nor uttered a sound. At last he spoke once more. "'You mon ken, sir,' he said. "'I a had a fancy to the last this many a day, for ye'll allow she's both bonny and winsome.' Donal did not reply, for although he was ready to grant her bonny, he had never felt her winsome. "'Well,' he went on, "'her and me's been courtin' this two year, and good friends we I was till this last spring, when all at once she turned highty tighty like nor do what I might could I get her to say what it was that changed her. So far as I kenned I had done nothing, nor would she say I had given her any cause of complaint.' but though she couldna say I had ever given Marner a civil word to any lass but herself, she appeared uncle willing to fix me with this one and that one or any one. I couldna think what had come o'er her. But at last, and a sir last it is, I had come to the understanding o' it. She would fain have a pretense for breaking with me. She would have it that I was doing as she was doing herself, holding company with another. "'Are you quite sure of what you say?' asked Donal. "'Or sure, sir, though I'm not at liberty to tell you how I came to be.' "'Dinna think, sir, that I'm one to hold a last till her word when her heart does not back it. "'I would have said nothing about it, but just borne the heartbreak with the becoming silence, "'for greeting nor rage in men no nets, nor take the life in no dogfish. "'But it's God's truth, sir. I'm terrible feared for the lassie herself. "'She's that ta'en up with him, they tell me, at she can think of nothing but him. "'And he's a young lord, not a poor lad like me, and that's what fears me.' "'A great dread and a great compassion together laid hold of Donal.' but he did not speak. "'Gin it came to that,' resumed Stephen, "'I doubt the fisher lad would win her better bread nor my lord. "'For gin all tales be true, "'he would have to work for his own bread. "'The castle's not his, "'nor can be, sep he marry the lady o' it. "'But it's not Mary and Eppy he'll be after, "'or any the likes o' him.' "'You don't surely hint,' said Donal, "'that there's anything between her and Lord Forgu. "'She must be an idle girl "'to take such a thing into her head.' "'I was well she had taen it into her head.' She'll get it the easier out of her heart. But deed, sir, I'm sair feart. I speak not o' it for my own sake, 
for gin there be truth until it, there can never be mur between her and me. But eh, sir, the pity o' it was sic a bonny lass, for he canna mean fair by her. The grand folk does fear some things. It's small wonder at whiles the poor folk rises with a roar and tears down all as they did in France. All you say is quite true, but the charge is such a serious one. It is that, sir. But though it be true, I'm not going to make it for the world. You are right there. It could do no good. I fear it may do as little where I am going to make it. I'm upon my road to gar my lord gin the count of himself. Faith, gin it be not a good one, I'll throw the neck of him. It's better me to hang nor her to gin disgrace, poor thing. She can be nothing mere to me, as I say. But I would like wail the ring of her lord's neck. It would be like killing a shark. Why do you tell me this? asked Donal. "'Cause I look to you to get me to word of the man. "'That you may wring his neck. "'You should not have told me that. "'I should be art and part in his murder. "'Would you have me let the lassie take her chance on doing anything?' "'said the fisherman with scorn. "'By no means. "'I would do something myself, whoever the girl was, "'and she is the granddaughter of my best friends. "'Sir, you will not surely fail me. "'I will help you somehow, but I will not do what you want me. "'I will turn the thing over in my mind. "'I promise you I will do something.' "'What I cannot say offhand. "'You had better go home again, and I will come to you to-morrow.' "'Na, na, that winna do,' said the man, half doggedly, half fiercely. "'The heart'll be out o' my bonny, gin I dinna do something. "'This very night it mun be done. "'I canna bide in hell any longer. "'The thought o' the rascal slaverin' his lays o'er my eppy is killin' me. "'My brain's like a fire. "'I see the very billows o' the ocean as red as blood. "'If you come near the castle to-night, I will have you taken up. "'I am too much your friend to see you hanged.' "'but if you go home and leave the matter to me, "'I will do my best and let you know. "'She shall be saved if I can compass it. "'What, man, you would not have God against you? "'He'll be upon the side of the right, I'm thinking. "'Doubtless. "'But he has said vengeance is mine. "'He can't trust us with that. "'He won't have us interfering. "'It's more his concern than yours yet "'that the lassie have fair play. "'I will do my part.' "'They walked on in gloomy silence for some time. "'Suddenly the fisherman put out his hand, seized Donal's with a convulsive grasp, was possibly reassured by the strength with which Donal's responded, turned, and without a word went back. Donal had to think. Here was a most untoward affair. What could he do? What ought he to attempt? From what he had seen of the young lord, he could not believe he intended wrong to the girl. But he might be selfishly amusing himself, and was hardly one to reflect that the least idle familiarity with her was a wrong. The thing, if there was the least truth in it, must be put a stop to at once. But it might be all a fancy of the justly jealous lover, to whom the girl had not of late been behaving as she ought. Or might there not be somebody else? At the same time, there was nothing absurd in the idea that a youth, fresh from college and suddenly discompanioned at home, without society, possessed by no love of literature, and with almost no amusements, should, if only for very ennui, be attracted by the pretty face and figure of Eppie and then enthralled by her coquetries of instinctive response. There was danger to the girl, both in silence and in speech. If there was no ground for the apprehension, the very supposition was an injury, might even suggest the thing it was intended to frustrate. Still, something must be risked. He had just been reading in Sir Philip Sidney that whosoever in great things will think to prevent all objections must lie still and do nothing. But what was he to do? The readiest and simplest thing was to go to the youth, tell him what he had heard, and ask him if there was any ground for it. But they must find the girl another situation. In either case, distance must be put between them. He would tell her grandparents, but he feared if there was any truth in it, they would have no great influence with her. If, on the other hand, the thing was groundless, they might make it up between her and her fishermen and have them married. She might only have been teasing him. He would certainly speak to the young lord. Yet again, what if he should actually put the mischief into his thoughts? If there should be ever so slight a leaning in the direction, might he not so give a sudden and fatal impulse? He would take the housekeeper into his counsel. She must understand the girl. Things would at once show themselves to her on the one side or the other, which might reveal the path he ought to take. But did he know Mistress Brooks well enough? Would she be prudent, or spoil everything by precipitation? She might ruin the girl if she acted without sympathy, "'caring only to get the appearance of evil out of the house. "'The way the legally righteous act the policemen in the moral world "'would be amusing were it not so sad. "'They are always making the evil move on. 
driving it to do its mischiefs to other people instead of them, dispersing nests of the degraded to crowd them the more, and with worse results in other parts. Why should such be shocked at the idea of sending out of the world those to whom they will not give a place in it to lay their heads? They treat them in this world as, according to the old theology, their God treats them in the next, keeping them alive for sin and suffering. Some with the bright lamp of their intellect, others with the smoky lamp of their life, cast a shadow of God on the wall of the universe, and then believe or disbelieve in the shadow. Donal was still in meditation when he reached home, and still undecided what he should do. Crossing a small court on his way to his airy, he saw the housekeeper making signs to him from the window of her room. He turned and went to her. It was of Eppie she wanted to speak to him. How often is the discovery of a planet, of a truth, of a scientific fact, made at once in different places far apart? She asked him to sit down and got him a glass of milk, which was his favorite refreshment, little imagining the expression she attributed to fatigue arose from the very thing occupying her own thoughts. "'It's a queer thing,' she began, "'for an old wife like me to come to a young gentleman like yourself, sir, with sick a tail. "'But, as the saying is, needs mon when the dale drives. "'And here's like to be an uncle stramish about the place, "'gin we come not together upon some gate out of it. "'Dinna look so scared, like, sir. "'We may be in time yet, ere the worst come to the worst, "'though it's some ill to say what may be the worst "'in such an ill-coopered kind of affair. "'There's the two fools o' bairns. "'Truth they're no better. "'And the tain's just as muckle to blame as the tither.' Only the lass is word to blame nor the lad, being made sharper, and kin and better nor him what comes a sick. Eh, but she is a gowk. Here Mrs. Brooks paused, lost in contemplation of the gowkedness of Eppie. She was a florid, plump, good-looking woman, over forty, with thick auburn hair, brushed smooth. One of those women comely in soul as well as body, who are always to the discomfiture of wrong and the healing of strife. Left a young widow, she had refused many offers. Once was all that was required of her in the way of marriage. She had found her husband good enough not to be followed by another, and marriage hard enough to favor the same result. When she sat down, smoothing her apron on her lap and looking him in the face with clear blue eyes, he must have been either a suspicious or an unfortunate man who would not trust her. She was a general softener of shocks, foiler of encounters, and soother of angers. She was not one of those housekeepers always in black silk and lace, but was mostly to be seen in a cotton gown. Very clean, but by no means imposing. She would put her hands to anything. Show a young servant how a thing ought to be done, or relieve cook or housemaid who was ill or had a holiday. Donal had taken to her, as like does to like. He did not hurry her, but waited. I may as well give you the whole story, sir, she recommenced. "'Sain you'll be where I am myself. "'I was out in the yard to look after my hens. "'I never let anybody but myself meddle with them, "'for they're just as easy spoilt as other folks' bairns. "'In the two doors of the barn standing open, "'I took the straight road through the same "'to win the easier at my feathered folk, "'as my old Minnie used to call them. "'I'm but a soft kind of a being, "'as my feather used to tell me, "'and make but little den where I gang, "'so they couldn't have heard my foot as I could. "'But what should I hear? "'But I mun tell you it was in the gloaming last night,' "'and I wouldn't tell you the same this morning, sir, "'seeking your fair counsel. "'But ye was away afore I kenned, "'and I was resolved not to let another gloaman come "'on ten precautions. "'What should I hear, I say, as I was saying, "'but a like tch, 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 "'somewhere, I couldn't tell where, "'as gin some had mere to say nor would be spoken out. "'Well, you see, "'being one accountable to others, "'for them it's accountable to me, "'I stood still and hearkened. "'Gin all was right, none would be the word for me, "'and gin all was not right,' "'All should be wrong, and I could make it so. "'Well, as I say, I hearkened. "'But, eh, sir, just get a keek out of that door, "'and see gin there be no somebody there hearkening. "'For that Eppy, I wouldn't have lippin' till her one hair. "'She's as sly as an edder. "'Nobody there? "'Well, stick ye the door, sir, and I say gang on with my tail. "'I stood and hearkened, as I was saying, "'and what should I hear but a twosome toot-moot, "'as my old auntie Fred Iberdeen would have called it. "'One voice that of a man, and the other that of a woman.' "'for it's strange the differ, even when Beth speaks the likest. "'I was aye gleg in the hearin', and had reason for the same to be thankful, "'but I couldn't for all my sharpness make out what they were sayin'. "'So when I saw it I wasna to hear, I just sit about seein', "'and as quietly as my soft foot, it's softer nor its light, would carry me, "'I goed about the barn floor, 
looking whar anybody could be hidden away. There was a great heap of straw in one corner, not hard against the wall, and atween the wall and that heap of thrashing straw sat the two. Up got my lord with a spang, as guinea had been tain stealing. Eppie would have bidden, and creep it out like a mouse ahind my back, but I was o'er sharp for her. Come out o' that, my lass, says I. Oh, Mistress Brooks, says my lord, Uncle Seville, for my sake don't be hard upon her. No, that anchored me. For though I say the lass is mer to blame nor the lad, it's not for the lad, be he lord or labourer, to lead himself out when the blame comes. And says I, My lord, says I, ye ought to kin better. I shall say no more in the now, for I'm o'er angry. Gain your ways. But no, not together, my lord. I shall look well to that. Gain up to Lyra and room, Eppie, I said, and gin I dinna see you there when I come in, it's away to your granny I gang this very night. Eppie, she good, and my lord, he stood there, with a face that glowed white through the gloaming. I turned upon him like a wild beast, and says I, I winna speer what you're up till, my lord, but ye can well enough what it looks like, and I would never have expected it o' ye. He began, and he stammered, and he begged me to believe there was nothing between them, and he wouldna harm the lassie to save his life and all the life of it, and I couldn't in my heart but pity them both. Two sick bairns, doubtless drawn together with no thought of ill, ilk one by the bonny face of the other, as is but natural, though it cannot be allowed. He was seek at me so sair that I foolishly promised not to tell his father, gin he on his side would promise not to have more to do with Ippy. And that he did. No, I never had reason to doubt my young lord's word, but in a case of this kind it's I better not to lippen. Onigate, the thing canna be left this wise, for gin ill came of it, where would we all be? I did not promise not to tell anybody. I'm free to tell yourself, Mr. Grant, and you mon contrive what's to be done. I will speak to him, said Donal, and see what humour he is in. That will help to clear the thing up. We will try to do right, and trust to be kept from doing wrong. Donal left her to go to his room, but had not reached the top of the stair when he saw clearly that he must speak to Lord Forgo at once. He turned and went down to a room that was called his. When he reached it, only Davy was there, turning over the leaves of a folio worn by fingers that had been dust for centuries. He said Percy went out and would not let him go with him. Knowing Mistress Brooks was looking after Eppie, Donal put off seeking farther for Forgu till the morrow. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Five Evasion. The next day he could find him nowhere, and in the evening went to see the Comans. It was pretty dark, but the moon would be up by and by. When he reached the cobbler's house, he found him working as usual, only indoors now that the weather was colder, and the light sooner gone. He looked innocent, bright, and contented as usual. If God be at peace, he would say to himself, why should not I? Once he said this aloud, almost unconsciously, and was overheard. It strengthened the regard with which worldly churchgoers regarded him. He was to them an irreverent, yea, blasphemous man. They did not know God enough to understand the cobbler's words, and all the interpretation they could give them was after their kind. Their long Sunday faces indicated their reward. The cobbler's cheery, expectant look indicated his. The two were just wondering a little when he entered that young Eppy had not made her appearance. But then, as her grandmother said, she had often, especially during the last few weeks, been later still. As she spoke, however, they heard her light, hurried foot on the stair. "'Here she comes at last,' said her grandmother, and she entered. She said she could not get away so easily now. Donal feared she had begun to lie. After sitting a quarter of an hour, she rose suddenly and said she must go, for she was wanted at home. Donal rose also and said, as the night was dark and the moon not yet up, it would be better to go together. Her face flushed. She had to go into the town first, she said, to get something she wanted. Donal replied he was in no hurry, and would go with her. She cast an inquiring, almost suspicious look on her grandparents, but made no further objection, and they went out together. They walked to the high street, and to the shop where Donal had encountered the parson. He waited in the street till she came out. 
Then they walked back the way they had come, little thinking, either of them, that their every step was dogged. Kennedy, the fisherman, firm in his promise not to go near the castle, could not therefore remain quietly at home. He knew it was Eppie's day for visiting her folk, went to the town, and had been lingering about in the hope of seeing her. Not naturally suspicious, justifiable jealousy had rendered him such, and when he saw the two together he began to ask whether Donal's anxiety to keep him from encountering Lord Forgue might not be due to other grounds than those given or implied. So he followed, careful they should not see him. They came to a baker's shop, and stopping at the door, Eppie, in a voice that in vain sought to be steady, asked Donal if he would be so good as wait for her a moment, while she went in to speak to the baker's daughter. Donal made no difficulty, and she entered, leaving the door open as she found it. Lowry Leper's shop was lighted with only one dip, too dim almost to show the sugar biscuits and peppermint drops in the window that drew all day the hungry eyes of the children. A pleasant smell of bread came from it, and did what it could to entertain him in the all but deserted street. While he stood, no one entered or issued. "'She's having a long talk,' he said to himself, but for a long time was not impatient. He began at length, however, to fear she must have taken ill, or have found something wrong in the house. When more than half an hour was gone, he thought it time to make inquiry. He entered, therefore, shutting the door and opening it again, to ring the spring bell, then mechanically closing it behind him. Straightway Mrs. Lepper appeared from somewhere to answer the squall of the shrill-tongued summoner. Donal asked if Eppie was ready to go. The woman stared at him a moment in silence. "'Eppie who, said ye?' she asked at length. "'Eppie Coman,' he answered. "'I care nothing about her. "'Lucy?' A good-looking girl, with a stocking she was darning drawn over one hand and arm, followed her mother into the shop. "'What is Eppie Coman, gin ye please?' asked Donal. "'I care nothing about her. I hadna seen her sin this day week,' answered the girl in a very straightforward manner. Donal saw he had been tricked, but judging it better to seek no elucidation, turned with apology to go. As he opened the door, there came through the house from behind a blast of cold wind. There was an open outer door in that direction. The girl must have slipped through the house and out by that door, leaving her squire to cool himself, vainly expectant, in the street. If she had found another admirer, as probably she imagined, his polite attentions were at the moment inconvenient. But she had tried the trick too often, for she had once served her fishermen in like fashion. Seeing her go into the baker's, Kennedy had conjectured her purpose, and hurrying toward the issue from the other exit, saw her come out of the court, and was again following her. Donal hastened homeward. The moon rose. It was a lovely night. Dull gleaming glimpses of the river came through the light fog that hovered over it in the rising moon, like a spirit river continually ascending from the earthly one and resting upon it, but flowing in heavenly places. The white webs shone very white in the moon, and the green grass looked grey. A few minutes more, and the whole country was covered with a low-lying fog, on whose upper surface the moon shone, making it appear to Donal's wondering eyes a widespread inundation from which rose half-submerged houses and stacks and trees. One who had never seen the thing before, and who did not know the country, would not have doubted he looked on a veritable expanse of water. Absorbed in the beauty of the sight, he trudged on. Suddenly he stopped. Were those the sounds of a scuffle he heard on the road before him? He ran. At the next turn, in the loneliest part of the way, he saw something dark, like the form of a man lying in the middle of the road. He hastened to it. The moon gleamed on a pool beside it. A death-like face looked heavenward. It was that of Lord Forgue, without breath or motion. There was a cut in his head. From that the pool had flowed. He examined it as well as he could with anxious eyes. It had almost stopped bleeding. What was he to do? What could be done? There was but one thing. He drew the helpless form to the side of the way, and leaning it up against the earth dike, sat down on the road before it, and so managed to get it upon his back and rise with it. If he could but get him home unseen, much scandal might be forestalled. On the level road he did very well, but strong as he was he did not find it an easy task to climb with such a burden the steep approach to the castle. He had little breath left when at last he reached the platform from which rose the towering bulk. 
he carried him straight to the housekeeper's room. It was not yet more than half-past ten, and though the servants were mostly in bed, Mistress Brooks was still moving about. He laid his burden on her sofa and hastened to find her. Like a sensible woman, she kept her horror and dismay to herself. She got some brandy, and between them they managed to make him swallow a little. He began to recover. They bathed his wound and did for it what they could with scissors and plaster, then carried him to his own room and got him to bed. Donal sat down by him and stayed. His patient was restless and wandering all the night, but towards morning fell into a sound sleep, and was still asleep when the housekeeper came to relieve him. As soon as Mrs. Brooks left Donal with Lord Forgue, she went to Eppie's room and found her in bed, pretending to be asleep. She left her undisturbed, thinking to come easier at the truth if she took her unprepared to lie. It came out afterwards that she was not so heartless as she seemed. She found Lord Forgue waiting her upon the road, and almost immediately Kennedy came up to them. Forgue told her to run home at once. He would soon settle matters with the fellow. She went off like a hare, and till she was out of sight the men stood looking at each other. Kennedy was a powerful man, and Forgue but a stripling. The latter trusted, however, to his skill, and did not fear his adversary. He did not know what he was. He seemed now in no danger, and his attendants agreed to be silent till he recovered. It was given out that he was keeping his room for a few days, but that nothing very serious was the matter with him. In the afternoon, Donal went to find Kennedy, loitered a while about the village, and made several inquiries after him, but no one had seen him. Forgu recovered as rapidly as could have been expected. Davy was troubled that he might not go and see him, but he would have been full of question, remark, and speculation. For what he had himself to do in the matter, Donal was but waiting till he should be strong enough to be taken to task. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of Donal Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. — Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Six — Confrontment At length, one evening, Donal knocked at the door of Forgu's room, and went in. He was seated in an easy chair before a blazing fire, looking comfortable, and showing in his pale face no sign of a disturbed conscience. "'My lord,' said Donal, "'you will hardly be surprised to find I have something to talk to you about.' His lordship was so much surprised that he made him no answer, only looked in his face. Donal went on. "'I want to speak to you about Epicomen,' he said. Forgu's face flamed up. "'The devil of pride, and the devil of fear,' and the devil of shame, all rushed to the outworks to defend the worthless self. But his temper did not at once break bounds. "'Allow me to remind you, Mr. Grant,' he said, "'that although I have availed myself of your help, I am not your pupil, and you have no authority over me.' "'The reminder is unnecessary, my lord,' answered Donal. "'I am not your tutor. But I am the friend of the Comans, and therefore of Epi.' His lordship drew himself up yet more erect in his chair, and a sneer came over his handsome countenance. But Donal did not wait for him to speak. "'Don't imagine me, my lord,' he said, presuming on the fact that I had the good fortune to carry you home. That I should have done for the stable-boy in similar plight. But as I interfered for you then, I have to interfere for Eppie now.' "'Damn your insolence! Do you think because you are going to be a parson you may make a congregation of me?' "'I have not the slightest intention of being a parson,' returned Donal quietly. "'But I do hope to be an honest man.' and your lordship is in great danger of ceasing to be one. "'Get out of my room!' cried Forgu. Donal took a seat opposite him. "'If you do not, I will,' said the young lord, and rose. But ere he reached the door, Donal was standing with his back against it. He locked it and took out the key. The youth glared at him, unable to speak for fury, then turned, caught up a chair and rushed at him. One twist of Donal's plowman hand wrenched it from him. He threw it over his head upon the bed, and stood motionless and silent, waiting till his rage should subside. In a few moments his eye began to quail, and he went back to his seat. "'Now, my lord,' said Donal, following his example and sitting down. "'Will you hear me?' "'I'll be damned if I do,' 
he answered, flaring up again at the first sound of Donal's voice. "'I'm afraid you'll be damned if you don't,' returned Donal. His lordship took the undignified expedient of thrusting his fingers in his ears. Donal sat quiet until he removed them. But the moment he began to speak he thrust them in again. Donal rose, and seizing one of his hands by the wrist, said, "'Be careful, my lord. If you drive me to extremity I will speak so that the house shall hear me. If that will not do, I go straight to your father.' "'You are a spy and a sneak. "'A man who behaves like you should have no terms held with him.' "'The youth broke out in a fresh passion. "'Donal sat waiting till the futile outburst should be over. "'It was presently exhausted, "'the rage seeming to go out for want of fuel. "'Nor did he again stop his ears against the truth "'he saw he was doomed to hear. "'I am come,' said Donal, "'to ask your lordship whether the course you are pursuing "'is not a dishonourable one. "'I know what I am about.' "'So much the worse. But I doubt it. "'For your mother's sake, if for no other, "'you should scorn to behave to a woman as you are doing now. "'What do you please to imagine I am doing now? "'There is no imagination in this. "'That you are behaving to Eppie as no man ought "'except he meant to marry her. "'How do you know I do not mean to marry her? "'Do you mean to marry her, my lord? "'What right have you to ask? "'At least I live under the same roof with you both. "'What if she knows I do not intend to marry her?' My duty is equally plain. I am the friend of her only relatives. If I did not do my best for the poor girl, I dared not look my master in the face. Where is your honor, my lord? I never told her I would marry her. I never supposed you had. Well, what then? I repeat, such attentions as yours must naturally be supposed by any innocent girl to mean marriage. Bah! She is not such a fool. I fear she is fool enough not to know to what they must then point. They point to nothing. "'Then you take advantage of her innocence to amuse yourself with her. "'What if she be not quite so innocent as you would have her? "'My lord, you are a scoundrel.' "'For one moment, Forgue seemed to wrestle with an all but uncontrollable fury. "'The next he laughed. "'But it was not a nice laugh. "'Come now,' he said. "'I'm glad I've put you in a rage. "'I've got over mine. "'I'll tell you the whole truth. "'There is nothing between me and the girl. "'Nothing whatever, I give you my word, "'except an innocent flirtation.' "'Ask herself.' "'My lord,' said Donal, "'I believe what you mean me to understand. "'I thought nothing worse of it myself. "'Then why the devil kick up such an infernal shindy about it?' "'For these reasons, my lord. "'Oh, come, don't be long-winded. "'You must hear me. "'Go on. "'I will suppose she does not imagine you mean to marry her. "'She can't. "'Why not? "'She's not a fool, and she can't imagine me such an idiot. "'But may she not suppose you love her?' He tried to laugh. You have never told her so, never said or done anything to make her think so. Oh, well, she may think so, after a sort of fashion. Would she speak to you again if she heard you talking so of the love you give her? You know as well as I do, the word has many meanings. And which is she likely to take? That which is confessedly false and worth nothing? She may take which she pleases, and drop it when she pleases. "'But now, does she not take your words of love for more than they are worth? "'She says I will soon forget her. "'Will any saying keep her from being so in love with you as to reap misery? "'You don't know what the consequences may be. "'Her love wakened by yours may be infinitely stronger than yours.' "'Oh, women don't nowadays die for love,' said his lordship, feeling a little flattered. "'It would be well for some of them if they did. "'They never get over it. "'She mayn't die, true.' but she may live to hate the man that led her to think he loved her and taught her to believe in nobody. Her whole life may be darkened because you would amuse yourself. She has her share of the amusement, and I have my share by Jove of the danger. She's a very pretty, clever, engaging girl, though she is but a housemaid, said Forgue, as if uttering a sentiment of quite communistic liberality. What you say shows the more danger to her. If you admire her so much, you must have behaved to her so much the more like a genuine lover. But any suffering the affair may have caused you will hardly, I fear, persuade you to the only honourable escape. "'By Jupiter!' cried Forgue. "'Would you have me marry the girl? That's coming it rather strong with your friendship for the cobbler.' "'No, my lord. If things are as you represent, I have no such desire. What I want is to put a stop to the whole affair. Every man has to be his brother's keeper, and if our Western notions concerning women be true— a man is yet more bound to be his sister's keeper. He who does not recognize this, be he earl or prince, is viler than the murderous prowler after a battle. 
For a man to say she can take care of herself is to speak out of essential hell. The beauty of love is that it does not take care of itself, but of the person loved. To approach a girl in any other fashion is a mean, scoundrelly thing. I am glad it has already brought on you some of the chastisement it deserves. His lordship started to his feet in a fresh access of rage. You dare say that to my face? Assuredly, my lord. The fact stands just so. I gave the fellow as good as he gave me. That is nothing to the point, though from the state I found you in it is hard to imagine. Pardon me, I do not believe you behaved like what you call a coward. Lord Forgue was almost crying with rage. I have not done with him yet, he stammered. If I only knew who the rascal is, if I don't pay him out, may— Stop, stop, my lord. All that is mere waste. I know who the man is, but I will not tell you. He gave you no more than you deserved, and I will do nothing to get him punished for it. You are art and part with him. I neither knew of his intent, saw him do it, nor have any proof against him. You will not tell me his name? No. I will find it out and kill him. He threatens to kill you. I will do what I can to prevent either. I will kill him, repeated Forgue through his clenched teeth. And I will do my best to have you hanged for it, said Donal. Leave the room, you insolent bumpkin. When you have given me your word that you will never again speak to Epicomen, I'll be damned first. She will be sent away, where I shall see her the easier. His lordship said this more from perversity than intent, for he had begun to wish himself clear of the affair. Only how was he to give in to this unbearable clown? I will give you till tomorrow to think of it, said Donal, and opened the door. His lordship made him no reply, but cast after him a look of uncertain anger. Donal, turning his head as he shut the door, saw it. I trust, he said, you will one day be glad I spoke to you plainly. Oh, go along with your preaching, cried Forgu, more testily than wrathfully, and Donal went. In the meantime, Eppy had been soundly taken to task by Mrs. Brooks, and told that if once again she spoke a word to Lord Forgu, she should that very day have her dismissal. The housekeeper thought she had at least succeeded in impressing upon her that she was in danger of losing her situation in a way that must seriously affect her character. She assured Donal that she would not let the foolish girl out of her sight, and thereupon Donal thought it better to give Lord Forgue a day to make up his mind. On the second morning he came to the schoolroom when lessons were over and said frankly, "'I've made a fool of myself, Mr. Grant. Make what excuse for me you can. I am sorry. Believe me, I meant no harm.' I have made up my mind that all shall be over between us. Promise me you will not once speak to her again. I don't like to do that. It might happen to be awkward. But I promise to do my best to avoid her. Donal was not quite satisfied, but thought it best to leave the thing so. The youth seemed entirely in earnest. For a time he remained in doubt whether he should mention the thing to Eppie's grandparents. He reflected that their influence with her did not seem very great and if she were vexed by anything they said, it might destroy what little they had. Then it would make them unhappy, and he could not bear to think of it. He made up his mind that he would not mention it, but in the hope she would now change her way, leave the past to be forgotten. He had no sooner thus resolved, however, than he grew uncomfortable, and was unsatisfied with the decision. All would not be right between his friend and him. Andrew Coleman would have something against him. He could no longer meet him as before, for he would be hiding something from him, and he would have a right to reproach him. Then his inward eyes grew clear. He said to himself, What a man has a right to know, another has no right to conceal from him. If sorrow belonged to him, I have as little right to keep that from him as joy. His sorrows and his joys are part of a man's inheritance. My wisdom to take care of this man. His own is immeasurably before mine. The whole matter concerns him. I will let him know at once." The same night he went to see him. His wife was out, and Donal was glad of it. He told him all that had taken place. He listened in silence, his eyes fixed on him, his work on his lap, his hand with the awl hanging by his side. When he heard how Eppy had tricked Donal that night, leaving him to watch in vain, tears gathered in his old eyes. He wiped them away with the backs of his horny hands, and there came no more. Donal told him he had first thought he would say nothing to him about it all. He was so loath to trouble them. But neither his heart nor his conscience would let him be silent. "'Ye did right to tell me,' said Andrew, after a pause. "'It's true we hadna that muckle weight with her, 
for it seems a law of nature that the young's not to be holden down by the experience of the old, which can be experience only to themselves. But when we pray to God, it puts it mere in his power to make use of us for the carrying out of the thing we pray for. It's not I by words he gives us to say. With some folk words gain for Uncle Little, it may be whiles by a look a whilk you ken nothing, or it may be by a motion of your hand, or a turn of your head. Who kens but ye may hold a divine power o'er the heart ye have most given up the hope of ever winning at. Ye have heard the convict brought to sorrow by seeing a bit of the same matin he had been used to see in the isle of the kirk his mother took him till. That was a stroke of God's magic. There's no kenning what God can do, nor yet what best of reasons he has for no doing it sooner. When we think he's letting the time gang and doing nothing, he may be just doing all thing. Not that I ever think like that, no. Let him do as he likes. What he does, I'm sure of. I'm a his mine, whether I can his mine or no. Eh, hey, my lassie, my lassie. I could better win o'er a hantle, nor her gin you the slip that gate, sir. It was so double o' her. It's nothing wrong in itself that a young lass should be taken with the attentions of a bonny lad like Lord Forgu. That's not again the nature it God made. But to pretend and take in, to be cunning and sly, that's evil. And sign for the other lad. Eh, hey, I doubt that's the worst at all. Only I cannot how far she had committed herself with him, for she was never open-hearted. Eh, hey, sir, it's a fine thing to have no secrets but such as lie between yourself and your maker. I can but pray the father at all to hold his eye upon her, and his arms about her, and keep off the hardening of the heart at despises counsel. I'm sair doubting we cannot do muckle mare for her. She maun take her ain gate, for we cannot put a collar round her neck, and lead her about wherever we gang. She maun win her own braid, and gin she did na that, she would be but the mare tain up with such nonsense as the likes of Lord Forgoo's I ready to say till any bonny lass. And I verily believe she's safer there with you and the housekeeper, nor whar he could win at her easier, and whar they would be readier to take her character fay her upon less offence, and send her about her business. Folks uncle jealous about their house that would trouble themselves little about a lass. So long as it's not upon their premises, she may do as she likes for them. Dory and me, we'll just lay our cares in the fine sight and afford the compassionate heart of the maister, and see what he can do for us. Sick things even we can leave to him. I hope there'll be no more bloodshed. He's a fine lad, Steenie Kennedy. Come of a fine stock. His father was a God-fearing man, some dour by nature, but with an uncle clearing up through grace. I would willingly have seen our Eppie his wife. He's an honest lad. I'm sorry he gave place to wrath, but he may repent it by the no, and truth I cannot blame him muckle at his time of life. It's not as gin you or me did it, ye can, sir. The chosen agonize after the light, stretch out their hands to God, stir up themselves to lay hold upon God. These are they who gather grace, as the mountain tops the snow, to send down rivers of water to their fellows. The rest are the many called, of whom not a few have to be compelled. Alas, for the one cast out. As he was going home in the dark of a clouded moonlight, just as he reached the place where he found Lord Forgu, Donal caught sight of the vague figure of a man apparently on the watch, and put himself a little on his guard as he went on. It was Kennedy. He came up to him in a hesitating way. Stephen, said Donal, for he seemed to wait for him to speak first. You may thank God you are not now in hiding. I would never hide, sir. Can I had killed the man, I would have holden my face till it. But it was a foolish thing to do, for it'll only guard the last think the mare of him. The eyes side with the one they take to be ill-used. I thought you said you would in any case have no more to do with her, said Donal. Kennedy was silent for a moment. A body may tear at their heart, he muttered. But gin it winna come, what's the good of swearing out it mon? Well, returned Donal, it may be some comfort to you to know that, for the present at least, and I hope for altogether, the thing is put a stop to. The housekeeper at the castle knows all about it, and she and I will do our best. Her grandparents know too. Eppy herself and Lord Forgue have both of them promised there shall be no more of it. And I do believe, Kennedy, there has been nothing more than great silliness on either side. I hope you will not forget yourself again. You gave me a promise and broke it. Not in the letter, sir. Only in the spirit, rejoined Kennedy. I go not near the castle. Only in the spirit, did you say, Stephen? What matters the word but for the spirit? The Bible itself lets the word go any time for the spirit. Would it have been a breach of your promise if you had gone to the castle on some service to the man you almost murdered? If ever you lay your hand on the lad again, I'll do my best to give you over to justice. But keep quiet and I'll do all I can for you. Kennedy promised to govern himself, 
and they parted friends. End of chapter 26「Chapter Twenty Seven of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Seven The Soul of the Old Garden. The days went on and on and still Donal saw nothing, or next to nothing, of the earl. Thrice he met him on the way to the walled garden, in which he was wont to take his unfrequent exercise. On one of these occasions his lordship spoke to him courteously. The next scarcely noticed him. The third passed him without recognition. Donal, who with equal mind took everything as it came, troubled himself not at all about the matter. He was doing his work as well as he knew how, and that was enough. Now also he saw scarcely anything of Lord Forgue either. He no longer sought his superior scholarship. Lady Arctura he saw generally once a week at the religion lesson. Of Miss Carmichael, happily nothing at all. But as he grew more familiar with the countenance of Lady Arctura, it pained him more and more to see it so sad, so far from peaceful. What might be the cause of it? Most well-meaning young women are in general tolerably happy, partly, perhaps, because they have few or no aspirations, not troubling themselves about what alone is the end of thought, and partly, perhaps, because they despise the sadness ever ready to assail them as something unworthy. But if condemned to the round of a tormenting theological mill, and at the same time consumed with strenuous endeavor to order thoughts and feelings according to supposed requirements of the gospel, with little to employ them, and no companions to make them forget themselves, such would be at once more sad and more worthy. The narrow ways trodden of men are miserable. They have high walls on each side, and but an occasional glimpse of the sky above, and in such paths Lady Arctura was trying to walk. The true way, though narrow, is not unlovely. Most footpaths are lovelier than high roads. It may be full of toil, but it cannot be miserable. It has not walls, but fields and forests and gardens around it, and limitless sky overhead. It has its sorrows, but many of them lie only on its borders, and they that leave the path gather them. Lady Arctura was devouring her soul in silence, with such effectual help thereto as the self-sufficient friend, who had never encountered a real difficulty in her life, plenteously gave her. Miss Carmichael dealt with her honestly, according to her wisdom, but that wisdom was foolishness, she said what she thought right, but was wrong in what she counted right. Nay, she did what she thought right, but no amount of doing wrong right can set the soul on the high tableland of freedom, or endow it with liberating help. The autumn passed, and the winter was at hand, a terrible time to the old and ailing, even in tracts nearer the sun, to the young and healthy, a merry time, even in the snows and bitter frosts of eastern Scotland. Davy looked chiefly to the skating, and in particular to the pleasure he was going to have in teaching Mr. Grant, who had never done any sliding, except on the soles of his nailed shoes. When the time came, he acquired the art the more rapidly that he never minded what blunders he made in learning a thing. The dread of blundering is a great bar to success. He visited the Comans often, and found continual comfort and help in their friendship. The letters he received from home, especially those of his friend Sir Gibby, who not unfrequently wrote also for Donal's father and mother, were a great nourishment to him. As the cold and the nights grew, the water level rose in Donal's well, and the poetry began to flow. When we have no summer without, we must supply it from within. Those must have comfort in themselves who are sent to help others. Up in his airy, like an eagle above the low affairs of the earth, he led a keener life, breathed the breath of a more genuine existence than the rest of the house. No doubt the old cobbler, seated at his last over a moldy shoe, breathed a yet higher air than Donal weaving his verse, or reading grand old Greek in his tower. But Donal was on the same path, the only path with an infinite end, the divine destiny. He had often thought of trying the old man with some of the best poetry he knew, 
desirous of knowing what receptivity he might have for it, but always when with him had hitherto forgot his proposed inquiry, and thought of it again only after he had left him. The original flow of the cobbler's life put the thought of testing it out of his mind. One afternoon, when the last of the leaves had fallen, and the country was bare as the heart of an old man who has lived to himself, Donal, seated before a great fire of coal and boat logs, fell a-thinking of the old garden, vanished with the summer, but living in the memory of its delight. All that was left of it at the foot of the hill was its corpse, but its soul was in the heaven of Donal's spirit, and there this night gathered to itself a new form. It grew and grew in him, till it filled with its thoughts the mind of the poet. He turned to his table and began to write. With many emendations afterwards, the result was this. THE OLD GARDEN 1. I stood in an ancient garden, with high red walls around. Over them grey and green lichens, in shadowy arabesque wound. The topmost climbing blossoms, on fields kind haunted, looked out. But within were shelter and shadow, and daintiest odours about. There were alleys and lurking arbours, deep glooms into which to dive. The lawns were as soft as fleeces. Of daisies I counted but five. The sundial was so aged, it had gathered a thoughtful grace, and the roundabout of the shadow seemed to have furrowed its face. The flowers were all of the oldest that ever in garden sprung, red and blood-red and dark purple, the rose lamps flaming hung. Along the borders fringed, with broad thick edges of box, stood foxgloves and gorgeous poppies, and great-eyed hollyhocks. There were junipers trimmed into castles, and ash-trees bowed into tents, for the garden, though ancient and pensive, still wore quaint ornaments. It was all so stately fantastic, its old wind hardly would stir. Young spring, when she merrily entered, must feel it no place for her. 2. I stood in the summer morning, under a cavernous yew, the sun was gently climbing, and the scents rose after the dew. I saw the wise old mansion, like a cow in the noonday heat, stand in a pool of shadows that rippled about its feet. Its windows were oriel and latticed, lowly and wide and fair, and its chimneys like clustered pillars stood up in the thin blue air. White doves, like the thoughts of a lady, haunted it in and out. With a train of green and blue comets, the peacock went marching about. The birds in the trees were singing, a song as old as the world, of love and green leaves and sunshine, and winter folded and furled. They sang that never was sadness, but it melted and passed away. They sang that never was darkness, but in came the conquering day. And I knew that a maiden somewhere, in a sober sunlit gloom, in a nimbus of shining garments, an aureole of white-browed bloom, looked out on the garden dreamy and knew not that it was old, looked past the grey and the sombre, and saw but the green and the gold. 3. I stood in the gathering twilight, in a gently blowing wind, and the house looked half uneasy, like one that was left behind. The roses had lost their redness, and cold the grass had grown. At roost were the pigeons and peacock, and the dial was dead grey stone. The world by the gathering twilight in a gauzy dusk was clad. It went in through my eyes to my spirit, and made me a little sad. Grew and gathered the twilight, and filled my heart and brain. The sadness grew more than sadness, and turned to a gentle pain. Browned and brooded the twilight, and sank down through the calm, till it seemed for some human sorrows there could not be any balm. 4. Then I knew that up a staircase, which untrod will yet creak and shake, deep in a distant chamber, a ghost was coming awake. In the growing darkness growing, growing till her eyes appear, like spots of a deeper twilight, but more transparent clear. Thin as hot air up trembling, thin as a sun-molten crepe, the deepening shadow of something taketh a certain shape. A shape whose hands are uplifted, to throw back her blinding hair, a shape whose bosom is heaving, but draws not in the air. And I know by what time the moonlight on her nest of shadows will sit, 
out on the dim lawn gliding, that shadow of shadows will flit. 5. The moon is dreaming upward, from a sea of cloud and gleam. She looks as if she had seen us, never but in a dream. Down that stair I know she is coming, barefooted, lifting her train. It creaks not, she hears it creaking, for the sound is in her brain. Out at the side door she's coming, with a timid glance right and left. Her look is hopeless yet eager, the look of a heart bereft. Across the lawn she is flitting, her eddying robe in the wind. Are her fair feet bending the grasses? Her hair is half lifted behind. 6. Shall I stay to look on her nearer? Would she start and vanish away? No, no, she will never see me, if I stand as near as I may. It is not this wind she is feeling, not this cool grass below. Tis the wind and the grass of an evening a hundred years ago. She sees no roses darkling, no stately hollyhocks dim. She is only thinking and dreaming of the garden, the night, and him. Of the unlit windows behind her, of the timeless dial stone, of the trees and the moon and the shadows, a hundred years agone. Tis a night for all ghostly lovers, to haunt the best-loved spot. Is he come in his dreams to this garden? I gaze, but I see him not. 7. I will not look on her nearer. My heart would be torn in twain. From mine eyes the garden would vanish in the falling of their rain. I will not look on a sorrow that darkens into despair, on the surge of a heart that cannot, yet cannot cease to bear. My soul to hers would be calling, she would hear no word it said. If I cried aloud in the stillness, she would never turn her head. She is dreaming the sky above her, she is dreaming the earth below. This night she lost her lover, a hundred years ago. End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Eight A Presence Yet Not a Presence. The twilight had fallen while he wrote, and the wind had risen. It was now blowing a gale. When he could no longer see, he rose to light his lamp and looked out of the window. All was dusk around him. Above and below was nothing to be distinguished from the mass. Nothing and something seemed in it to share an equal uncertainty. He heard the wind, but could not see the clouds that swept before it, for all was cloud overhead, and no change of light or feature showed the shifting of the measureless bulk. Gray stormy space was the whole idea of the creation. He was gazing into a void. Was it not rather a condition of things inappreciable by his senses? A strange feeling came over him, as of looking from a window in the wall of the visible, into the region unknown, to man shapeless quite, therefore terrible, wherein wonder the things all that have not yet found or form or sensible embodiment, so as to manifest themselves to eyes or ears or hands of mortals. As he gazed, the huge, shapeless hulks of the ships of chaos, dimly awful suggestions of animals uncreate, yet vaguer motions of what was not, came heaving up to vanish, even from the fancy, as they approached his window. Earth lay far below, invisible. Only through the night came the moaning of the sea as the wind drove it, in still enlarging waves upon the flat shore, a level of doubtful grass and sand, three miles away. It seemed to his heart as if the moaning were the voice of the darkness, lamenting, like a repentant Satan or Judas, that it was not the light, could not hold the light, might not become as the light, but must that moment cease when the light began to enter it. Darkness and moaning was all that the earth contained. Would the souls of the mariner shipwrecked this night go forth into the ceaseless turmoil? Or would they, leaving behind them the sense for storms, as for all things soft and sweet as well, enter only a vast silence, where was nothing to be aware of but each solitary self? Thoughts and theories many passed through Donal's mind, 
as he sought to land the conceivable from the wandering bosom of the limitless. And he was just arriving at the conclusion that, as all things seen must be after the fashion of the unseen whence they come, as the very genius of embodiment is likeness, therefore the soul of man must of course have natural relations with matter. But on the other hand, as the spirit must be the home and origin of all this moulding, assimilating, modelling energy, and the spirit only that is in harmonious oneness with its origin can fully exercise the deputed creative power, it can be only in proportion to the eternal life in them that spirits are able to draw to themselves matter and clothe themselves in it, so entering into full relation with the world of storms and sunsets. He was, I say, just arriving at this hazarded conclusion, when he started out of his reverie and was suddenly all ear to listen. Again, yes, it was the same sound that had sent him that first night wandering through the house in fruitless quest. It came in two or three fitful chords that melted into each other, like the colors in the lining of a shell, then ceased. He went to the door, opened it, and listened. A cold wind came rushing up the stair. He heard nothing. He stepped out on the stair, shut his door, and listened. It came again. A strange, unearthly musical cry. If ever disembodied sound went wandering in the wind, just such a sound must it be. Knowing little of music, save in the forms of tone and vowel change and rhythm and rhyme, he felt as if he could have listened forever to the wild, wandering sweetness of its lamentation. Almost immediately it ceased. Then once more came again, apparently from far off, dying away on the distant tops of the billowy air, out of whose wandering bosom it had first issued. It was as the wailing of a summer wind caught and swept along in a tempest from the frozen north. The moment he ceased to expect it any more, he began to think whether it must not have come from the house. He stole down the stair. To do what, he did not know. He could not go following an airy nothing all over the castle. Of a great part of it, he as yet knew nothing. His constructive mind had yearned after a complete idea of the building, for it was almost a passion with him to fit the outsides and insides of things together. But there were suites of rooms into which, except the Earl and Lady Arctura were to leave home, he could not hope to enter. It was little more than mechanically, therefore, that he went vaguely after the sound, and ere he was halfway down the stair, he recognized the hopelessness of the pursuit. He went on, however, to the schoolroom, where tea was waiting him. He had returned to his room, and was sitting again at work, now reading and meditating, when in one of the lulls of the storm he became aware of another sound, one most unusual to his ears, for he never required any attendance in his room, that of steps coming up the stair, heavy steps, not as of one on some ordinary errand. He waited listening. The steps came nearer and nearer, and stopped at his door. A hand fumbled about upon it, found the latch, lifted it, and entered. To Donal's wonder, and dismay as well, it was the Earl. His dismay arose from his appearance. He was deadly pale, and his eyes more like those of a corpse than a man among his living fellows. Donal started to his feet. The apparition turned its head towards him, but in its look was no atom of recognition, no acknowledgment or even perception of his presence. The sound of his rising had had merely a half-mechanical influence upon its brain. It turned away immediately and went on to the window. There it stood, much as Donal had stood a little while before, looking out, but with the attitude of one listening rather than one trying to see. There was indeed nothing but the blackness to be seen, and nothing to be heard but the roaring of the wind, with the roaring of the great billows rolled along in it. As it stood, the time to Donal seemed long. It was but about five minutes. Was the man out of his mind? or only a sleepwalker. How could he be asleep so early in the night? As Donal stood doubting and wondering, once more came the musical cry out of the darkness, and immediately from the earl a response, a soft, low murmur, by degrees becoming audible, in the tone of one meditating aloud, but in a restrained ecstasy. From his words he seemed still to be hearkening the sounds aerial, though to Donal at least, they came no more. Yet once again, he murmured, 
Once again, ere I forsake the flesh, are my ears blessed with that voice. It is the song of the eternal woman. For me she sings. Sing on, siren. My soul is a listening universe, and therein naught but thy voice. He paused and began afresh. It is the wind in the tree of life. Its leaves rustle in words of love. Under its shadow I shall lie, with her I loved and killed. Ere that day come, she will have forgiven and forgotten, and all will be well. Hark the notes, clear as a flute, full and stringent as a violin. They are colors, they are flowers, they are alive. I can see them as they grow, as they blow. Those are primroses, those are pimpernels. Those high, intense, burning tones, so soft yet so certain. What are they, jasmine? No, that flower is not a note. It is a chord. And what a chord. I mean, what a flower. I never saw that flower before. Never on this earth. It must be a flower of the paradise whence comes the music. It is. It is. Do I not remember the night when I sailed in the great ship over the ocean of the stars and scented the airs of heaven and saw the pearly gates gleaming across myriads of wavering miles? Saw, plain as I see them now, the flowers on the fields within. Ah, me, the dragon that guards the golden apples. See his crest, his crest and his emerald eyes. He comes floating up through the murky lake. It is Gerion, come to bear me to the gyre below. He turned, and with a somewhat quickened step, left the room, hastily shutting the door behind him, as if to keep back the creature of his vision. Strong-hearted and strong-brained, Donal had yet stood absorbed as if he too were out of the body and knew nothing more of this earth. There is something more terrible in a presence that is not a presence than in a vision of the bodiless. That is, a present ghost is not so terrible as an absent one, a present but deserted body. He stood a moment helpless, then pulled himself together and tried to think. What should he do? What could he do? What was required of him? Was anything required of him? Had he any right to do anything? Could anything be done that would not both be and cause a wrong? His first impulse was to follow. A man in such a condition was surely not to be left to go whither he would among the heights and depths of the castle, where he might break his neck any moment. Interference, no doubt, was dangerous, but he would follow him at least a little way. He heard the steps going down the stair and made haste after them. But ere they could have reached the bottom, the sound of them ceased, and Donal knew the Earl must have left the stair, at a point from which he could not follow him. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Devorah Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 29 Epi Again He would gladly have told his friend the cobbler all about the strange occurrence, but he did not feel sure it would be right to carry a report of the house where he held a position of trust. And what made him doubtful was that first he doubted whether the cobbler would consider it right. But he went to see him the next day, in the desire to be near the only man to whom it was possible he might tell what he had seen. The moment he entered the room, where the cobbler, as usual, sat at work by his wife, he saw that something was the matter. But they welcomed him with their usual cordiality, nor was it many minutes before Mistress Coleman made him acquainted with the cause of their anxiety. "'They're just a wee tribbled, sir,' she said. "'About Eppie.' "'I am very sorry,' said Donal, with a pang. He had thought things were going right with her. "'What is the matter?' "'It's not so easy to say,' returned the grandmother. "'It may well be only a fancy of the old folk, "'but it seems to both of us she has a way with her "'that does not come of the right. "'She'll be that meek as gin she thought nothing at all herself, "'and the next moment be angered at a word. "'She can abide a syllable said if not correct to the very hair. "'It's as gin she dreaded word ahind it, "'and would march straight to the defence. "'I'm not making my meaning that clear, I doubt, "'but you'll ken it for all that.' I think I do, said Donal. 
I see nothing of her. I wouldna make a wonder o' that, sir. She may weel hold out o' your gate, feeling rebuke it for one that kens all about her goings on with my lord. I don't know how I should see her, though, returned Donal. Didna she sweep out the schoolroom first when ye gaed, sir? When I think of it, yes. Does she still that same? I do not know. Understanding at what hour in the morning the room will be ready for me, I do not go to it sooner. It's but the look, in the general carriage of the lassie, said the old woman. Can we had anything to take a hold of, we would maybe think the less. True, she was aye some, what you might call a bit changeable in her ways, but she was aye, when she had the chance, uncle willing to give her father there or myself a spark of gladness like. It pleased her to be pleasing in the eyes of the old folk, though they were but her in. But no, we mun not say a word till her. We had no business to look till her for nothing. No, she's aye like that. But it comes so oft, and at last we dar hardly open our mouths for the fear of how she'll take it. Only all the time it's mere as gin she was flinging something frae her, something she didn't like and would fain be rid of, than that she cared so very muckle about anything we said not till her mind. She takes a hold of the words, no doubt. But I canna help thinking at most whatever we said it would be the same. Something to complain o's never wantin' when you're ill pleased already. It's not the doing of the right, you see, said the cobbler. I mean that's not itself the end, but the right humour of the soul towards all things thought or felt or done. That's righteousness. And out of that comes, of the very necessity of nature, a right deeds of whatever kind. Where they come not forth, it's where the soul, the thought of the man's no right. Or a poor lassie shows all manner of small infirmities, just cause the humour of her soul's not harmonious with the truth. Not harmonious in itself. Not at one with the true thing. With the true man. With the true God. It may even be said it's a small thing and a man should do wrong, so long as he's capable of doing wrong, and loves not the right with heart and soul. But eh, it's not a small thing that he should be capable. Surely, Anru, interposed his wife, holding up her hands in mild deprecation. You would not let the lassie do wrong, can you could hold her right? No, I would not, replied her husband. Supposing the holding of her right to fall in with any degree of perception of the right on her part. But supposing it was only the holding of her frae ill by outward constraint, leaving her ready upon the first opportunity to turn aside, whereas gin she had done wrong, she would repent of it and see what a foul thing it was to gang again the holy will of him that made and died for her. I leave you to judge for yourself what any man that loved God and loved the lass and loved the right would choose. We mun hold both ain open upon the truth, and not blink sideways upon the world and its righteousness with one of them. Who wouldn't be Zacky with the Lord in his house, and the righteousness of God himself growing in his heart, rather nor the proud Pharisee, who can't know ill he was doing, and thought it a shame to speak to such a man as Zacky. The grandmother held her peace, thinking probably that so long as one kept respectable, there remained the more likelihood of a spiritual change. "'Is there anything you think I could do?' asked Donal. "'I confess I'm afraid of meddling.' "'I wouldna how you appear, sir,' said Andrew, "'and anything concerning her. "'You're a young man yourself, "'and folks' hearts as well as folks' tongues "'are not to be lippin' till. "'I has seen folk, "'cause they couldn't believe a body doing a thing "'for a small modicum of good will, "'set themselves to invent what they called a motive "'till account for it. Something, that is, that would have prevailed with themselves to guard them do it. Sick folk cannot understand a body doing anything just because it was worth doing it in itself. But maybe, said the old woman, returning to the practical, as ye have been pleased to say ye're on friendly terms with Mistress Brooks, ye might just see gin she's observed any tendency to resumption of the old affair. Donal promised, and as soon as he reached the castle sought an interview with the housekeeper. She told him she had been particularly pleased of late with Eppie's attention to her work, and readiness to make herself useful. If she did look sometimes a little out of heart, they must remember, she said, that they had been young themselves once, and that it was not so easy to forget as to give up. But she would keep her eyes open. End of chapter 29「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 30. Lord Morven. The winter came at last in good earnest. First black frost, then white snow, then sleet and wind and rain. Then snow again, which fell steady and calm, 
and lay thick. After that came hard frost, and brought plenty of skating, and to Davy the delight of teaching his master. Donal had many falls, but was soon, partly in virtue of those same falls, a very decent skater. Davy claimed all the merit of his successful training, and when his master did anything particularly well, would remark with pride that he had taught him. But the good thing in it for Davy was that he noted the immediate faith with which Donal did or tried to do what he told him. This reacted in opening his mind to the beauty and dignity of obedience, and went a long way towards revealing the low moral condition of the man who seeks freedom through refusal to act at the will of another. He who does so will come by degrees to have no will of his own, and act only from impulse, which may be the will of a devil. So Donal and Davy grew together into one heart of friendship. Donal never longed for his hours with Davy to pass, and Davy was never so happy as when with Donal. The one was gently leading the other into the paths of liberty. Nothing but the teaching of him who made the human soul can make that soul free, but it is in great measure through those who have already learned that he teaches. And Davy was an apt pupil, promising to need less of the discipline of failure and pain that he was strong to believe and ready to obey. But Donal was not all the day with Davy, and latterly had begun to feel a little anxious about the time the boy spent away from him, partly with his brother, partly with the people about the stable, and partly with his father, who evidently found the presence of his younger son less irksome to him than that of any other person, and saw more of him than of Forgu. The amount of loneliness the Earl could endure was amazing. But after what he had seen and heard, Donal was most anxious concerning his time with his father, only he felt it a delicate thing to ask him about it. At length, however, Davy himself opened up the matter. "'Mr. Grant,' he said one day, "'I wish you could hear the grand fairy stories my papa tells.' "'I wish I might,' answered Donal. "'I will ask him to let you come in here. "'I have told him you can make fairy tales, too, "'only he has quite another way of doing it. "'And I must confess,' added Davy, a little pompously, "'I do not follow him so easily as you. "'Besides,' he added, "'I never can find anything in what you call the cupboard behind the curtain of the story. "'I wonder sometimes if his stories have any cupboard. "'I will ask him today to let you come.' "'I think that would hardly do,' said Donal. "'Your father likes to tell his boy fairy tales, "'but he might not care to tell them to a man. "'You must remember, too, "'that though I have been in the house what you think a long time, "'your father has seen very little of me "'and might feel me in the way. "'Invalids do not generally enjoy the company of strangers. "'You had better not ask him. "'But I have often told him how good you are, Mr. Grant, "'and how you can't bear anything that is not right, "'and I am sure he must like you. "'I don't mean so well as I do,' "'because you haven't to teach him anything, "'and nobody can love anybody so well "'as the one he teaches to be good. "'Still, I think you had better leave it alone, "'lest he should not like your asking him. "'I should be sorry to have you disappointed. "'I do not mind that so much as I used. "'If you do not tell me I am not to do it, "'I think I will venture.' "'Donal said no more. "'He did not feel at liberty, "'from his own feeling merely, to check the boy. "'The thing was not wrong, "'and something might be intended to come out of it.' He shrank from the least ruling of events, believing man's only call to action is duty. So he left Davy to do as he pleased. "'Does your father often tell you a fairy tale?' he asked. "'Not every day, sir. What time does he tell them?' "'Generally when I go to him after tea.' "'Do you go any time you like?' "'Yes, but he does not always let me stay. Sometimes he talks about Mama, I think, but only coming into the fairy tale. He has told me one in the middle of the day.' I think he would if I woke him up in the night, but that would not do, for he has terrible headaches. Perhaps that is what sometimes makes his stories so terrible I have to beg him to stop. And does he stop? Well, no, I don't think he ever does. When a story is once begun, I suppose it ought to be finished. So the matter rested for the time. But about a week after, Donal received one morning through the butler an invitation to dine with the Earl, and concluded it was due to Davy whom he therefore expected to find with his father. He put on his best clothes, and followed Simmons up the grand staircase. The great rooms of the castle were on the first floor, but he passed the entrance to them, following his guide up and up to the second floor, where the earl had his own apartment. Here he was shown into a small room, richly furnished after a somberly ornate fashion, the drapery and coverings much faded, worn even to shabbiness. 
It had been, for a century or so, the private sitting-room of the lady of the castle, but was now used by the earl, perhaps in memory of his wife. Here he received his sons, and now Donal, but never any whom business or politeness compelled him to see. There was no one in the room when Donal entered, but after about ten minutes a door opened at the further end, and Lord Morven, appearing from his bedroom, shook hands with him with some faint show of kindness. Almost the same moment the butler entered from a third door, and said dinner waited. The earl walked on, and Donal followed. This room also was a small one. The meal was laid on a little round table. There were but two covers, and Simmons alone was in waiting. While they ate and drank, which his lordship did sparingly, not a word was spoken. Donal would have found it embarrassing had he not been prepared for the peculiar. His lordship took no notice of his guest, leaving him to the care of the butler. He looked very white and worn. Donal thought a good deal worse than when he saw him first. His cheeks were more sunken, his hair more grey, and his eyes more weary, with a consuming fire in them that had no longer much fuel and was burning remnants. He stooped over his plate as if to hide the operation of eating, and drank his wine with a trembling hand. Every movement indicated indifference to both his food and his drink. At length the more solid part of the meal was removed, and they were left alone, fruit upon the table, and two wine decanters. From one of them the earl helped himself, then passed it to Donal, saying, "'You are very good to my little Davy, Mr. Grant. He is full of your kindness to him. There is nobody like you.' "'A little goes a long way with Davy, my lord,' answered Donal. "'Then much must go a longer way,' said the earl. There was nothing remarkable in the words, yet he spoke them with the difficulty a man accustomed to speak and to weigh his words might find in clothing a new thought to his satisfaction. The effort seemed to have tried him, and he took a sip of wine. This, however, he did after every briefest sentence he uttered. A sip only he took, nothing like a mouthful. Donal told him that Davy, of all the boys he had known, was far the quickest, and that just because he was morally the most teachable. "'You greatly gratify me, Mr. Grant,' said the Earl. "'I have long wished just such a man as you for Davy. If only I had known you when Forgue was preparing for college.' I must have been at that time only at college myself, my lord. True, true. But for Davy, it is a privilege to teach him. If only it might last a while, returned the earl. But of course you have the church in your eye. My lord, I have not. What? cried his lordship, almost eagerly. You intend giving your life to teaching? My lord, returned Donal, I never trouble myself about my life. Why should we burden the mule of the present with the camel load of the future? I take what comes, what has sent me, that is. You are right, Mr. Grant. If I were in your position, I should think just as you do. But, alas, I have never had any choice. Perhaps your lordship has not chosen to choose, Donal was on the point of saying, but bethought himself in time not to hazard the remark. If I were a rich man, Mr. Grant, the earl continued, I would secure your services for a time indefinite. But, as everyone knows, not an acre of the property belongs to me, or goes with the title. Davy, dear boy, will have nothing but a thousand or two. The marriage I have in view for Lord Forgue will arrange a future for him. I hope there will be some love in the marriage, said Donal uneasily, with a vague thought of Eppie. I had no intention, returned his lordship with cold politeness, of troubling you concerning Lord Forgue. I beg your pardon, my lord, said Donal. Davy, poor boy, he is my anxiety, resumed the earl, in his former condescendingly friendly, half-sleepy tone. What to do with him I have not yet succeeded in determining. If the Church of Scotland were Episcopal now, we might put him into that. He would be an honour to it. But as it has no dignities to confer, it is not the place for one of his birth and social position. A few shabby hundreds a year, and the associations he would necessarily be thrown into. However honourable the profession in itself, he added, with a bow to Donal, apparently unable to get it out of his head that he had an embryo clergyman before him. "'Davy is not quite a man yet,' said Donal, "'and by the time he begins to think of a profession he will, I trust, be fit to make a choice. The boy has a great deal of common sense. If your lordship will pardon me, I cannot help thinking there is no need to trouble about him. It is very well for one in your position to think in that way, Mr. Grant. Men like you are free to choose. 
you may make your bread as you please. But men in our position are greatly limited in their choice. The paths open to them are few. Tradition oppresses us. We are slaves to the dead and buried. I could well wish I had been born in your humbler, but in truth less contracted sphere. Certain roles are not open to you, to be sure, but your life in the open air, following your sheep, and dreaming all things beautiful and grand in the world beyond you is entrancing. It is the life to make a poet. Or a king, thought Donal. But the earl would have made a discontented shepherd. The man who is not content where he is would never have been content somewhere else, though he might have complained less. Take another glass of wine, Mr. Grant, said his lordship, filling his own from the other decanter. Try this. I believe you will like it better. "'In truth, my lord,' answered Donal, "'I have drunk so little wine that I do not know one sort from another. "'You know whiskey better, I dare say. "'Would you like some now? "'Touch the bell behind you.' "'No, thank you, my lord. "'I know as little about whiskey. "'My mother would never let us even taste it, "'and I have never tasted it. "'A new taste is a gain to the being. "'I suspect, however, a new appetite can only be a loss.' "'As he said this, Donal half-mechanically, "'filled a glass from the decanter his host had pushed towards him. "'I should like you, though,' resumed his lordship, after a short pause, "'to keep your eyes open to the fact that Davy must do something for himself. "'You would then be able to let me know by and by what you think him fit for. "'I will with pleasure, my lord. "'Tastes may not be infallible guides to what is fit for us, "'but they may lead us to the knowledge of what we are fit for.' "'Extremely well said,' returned the earl. I do not think he understood in the least what Donal meant. "'Shall I try how he takes to trigonometry? He might care to learn land surveying. Gentlemen now, not unfrequently, take charge of the properties of their more favoured relatives. There is Mr. Graham, your own factor, my lord. A relative, I understand.' "'A distant one,' answered his lordship with marked coldness. "'The degree of relationship hardly to be counted.' "'In the lowlands, my lord, you do not care to count kin as we do in the highlands.' My heart warms to the word kinsman. You have not found kinship so awkward as I, possibly, said his lordship with a watery smile. The man in humble position may allow the claim of kin to any extent. He has nothing, therefore nothing can be taken from him. But the man who has would be the poorest of the clan if he gave to every needy relation. I never knew the man so poor, answered Donal, that he had nothing to give. But the things of the poor are hardly to the purpose of the predatory relative. "'Predatory relative, a good phrase,' said his lordship with a sleepy laugh, though his eyes were wide open. His lips did not seem to care to move, yet he looked pleased. "'To tell you the truth,' he began again, "'at one period of my history I gave and gave till I was tired of giving. Ingratitude was the sole return. At one period I had large possessions, larger than I like to think of now. If I had the tenth part of what I have given away— I should not be uneasy concerning Davy. There is no fear of Davy, my lord, so long as he is brought up with the idea that he must work for his bread. His lordship made no answer, and his look reminded Donal of that he wore when he came to his chamber. A moment, and he rose and began to pace the room. An indescribable suggestion of an invisible yet luminous cloud hovered about his forehead and eyes, which latter, if not fixed on very vacancy, seemed to have got somewhere near it. At the fourth or fifth turn he opened the door by which he had entered, continuing a remark he had begun to Donal, of which, although he heard every word, and seemed on the point of understanding something, he had not caught the sense when his lordship disappeared, still talking. Donal thought it therefore his part to follow him, and found himself in his lordship's bedroom. But out of this his lordship had already gone, through an opposite door, and Donal, still following, entered an old picture gallery, of which he had heard Davy speak, but which the Earl kept private for his exercise indoors. It was a long, narrow place, hardly more than a wide corridor, and appeared nowhere to afford distance enough for seeing a picture. But Donal could ill judge, for the sole light in the place came from the fires and candles in the rooms whose doors they had left open behind them, with just a faint glimmer from the vapor-buried moon, sufficing to show the outline of window after window, and revealing something of the great length of the gallery. By the time Donal overtook the earl, he was some distance down, holding straight on into the long dusk, and still talking. "'This is my favourite promenade,' 
he said, as if brought to himself by the sound of Donal's overtaking steps. After dinner always, Mr. Grant, wet weather or dry, still or stormy, I walk here. What do I care for the weather? It will be time when I am old to consult the barometer. Donal wondered a little. There seemed no great hardihood in the worst of weather to go pacing a picture gallery, where the fiercest storm that ever blew could send in only little threads of air through the chinks of windows and doors. Yes, his lordship went on, I taught myself hardship in my boyhood, and I reap the fruits of it in my prime. Come up here. I will show you a prospect unequaled. He stopped in front of a large picture, and began to talk as if expatiating on the points of a landscape outspread before him. His remarks belonged to something magnificent, but whether they were applicable to the picture, Donal could not tell. There was light enough only to give a faint gleam to its gilded frame. "'Reach beyond reach,' said his lordship. "'Endless. Infinite. How would not poor Maldon, with his ever-fresh ambition after the unattainable, have gloated on such a scene? In nature alone you front success. She does what she means. She alone does what she means.' "'If,' said Donal, more for the sake of confirming the Earl's impression that he had a listener, than from any idea that he would listen— if you mean the object of nature is to present us with perfection, I cannot allow she does what she intends. You rarely see her produce anything she would herself call perfect. But if her object be to make us behold perfection with the inner eye, this object she certainly does gain, and that just by stopping short of... He did not finish the sentence. A sudden change was upon him, absorbing him so that he did not even try to account for it. Something seemed to give way in his head as if a bubble burst in his brain. And from that moment, whatever the Earl said, and whatever arose in his own mind, seemed to have outward existence as well. He heard and knew the voice of his host, but seemed also in some inexplicable way, which at the time occasioned him no surprise, to see the things which had their origin in the brain of the Earl. Whether he went in very deed out with him into the night, he did not know. He felt as if he had gone, and thought he had not. But when he woke the next morning in his bed at the top of the tower, which he had no recollection of climbing, he was as weary as if he had been walking the night through. End of chapter 30、Chapter、31 of Donal Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 31 Bewilderment. His first thought was of a long and delightful journey he had made on horseback with the Earl, through scenes of entrancing interest and variety, with the present result of a strange weariness, almost misery. What had befallen him? Was the thing a fact? or a fancy. If a fancy, how was he so weary? If a fact, how could it have been? Had he in any way been the Earl's companion through such a long night as it seemed? Could they have visited all the places whose remembrance lingered in his brain? He was so confused, so bewildered, so haunted with a shadowy uneasiness, almost like remorse, that he even dreaded the discovery of the cause of it all. Might a man so lose hold of himself as to be no more certain he had ever possessed or could ever possess himself again? He bethought himself at last that he might perhaps have taken more wine than his head could stand. Yet he remembered leaving his glass unemptied to follow the earl, and it was some time after that before the change came. Could it have been drunkenness? Had it been slowly coming without his knowing it? He could hardly believe it. But whatever it was, it had left him unhappy, almost ashamed. What would the Earl think of him? He must have concluded him unfit any longer to keep charge of his son. For his own part, he did not feel he was to blame, but rather that an accident had befallen him. Whence then this sense of something akin to shame? Why should he be ashamed of anything coming upon him from without? Of that shame he had to be ashamed, as of a lack of faith in God. Would God leave his creature who trusted in him at the mercy of a chance, 
of a glass of wine taken in ignorance? There was a thing to be ashamed of, and with good cause. He got up, found to his dismay that it was almost ten o'clock, his hour for rising in winter being six, dressed in haste, and went down, wondering that Davy had not come to see after him. In the schoolroom, he found him waiting for him. The boy sprang up and darted to meet him. "'I hope you are better, Mr. Grant,' he said. "'I am so glad you were able to be down.' "'I am quite well,' answered Donal. "'I can't think what made me sleep so long. "'Why didn't you come and wake me, Davy, my boy?' "'Because Simmons told me you were ill, "'and I must not disturb you if you were ever so late in coming down.' "'I hardly deserve any breakfast,' said Donal, turning to the table. "'But if you will stand by me and read while I take my coffee, "'we shall save a little time so.' "'Yes, sir. But your coffee must be quite cold. I will ring. No, no, I must not waste any more time. A man who cannot drink cold coffee ought to come down while it is hot.' "'Forgu won't drink cold coffee,' said Davy. "'I don't see why you should. Because I prefer to do with my coffee as I please. I will not have hot coffee for my master. I won't have it anything to me what humour the coffee may be in. I will be Donal Grant, whether the coffee be cold or hot. A bit of practical philosophy for you, Davy.' "'I think I understand you, sir. "'You would not have a man make a fuss about a trifle.' "'Not about a real trifle. "'The correlative of a trifle, Davy, is a smile. "'But I would take heed whether the thing that is called a trifle "'be really a trifle. "'Besides, there may be a point in a trifle that is the egg of an ought. "'It is a trifle whether this or that is nice. "'It is a point that I should not care. "'With us Highlanders, it is a point of breeding "'not to mind what sort of dinner we have,' but to eat as heartily of bread and cheese as of roast beef. At least so my father and mother used to teach me, though I fear that refinement of good manners is going out of fashion, even with Highlanders. It is good manners, rejoined Davy with decision, and more than good manners. I should count it grand not to care what kind of dinner I had. But I am afraid it is more than I shall ever come to. You will never come to it by trying because you think it grand. Only mind, I did not say we were not to enjoy our roast beef more than our bread and cheese. That would be not to discriminate where there is a difference. If bread and cheese were just as good to us as roast beef, there would be no victory in our contentment. I see, said Davy. Wouldn't it be well, he asked, after a moment's pause, to put oneself in training, Mr. Grant, to do without things, or at least to be able to do without them? It is much better to do the lessons set you by one who knows how to teach, than to pick lessons for yourself out of your books. Davy, I have not that confidence in myself to think I should be a good teacher of myself. But you are a good teacher of me, sir. I try, but then I am set to teach you, and I am not set to teach myself. I am only set to make myself do what I am taught. When you are my teacher, Davy, I try, don't I, to do everything you tell me? Yes, indeed, sir. But I am not set to obey myself. No, nor anyone else, sir. "'You do not need to obey anyone, or have anyone teach you, sir.' "'Oh, don't I, Davy? "'On the contrary, I could not get on for one solitary moment without somebody to teach me. "'Look you here, Davy. "'I have so many lessons given me that I have no time or need to add to them any of my own. "'If you were to ask the cook to let you have a cold dinner, "'you would perhaps eat it with pride, and take credit for what your hunger yet made quite agreeable to you.' "'but the boy who does not grumble when he is told not to go out because it is raining and he has a cold "'will not perhaps grumble either, should he happen to find his dinner not at all nice.' "'Davy hung his head. "'It had been a very small grumble, but there are no sins for which there is less reason or less excuse than small ones. "'In no sense are they worth committing. "'And we grown people commit many more such than little children, "'and have our reward in childishness instead of childlikeness.' It is so easy, continued Donal, to do the thing we ordain ourselves, for in holding to it we make ourselves out fine fellows, and that is such a mean kind of thing. Then when another who has the right lays a thing upon us, we grumble, though it be the truest and kindest thing, and the most reasonable and needful for us, even for our dignity, for our being worth anything. Depend upon it, Davy, to do what we are told is a far grander thing than to lay the severest rules upon ourselves. I and to stick to them, too." "'But might there not be something good for us to do that we were not told of?' "'Whoever does the thing he is told to do, "'the thing, that is, that has a plain ought in it, "'will become satisfied that there is one who will not forget to tell him what must be done "'as soon as he is fit to do it.' "'The conversation lasted only while Donal ate his breakfast, "'with the little fellow standing beside him. 
It was soon over, but not soon to be forgotten. For the readiness of the boy to do what his master told him was beautiful, and a great help and comfort, sometimes a rousing rebuke to his master, whose thoughts would yet occasionally tumble into one of the pitfalls of sorrow. What, he would say to himself, am I so believed in by this child that he goes at once to do my words, and shall I for a moment doubt the heart of the father, or his power or will to set right whatever may have seemed to go wrong with his child? Go on, Davy, you are a good boy. I will be a better man. But naturally, as soon as lessons were over, he fell again to thinking what could have befallen him the night before. At what point did the aberration begin? The Earl must have taken notice of it, for surely Simmons had not given Davy those injunctions of himself, except indeed he had exposed his condition even to him. If the Earl had spoken to Simmons, kindness seemed intended him, but it might have been merely care over the boy. Anyhow, what was to be done? He did not ponder the matter long. With that directness, which was one of the most marked features of his nature, he resolved at once to request an interview with the Earl, and make his apologies. He sought Simmons, therefore, and found him in the pantry rubbing up the forks and spoons. "'Ah, Mr. Grant,' he said, before Donal could speak, "'I was just coming to you with a message from his lordship. He wants to see you.' "'And I came to you,' replied Donal, "'to say I wanted to see his lordship.' "'That's well fitted, then, sir,' returned Simmons. "'I will go and see when. His lordship is not up, nor likely to be for some hours yet. He is in one of his low fits this morning. He told me you were not quite yourself last night.' As he spoke, his red nose seemed to examine Donal's face with a kindly but not altogether sympathetic scrutiny. "'The fact is, Simmons,' answered Donal, "'not being used to wine, I fear I drank more of his lordship's than was good for me.' "'His lordship's wine,' murmured Simmons, and there checked himself. "'How much did you drink, sir, if I may make so bold?' "'I had one glass during dinner, and more than one, but not nearly two, after.' "'Pooh, pooh, sir. That could never hurt a strong man like you. You ought to know better than that. Look at me.' But he did not go on with his illustration. "'Tut,' he resumed. "'That make you sleep till ten o'clock. If you will kindly wait in the hall, or in the schoolroom, I will bring you his lordship's orders.' So saying, while he washed his hands and took off his white apron, Simmons departed on his errand to his master. Donal went to the foot of the grand staircase, and there waited. As he stood, he heard a light step above him, and involuntarily glancing up, saw the light shape of Lady Arctura come round the curve of the spiral stair, descending rather slowly and very softly, as if her feet were thinking. She checked herself for an infinitesimal moment, then moved on again. Donal stood with bended head as she passed. If she acknowledged his obeisance, it was with the slightest return, but she lifted her eyes to his face with a look that seemed to have in it a strange, wistful trouble, not very marked, yet notable. She passed on and vanished, leaving that look a lingering presence in Donal's thought. What was it? Was it anything? What could it mean? Had he really seen it? Was it there, or had he only imagined it? Simmons kept him waiting a good while. He had found his lordship getting up, and had had to stay to help him dress. At length he came, excusing himself that his lordship's temper at such times, that was, in his dumpy fits, was not one of the evenest, and required a gentle hand. But his lordship would see him, and could Mr. Grant find the way himself, for his old bones ached with running up and down those endless stone steps. Donal answered he knew the way, and sprang up the stair. But his mind was more occupied with the coming interview than with the way to it, which caused him to take a wrong turn after leaving the stair. He had a good gift in space relations, but instinct was here not so keen as on a hillside. The consequence was that he found himself in the picture gallery. A strange feeling of pain, as at the presence of a condition he did not wish to encourage, awoke in him at the discovery. He walked along, however, thus taking, he thought, the readiest way to his lordship's apartment. Either he would find him in his bedroom, or could go through that to his sitting-room. He glanced at the pictures he passed, and seemed, strange to say, though so far as he knew he had never been in the place except in the dark, to recognize some of them as belonging to the stuff of the dream in which he had been wandering through the night. Only that was a glowing and gorgeous dream, 
whereas the pictures were even commonplace. Here was something to be meditated upon, but for the present postponed. His lordship was expecting him. Arrived, as he thought, at the door of the earl's bedroom, he knocked, and receiving no answer, opened it, and found himself in a narrow passage. Nearly opposite was another door, partly open, and hearing a movement within, he ventured to knock there. A voice he knew at once to be Lady Arctura's invited him to enter. It was an old, lovely, gloomy little room, in which the lady sat writing. It had but one low lattice window, to the west, but a fire blazed cheerfully in the old-fashioned grate. She looked up, nor showed more surprise than if he had been a servant she had rung for. "'I beg your pardon, my lady,' he said. "'My lord wished to see me, but I have lost my way.' "'I will show it you,' she answered, and rising came to him. She led him along the winding, narrow passage, pointed out to him the door of his lordship's sitting-room, and turned away. Again, Donal could not help thinking, with a look as of some anxiety about him. He knocked, and the voice of the earl bade him enter. His lordship was in his dressing-gown, on a couch of faded satin of a gold colour, against which his pale yellow face looked cadaverous. "'Good morning, Mr. Grant,' he said. "'I am glad to see you better.' "'I thank you, my lord,' returned Donal. "'I have to make an apology. "'I cannot understand how it was, except, perhaps, "'that being so little accustomed to strong drink, "'there is not the smallest occasion to say a word,' "'interrupted his lordship. "'You did not once forget yourself, "'or cease to behave like a gentleman. "'Your lordship is very kind. "'Still I cannot help being sorry. "'I shall take good care in the future.' "'It might be as well,' conceded the earl, "'to set yourself a limit.' "'necessarily, in your case, a narrow one. "'Some constitutions are so immediately responsive,' "'he added in a murmur. "'The least exhibition of... "'But a man like you, Mr. Grant,' he went on aloud, "'will always know to take care of himself.' "'Sometimes, apparently, when it is too late,' rejoined Donal. "'But I must not annoy your lordship "'with any further expression of my regret.' "'Will you dine with me tonight?' said the Earl. "'I am lonely now.' "'Sometimes, for months together, I feel no need of a companion. "'My books and pictures content me. "'All at once a longing for society will seize me, "'and that longing my health will not permit me to indulge. "'I am not by nature unsociable, much the contrary. "'You may wonder I do not admit my own family more freely, "'but my wretched health makes me shrink from loud voices and abrupt motions.' "'But Lady Arctura,' thought Donal. "'Your lordship will find me a poor substitute, I fear.' he said, for the society you would like, but I am at your lordship's service. He could not help turning with a moment's longing and regret to his tower nest and the company of his books and thoughts, but he did not feel that he had a choice. End of chapter 31《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. • For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • Recording by Devorah Allen. • Donald Grant by George MacDonald. • Chapter 32. • The Second Dinner with the Earl. • He went as before, conducted by the butler, and formally announced. • To his surprise, with the Earl was Lady Arctura. His lordship made him give her his arm, and followed. This was to Donal a very different dinner from that of the evening before. Whether the presence of his niece made the earl rouse himself to be agreeable, or he had grown better since the morning and his spirits had risen, certainly he was not like the same man. He talked in a rather forced playful way, but told two or three good stories, described with vivacity some of the adventures of his youth, spoke of several great men he had met, and in short was all that could be desired in a host. Donal took no wine during dinner. The earl, as before, took very little, and Lady Arctura none. She listened respectfully to her uncle's talk, and was attentive when Donal spoke. He thought she looked even sympathetic two or three times, and once he caught the expression as of anxiety he had seen on her face that same day twice before. It was strange, too, he thought, that not seeing her sometimes for a week together he should thus meet her three times in one day. When the last of the dinner was removed and the wine placed on the table, 
Donal thought his lordship looked as if he expected his niece to go, but she kept her place. He asked her which wine she would have, but she declined any. He filled his glass and pushed the decanter to Donal. He too filled his glass and drank slowly. The talk revived, but Donal could not help fancying that the eyes of the lady now and then sought his with a sort of question in them, almost as if she feared something was going to happen to him. He attributed this to her having heard that he took too much wine the night before. The situation was unpleasant. He must, however, brave it out. When he refused a second glass, which the earl by no means pressed, he thought he saw her look relieved, but more than once thereafter he saw, or fancied he saw her glance at him with that expression of slight anxiety. In its course the talk fell upon sheep, and Donal was relating some of his experiences with them and their dogs, greatly interested in the subject, when all at once, just as before, something seemed to burst in his head, and immediately, although he knew he was sitting at table with the Earl and Lady Arctura, he was uncertain whether he was not at the same time upon the side of a lonely hill, closed in a magic night of high summer, his woolly and hairy friends lying all about him, and a light glimmering faintly on the heather a little way off, which he knew for the flame that marks for a moment the footstep of an angel, when he touches ever so lightly the solid earth. He seemed to be reading the thoughts of his sheep around him, yet all the time went on talking, and knew he was talking, with the earl and the lady. After a while everything was changed. He was no longer either with his sheep or his company. He was alone, and walking swiftly through and beyond the park, in a fierce wind from the northeast, battling with it, and ruling it like a fiery horse. By and by came a hoarse, terrible music, which he knew for the thunderous beat of the waves on the low shore, yet imagined issuing from an indescribable instrument, gigantic and grotesque. He felt it first, through his feet, as one feels without hearing the tones of an organ for which the building is too small to allow scope to their vibration. The waves made the ground beat against the soles of his feet as he walked, but soon he heard it like the infinitely prolonged roaring of a sky-built organ. It was drawing him to the sea, whether in the body or out of the body he knew not. He was but conscious of forms of existence, whether those forms had relation to things outside him, or whether they belonged only to the world within him, he was unaware. The roaring of the great water organ grew louder and louder. He knew every step of the way to the shore, across the fields and over fences and stiles. He turned this way and that, to avoid here a ditch, there a deep sandy patch. And still the music grew louder and louder, and at length came in his face the driving spray. It was the flying touch of the wings on which the tones went hurrying past into the depths of awful distance. His feet were now wading through the bent tufted sand, with the hard, bare, wave-beaten sand in front of him. Through the dark he could see the white fierceness of the hurrying waves as they rushed to the shore, then leaning, toppling, curling, self-undermined, hurled forth all at once the sound that was in them in a falling roar of defeat. Every wave was a complex chord, with winnowed tones feathering it round. He paced up and down the sand. It seemed for ages. Why he paced there he did not know. Why always he turned and went back instead of going on. Suddenly he thought he saw something dark in the hollow of a wave that swept to its fall. The moon came out as it broke, and the something was rolled in the surf up the shore. Donal stood watching it. Why should he move? What was it to him? The next wave would reclaim it for the ocean. It looked like the body of a man, but what did it matter? Many such were tossed in the hollows of that music. But something came back to him out of the ancient years. In the ages gone by, men did what they could. There was a word they used then. They said men ought to do this or that. This body might not be dead. Or dead, someone might like to have it. He rushed into the water and caught it. Ere the next wave broke, though hours of cogitation, ratiocination, recollection, seemed to have intervened. The breaking wave drenched him from head to foot. He clung to his prize and dragged it out. A moment's bewilderment, and he came to himself lying on the sand, his arms round a great lump of net, lost from some fishing boat. His illusions were gone. He was sitting in a cold wind, wet to the skin, on the border of a wild sea. A poor, shivering, altogether ordinary and uncomfortable mortal, 
he sat on the shore of the German Ocean, from which he had rescued a tangled mass of net and seaweed. He dragged it beyond the reach of the waves, and set out for home. By the time he reached the castle he was quite warm. His door at the foot of the tower was open. He crept up, and was soon fast asleep. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirty Three The Housekeeper's Room. He was not so late the next morning. Ere he had finished his breakfast, he had made up his mind that he must beware of the earl. He was satisfied that the experiences of the past night could not be the consequence of one glass of wine. If he asked him again, he would go to dinner with him, but would drink nothing but water. School was just over when Simmons came from his lordship to inquire after him, and invite him to dine with him that evening. Donald immediately consented. This time Lady Arctura was not with the earl. After, as during dinner, Donald declined to drink. His lordship cast on him a keen, searching glance, but it was only a glance, and took no farther notice of his refusal. The conversation, however, which had not been brilliant from the first, now sank and sank till it was not. And after a cup of coffee, his lordship, remarking that he was not feeling himself, begged Donald to excuse him, and proceeded to retire. Donald rose, and with a hope that his lordship would have a good night and feel better in the morning, left the room. The passage outside was lighted only by a rather dim lamp, and in the distance Donal saw what he could but distinguish as the form of a woman, standing by the door which opened upon the great staircase. He supposed it at first to be one of the maids, but the servants were so few compared with the size of the castle that one was seldom to be met on stair or in passage, and besides, the form stood as if waiting for someone. As he drew nearer, he saw it was Lady Arctura, and would have passed with an obeisance. But ere he could lay his hand on the lock, hers was there to prevent him. He then saw that she was agitated, and that she had stopped him thus because her voice had at the moment failed her. The next moment, however, she recovered it and her self-possession as well. "'Mr. Grant,' she said in a low voice, "'I wish to speak to you.' if you will allow me. I am at your service, my lady, answered Donal. But we cannot hear. My uncle. Shall we go into the picture gallery? suggested Donal. There is moonlight there. No, that would be still nearer, my uncle. His hearing is sometimes preternaturally keen, and besides, as you know, he often walks there after his evening meal. But, excuse me, Mr. Grant, you will understand me presently. Are you, are you quite... "'You mean, my lady, am I quite myself this evening?' said Donal, wishing to help her with the embarrassing question. "'I have drunk nothing but water to-night.' With that she opened the door, and descended the stair, he following. But as soon as the curve of the staircase hid the door they had left, she stopped, and turning to him, said, "'I would not have you mistake me, Mr. Grant. I should be ashamed to speak to you if—' "'Indeed, I am very sorry,' said Donal, "'though hardly so much to blame as I fear you think me.' "'You mistake me at once. "'You suppose I imagine you took too much wine last night. "'It would be absurd. "'I saw what you took. "'But we must not talk here. "'Come.' "'She turned again, and going down, "'led the way to the housekeeper's room. "'They found her at work with her needle. "'Mistress Brooks,' said Lady Arctura, "'I want to have a little talk with Mr. Grant, "'and there is no fire in the library. "'May we sit here?' "'By all means. "'Sit down, my lady. "'Why, Bairn?' "'You look as cold as if you'd been on the roof. "'There, sit close to the fire. "'You are all trembling.' "'Lady Arctura obeyed like the child Mistress Brooks called her, "'and sat down in the chair she gave up to her. "'I've something to see after in the still room,' said the housekeeper. "'You sit here and how you crack. "'Sit down, Mr. Grant. "'I'm glad to see you and my lady come to word of mouth at last. "'I began to think it would never be.' "'Had Donald been in the way of looking to faces "'for the interpretation of words and thoughts,' he would have seen a shadow sweep over Lady Arcturus, followed by a flush, which he would have attributed to displeasure at this utterance of the housekeeper. But with all his experience of the world within, 
and all his unusually developed power of entering into the feelings of others, he had never come to pry into those feelings, or to study their phenomena for the sake of possessing himself of them. Man was by no means an open book to him, no, nor woman neither, but he would have scorned to supplement by such investigation what a lady chose to tell him. He sat looking into the fire, with an occasional upward glance, waiting for what was to come, and saw neither shadow nor flush. Lady Arctura sat also gazing into the fire, and seemed in no haste to begin. "'You are so good to Davy,' she said at length, and stopped. "'No better than I have to be,' returned Donal. "'Not to be good to Davy would be to be a wretch.' "'You know, Mr. Grant, I cannot agree with you. "'There is no immediate necessity, my lady.' "'But I suppose one may be fair to another,' she went on doubtingly. "'And it is only fair to confess that he is much more manageable since you came. "'Only that is no good if it does not come from the right source. "'Grapes do not come from thorns, my lady. "'We must not allow an evil a power of good.' "'She did not reply. "'He minds everything I say to him now,' she resumed. "'What is it makes him so good? "'I wish I had had such a tutor.' "'She stopped again. "'She had spoken out of the simplicity of her thought, "'but the words, when said, "'looked to her as if they ought not to have been said. "'Something is working in her,' thought Donal. "'She is so different. "'Her voice is different. "'But that is not what I wanted to speak to you about, Mr. Grant,' "'she recommenced, "'though I did want you to know I was aware of the improvement in Davy. I wish to say something about my uncle. Here followed another pause. You may have remarked, she said at length, that though we live together, and he is my guardian and the head of the house, there is not much communication between us. I have gathered as much. I ask no questions, but I cannot tell Davy not to talk to me. Of course not. Lord Morven is a strange man. I do not understand him, and I do not want to judge him, or make you judge him, but I must speak of a fact concerning yourself which I have no right to keep from you. Once more a pause followed. There was nothing now of the grand dame about Arctura. Has nothing occurred to wake a doubt in you, she said at last, abruptly. Have you not suspected him of, of using you in any way? I have had an undefined ghost of a suspicion, answered Donal. Please tell me what you know. I should know nothing, although my room being near his I should have been the more perplexed about some things, had he not made an experiment upon myself a year ago. Is it possible? I sometimes fancy I have not been so well since. It was a great shock to me when I came to myself. You see I am trusting you, Mr. Grant. I thank you heartily, my lady, said Donal. I believe, continued Lady Arctura, gathering courage, that my uncle is in the habit of taking some horrible drug for the sake of its effect on his brain. There are people who do so. What it is I don't know, and I would rather not know. It is just as bad, surely, as taking too much wine. I have heard himself remark to Mr. Carmichael that opium was worse than wine, for it destroyed the moral sense more. Mind, I don't say it is opium he takes. There are other things, said Donal, even worse. But surely you do not mean he dared try anything of the sort on you. I am sure he gave me something, for once that I dined with him, but I cannot describe the effect it had upon me. I think he wanted to see its operation on one who did not even know she had taken anything. The influence of such things is a pleasant one, they say, at first, but I would not go through such agonies as I had for the world. She ceased, evidently troubled by the harassing remembrance. Donal hastened to speak. It was because of such a suspicion, my lady that this evening I would not even taste his wine. I am safe tonight, I trust, from the insanity, I can call it nothing else, that possessed me the last two nights. Was it very dreadful? asked Lady Arctura. On the contrary, I had a sense of life and power such as I could never of myself have imagined. Oh, Mr. Grant, do take care. Do not be tempted to take it again. I don't know where it might not have led me if I had found it as pleasant as it was horrible, for I am sorely tried with painful thoughts, and feel sometimes as if I would do almost anything to get rid of them. There must be a good way of getting rid of them. Think of it of God's mercy, said Donal, that you cannot get rid of them the other way. I do, I do. The shield of his presence was over you. How glad I should be to think so. But we have no right to think he cares for us till we believe in Christ, and, and, I don't know that I do believe in him. 
"'Wherever you learn that, it is a terrible lie,' said Donal. "'Is not Christ the same always? "'And is he not of one mind with God? "'Was it not while we were yet sinners "'that he poured out his soul for us? "'It is a fearful thing to say of the perfect love "'that he is not doing all he can, "'with all the power of a maker over the creature he has made, "'to help and deliver him. "'I know he makes his sun to shine "'and his rain to fall upon the evil and the good, "'but those good things are only of this world.' Are those the good things, then, that the Lord says the Father will give to those that ask him? How can you worship a God who gives you all the little things he does not care much about, but will not do his best for you? But are there not things he cannot do for us till we believe in Christ? Certainly there are. But what I want you to see is that he does all that can be done. He finds it very hard to teach us, but he is never tired of trying. Anyone who is willing to be taught of God will by him be taught, and thoroughly taught. I am afraid I am doing wrong in listening to you, Mr. Grant, and the more that I cannot help wishing what you say might be true. But are you not in danger, you will pardon me for saying it, of presumption? How can all the good people be wrong? Because the greater part of their teachers have set themselves to explain God, rather than to obey and enforce His will. The gospel is given to convince not our understandings, but our hearts. That done, and never till then, our understandings will be free." Our Lord said he had many things to tell his disciples, but they were not able to hear them. If the things be true which I have heard from Sunday to Sunday since I came here, the Lord has brought us no salvation at all, but only a change of shape to our miseries. They have not redeemed you, Lady Arctura, and never will. Nothing but Christ himself, your Lord and friend and brother, not all the doctrines about him, even if every one of them were true, can save you. Poor orphan children, we cannot find our God, and they would have us take instead a shocking caricature of him. But how should sinners know what is or is not like the true God? If a man desires God, he cannot help knowing enough of him to be capable of learning more. Else how should he desire him? Made in the image of God, his idea of him cannot be all wrong. That does not make him fit to teach others, only fit to go on learning for himself. But in Jesus Christ, I see the very God I want. I want a father like him. He reproaches some of those about him for not knowing him, for if they had known God they would have known him. They were to blame for not knowing God. No other than the God exactly like Christ can be the true God. It is a doctrine of devils that Jesus died to save us from our Father. There is no safety, no good, no gladness, no purity, but with the Father, his Father and our Father, his God and our God. But God hates sin and punishes it. It would be terrible if he did not. All hatred of sin is love to the sinner. Do you think Jesus came to deliver us from the punishment of our sins? He would not have moved a step for that. The horrible thing is being bad, and all punishment is helped to deliver us from that. Nor will punishment cease till we have ceased to be bad. God will have us good, and Jesus works out the will of his Father. Where is the refuge of the child who fears his father? Is it in the farthest corner of the room? Is it down in the dungeon of the castle, my lady? No, no, cried Lady Arctura. In his father's arms. There, said Donal, and was silent. I hold by Jesus, he added after a pause, and rose as he said it, but stood where he rose. Lady Arctura sat motionless, divided between reverence for distorted and false forms of truth taught her from her earliest years, and desire after a God whose very being is the bliss of his creatures. Some time passed in silence, and then she too rose to depart. She held out her hand to Donal with a kind of irresolute motion, but withdrawing it, smiled almost beseechingly, and said, "'I wish I might ask you something. I know it is a rude question, but if you could see all, you would answer me and let the offence go. I will answer anything you choose to ask. That makes it the more difficult, but I will. I cannot bear to remain longer in doubt.' Did you really write that poem you gave to Kate Graham? Compose it, I mean, your own self? I made no secret of that when I gave it her, said Donal, not perceiving her drift. Then you did really write it? Donal looked at her in perplexity. Her face grew very red, and tears began to come in her eyes. You must pardon me, she said. I am so ignorant, and we live in such an out-of-the-way place that, that it seems very unlikely a real poet... "'and then I have been told there are people "'who have a passion for appearing to do the thing "'they are not able to do, 
and I was anxious to be quite sure. My mind would keep brooding over it and wondering and longing to know for certain, so I resolved at last that I would be rid of the doubt even at the risk of offending you. I know I have been rude, unpardonably rude, but... But, supplemented Donal, with a most sympathetic smile, for he understood her as his own thought, you do not feel quite sure yet. What a priori reason do you see why I should not be able to write verses? There is no rule as to where poetry grows. One place is as good as another for that. I hope you will forgive me. I hope I have not offended you very much. Nobody in such a world as this ought to be offended at being asked for proof. If there are in it rogues that look like honest men, how is anyone without a special gift of insight to be always sure of the honest man? Even the man whom a woman loves best will sometimes tear her heart to pieces. I will give you all the proof you can desire. And lest the tempter should say I made up the proof itself between now and tomorrow morning, I will fetch it at once. Oh, Mr. Grant, spare me. I am not, indeed, I am not so bad as that. Who can tell when or whence the doubt may wake again, or what may wake it? At least let me explain a little before you go, she said. Certainly, he answered, reseating himself in compliance with her example. Miss Graham told me that you had never seen a garden like theirs before. I never did. There are none such, I fancy, in our part of the country. Nor in our neighborhood, either. Then what is surprising in it? Nothing in that. But is there not something in your being able to write a poem like that about a garden such as you had never seen? One would say you must have been familiar with it from childhood to be able so to enter into the spirit of the place. Perhaps if I had been familiar with it from childhood... That might have disabled me from feeling the spirit of it, for then might it not have looked to me as it looked to those in whose time such gardens were the fashion? Two things are necessary. First, that there should be a spirit in a place, and next, that the place should be seen by one whose spirit is capable of giving house room to its spirit. By the way, does the ghost lady feel the place all right? I am not sure that I know what you mean, but I felt the grass with her feet as I read, and the wind lifting my hair. I seemed to know exactly how she felt. Now tell me, were you ever a ghost? No, she answered, looking in his face like a child, without even a smile. Did you ever see a ghost? No, never. Then how should you know how a ghost would feel? I see. I cannot answer you. Donal rose. I am indeed ashamed, said Lady Arctura. Ashamed of giving me the chance of proving myself a true man? That, at least, is no longer necessary. But I want my revenge. As a punishment for doubting one whom you had so little ground for believing, you shall be compelled to see the proof. That is, if you will do me the favor to wait here till I come back. I shall not be long, though it is some distance to the top of Balliol's tower. Davy told me your room was there. Do you not find it cold? It must be very lonely. I wonder why Mistress Brooks put you there. Donal assured her he could not have had a place more to his mind, and before she could well think he had reached the foot of his stair, was back with a roll of papers, which he laid on the table. There, he said, opening it out, if you will take the trouble to go over these, you may read the growth of the poem. Here first you see it blocked out rather roughly, and much blotted with erasures and substitutions. Here next you see the result copied, clean to begin with, but afterwards scored and scored. You see the words I chose instead of the first, and afterwards in their turn rejected, until in the proofs I reach those which I have as yet let stand. I do not fancy Miss Graham has any doubt the verses are mine, for it was plain she thought them rubbish. From your pains to know who wrote them, I believe you do not think so badly of them. She thought he was satirical, and gave a slight sigh as of pain. It went to his heart. I did not mean the smallest reflection, my lady, on your desire for satisfaction, he said. Rather, indeed, it flatters me. But is it not strange the heart should be less ready to believe what seems worth believing? Something must be true. Why not the worthy? Oftener, at least, than the unworthy. Why should it be easier to believe hard things of God, for instance, than lovely things? Or that one man copied from another, than that he should have made the thing himself? Some would yet say I contrived all this semblance of composition in order to lay the surer claim to that to which I had none nor would take the trouble to follow the thing through its development. But it will be easy for you, my lady, and no bad exercise in logic and analysis, to determine whether the genuine growth of the poem be before you in these papers or not. I shall find it most interesting, said Lady Arctura. So much I can tell already. I never saw anything of the kind before, 
and had no idea how poetry was made. Does it always take so much labor? Some verses take much more. Some none at all. The labor is in getting the husks of expression cleared off, so that the thought may show itself plainly. At this point, Mrs. Brooks, thinking probably the young people had had long enough conference, entered, and after a little talk with her, Lady Arctura kissed her and bade her good night. Donal retired to his aerial chamber, wondering whether the lady of the house had indeed changed as much as she seemed to have changed. From that time, whether it was that Lady Arctura had previously avoided meeting him and now did not, or from other causes, Donal and she met much oftener as they went about the place, nor did they ever pass without a mutual smile and greeting. The next day but one, she brought him his papers to the schoolroom. She had read every erasure and correction, she told him, and could no longer have had a doubt that the writer of the papers was the maker of the verses, even had she not previously learned thorough confidence in the man himself. They would possibly fail to convince a jury, though, he said, as he rose and went to throw them in the fire. Divining his intent, Arctura darted after him, and caught them just in time. Let me keep them, she pleaded, for my humiliation. Do with them what you like, my lady, said Donal. They are of no value to me, except that you care for them. End of chapter 33「Chapter Thirty Four of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirty Four Cobbler and Castle. In the bosom of the family in which the elements seem most kindly mixed, there may yet lie some root of discord and disruption, upon which the foreign influence necessary to its appearance above ground has not yet come to operate. That things are quiet is no proof, only a hopeful sign of harmony. In a family of such poor accord as that at the castle, the peace might well at any moment be broken. Lord Forgue had been for some time on a visit to Edinburgh, had doubtless there been made much of, and had returned with a considerable development of haughtiness, and of that freedom which means subjugation to self, and freedom from the law of liberty. It is often when a man is least satisfied, not with himself, but with his immediate doings, that he is most ready to assert his superiority to the restraints he might formerly have grumbled against, but had not dared to dispute, and to claim from others such consideration as accords with a false idea of his personal standing. But for a while, Donal and he barely saw each other. Donal had no occasion to regard him, and Lord Forgue kept so much to himself that Davy made lamentation. Percy was not half so jolly as he used to be. For a fortnight Eppy had not been to see her grandparents, and as the last week something had prevented Donal also from paying them his customary visit, the old people had naturally become uneasy. And one frosty twilight, when the last of the sunlight had turned to cold green in the west, Andrew Coleman appeared in the castle kitchen, asking to see Mistress Brooks. He was kindly received by the servants, among whom Eppie was not present, and Mrs. Brooks, who had a genuine respect for the cobbler, soon came to greet him. She told him she knew no reason why Eppie had not gone to inquire after them as usual. She would send for her, she said, and left the kitchen. Eppie was not at the moment to be found, but Donal, whom Mistress Brooks had gone herself to seek, went at once to the kitchen. "'Will you come out a bit, Andrew?' he said, "'if you're not tired. "'It's a fine night, and it's easy to talk in the gloaming.' "'Andrew consented with alacrity. "'On the side of the castle away from the town, "'the descent was at first by a succession of terraces "'with steps from the one to the other, "'the terraces themselves being little flower gardens. "'At the bottom of the last of these terraces, "'and parallel with them, was a double row of trees.' "'forming a long, narrow avenue between two doors and two walls "'at opposite ends of the castle. "'One of these led to some of the offices. "'The other admitted to a fruit garden, "'which turned the western shoulder of the hill "'and found for the greater part a nearly southern exposure. "'At this time of the year it was a lonely enough place, "'and at this time of the day more than likely to be altogether deserted. "'Thither Donal would lead his friend. "'Going out, therefore, by the kitchen door, "'they went first into a stable-yard, 
from which descended steps to the castle well, on the level of the second terrace. Thence they arrived, by more steps, at the mews where in old times the hawks were kept, now rather ruinous, though not quite neglected. Here the one wall door opened on the avenue, which led to the other. It was one of the pleasantest walks in immediate proximity to the castle. The first of the steely stars were shining through the naked rafters of leafless boughs overhead, as Donal and the cobbler stepped, gently talking, into the aisle of trees. The old man looked up, gazed for a moment in silence, and said, "'The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I used when I was a lad to study astronomy a wee, in the hope of better hearing what the heavens declared about the glory of God. I would fain understand the speech one day cried across the night to the other.' "'But I was sair disappointed. "'The things the astronomer tell simple folk were very wonderful, "'but I couldn't have find it in my heart "'that they made me think any matter God nor I did afore. "'I didn't mean to say they might not be competent to work that in another, "'but it wasn't my experience of them. "'My heart was some sair at this, "'for, you see, I was set upon winning into the presence of him I couldn't abide frae, "'and at that time I had not learnt to going straight to him who is the express image of his person, "'but I sought him through the philosophy. "'Eh, it was barely philosophy.' "'of the good books that dwell upon the nature of God and all that, "'and his hatred of sin and all that. "'Part and part true, no doubt. "'But I wanted God great and near, "'and they made him out small, "'small and uncle far away. "'One night I was out by my sail upon the shore, "'just as the stars were teetin' out. "'And it was not as gin they were fear to the sun, "'and pleased that he was gone, "'but as gin they were teetin' out to see "'what had come of their father or lights. "'All at once I came to myself, like out of some blind delusion. Up I cast my eye in a bone, and eh, there was the heaven as God made it. Awful. Big and deep. Aye, fathomless deep, and full of the wondering yet steady lights that nothing can blow out but the breath of his mouth. Away and up it goed, and deeper and deeper, and my ain gud travelling away and away, till it seemed as though they could never win back to me. All at once they drop it for the lift like a laverock, and light it upon the horizon where the sea and the sky met like righteousness and peace kissing one another, as the psalm says. Now I cannot tell what it was, but just there where the earth and the sky came together was the meeting of my earthly soul with God's heavenly soul. There was bonny colours and bonny lights, and a bonny great star hanging o'er a doll, but it was none of all those things. It was something deeper nor all, and higher nor all. For at that moment I saw, not how the heavens declared the glory of God, but I saw them declaring it, and I want it no mair. Astronomy for me might sit and wait for a better world, where folk didna wear out their shoon, and other folk had not to mend them. For what is the great glory of God but that, though no man can comprehend him, he comes down, and lays his cheek till his man's, and says to him, Eh, hey, my creature. While the cobbler was thus talking, they had gone the length of the avenue, and were within less than two trees of the door of the fruit garden, when it opened, and was hurriedly shut again. Not, however, before Donal had caught sight, as he believed, of the form of Eppy. He called her by name, and ran to the door, followed by Andrew. The same suspicion had struck both of them at once. Donal lifted the latch, and would have opened the door, but someone held it against him, and he heard the noise of an attempt to push the rusty bolt into the staple. He set his strength to it, and forced the door open. Lord Forgu was on the other side of it, and a little way off stood Eppie trembling. Donal turned away from his lordship, and said to the girl, "'Eppie, here's your grandfather come to see you.' The cobbler, however, went up to Lord Forgu. "'You are a young man, my lord,' he said, "'and may regard it as folly in an old man to interfere between you and your will. But I warn you, my lord, except you cease to carry yourself thus towards my granddaughter, his lordship, your father, shall be informed of the matter. Eppie, you come home with me.' "'I will not,' said Eppie, her voice trembling with passion, though which passion it were hard to say. "'I'm a free woman. I make my own living. I will not be treated like a child.' "'I will speak to Mistress Brooks,' said the old man with sad dignity. "'And make her turn me away,' said Eppie. She seemed quite changed, bold and determined, was probably relieved that she could no more play a false part. His lordship stood and said nothing. "'But don't you think, Grandfather,' continued Eppy, that whatever Mistress Brooks says or does, I'll go home with you. I've saved money, and as I can't get another place here when you've taken away my character, I'll leave the country. His lordship advanced, 
and with strained composure said, "'I confess, Mr. Coman, things do look against us. "'It is awkward you should have found us together, but you know,' "'and here he attempted a laugh, "'we are told not to judge by appearances.' "'We may be forced to act by them, though, my lord,' said Andrew. "'I should be sorry to judge either of you by them. "'Eppy must come home with me, "'or it will be more awkward yet for the both of you.' "'Oh, if you threaten us,' said Forgue contemptuously, "'then, of course, we are very frightened. "'But you had better beware. "'You will only make it the more difficult for me "'to do your granddaughter the justice I always intended. "'What your lordship's notion of justice may be, "'I will not trouble you to explain,' said the old man. "'All I desire for the present is that she come home with me.' "'Let us leave the matter to Mistress Brooks,' said Forgue. "'I shall easily satisfy her that there is no occasion for any hurry. "'Believe me, you will only bring trouble on the innocent.' "'Then it cannot be on you, my lord, "'for in this thing you have not behaved as a gentleman ought,' said the cobbler. "'You dare tell me so!' cried Forgue, striding up to the little old man, "'as if he would sweep him away with the very wind of his approach. "'Yes, for else how should I say it to another, "'and that may soon be necessary,' answered the cobbler. "'Didn't your lordship promise an end to the whole miserable affair? "'I remember nothing of the sort.' "'You did, to me,' said Donal. "'Do hold your tongue, Grant, and don't make things worse. "'To you I can easily explain it. "'Besides, you have nothing to do with it "'now this good fellow has taken it up. "'It is quite possible, besides, "'to break one's word to the ear "'and yet keep it to the sense. "'The only thing to justify that suggestion,' said Donal, "'would be that you had married Eppy, "'or were about to marry her.' "'Eppy would have spoken, "'but she only gave a little cry, "'for Forgo put his hand over her mouth. "'You hold your tongue,' he said. "'You will only complicate matters.' "'And there's another point, my lord,' resumed Donal. "'You say I have nothing to do now with the affair. "'If not for my friend's sake, I have for my own. "'What do you mean?' "'That I am in the house a paid servant, "'and must not allow anything mischievous to go on in it "'without acquainting my master.' "'You acknowledge, Mr. Grant, "'that you are neither more nor less than a paid servant, "'but you mistake your duty as such. "'I shall be happy to explain it to you. "'You have nothing whatever to do with what goes on in the house. "'You have but to mind your work.' I told you before you are my brother's tutor, not mine. To interfere with what I do is nothing less than a piece of damned impertinence. That impertinence, however, I intend to be guilty of the moment I can get audience of your father. You will not, if I give you such explanation as satisfies you I have done the girl no harm, and mean honestly by her, Forgue said in a confident yet somewhat conciliatory tone. In any case, returned Donal, you having once promised, and then broken your promise, I shall without fail tell your father all I know and ruin her, and perhaps me too, for life. The truth will ruin only those that ought to be ruined, said Donal. Forgue sprang upon him, and struck him a heavy blow between the eyes. He had been having lessons in boxing while in Edinburgh, and had confidence in himself. It was a well-planted blow, and Donal unprepared for it. He staggered against the wall, and for a moment could neither see nor think. All he knew was that there was something or other he had to attend to. His lordship, excusing himself perhaps on the ground of necessity, there being a girl in the case, would have struck him again, but Andrew threw himself between and received the blow for him. As Donal came to himself, he heard a groan from the ground, and looking, saw Andrew at his feet, and understood. "'Dear old man,' he said, "'he dared to strike you.' "'He didn't mean it,' returned Andrew feebly. "'Are you in an orit, sir? "'He gave you a terrible one. "'You might have heard it cross the street.' "'I shall be all right in a minute,' answered Donal, wiping the blood out of his eyes. "'I've a good hard head, thank God. But what has become of them?' "'You did not think you would be waiting to see us come to ourselves,' said the cobbler. With Donal's help and great difficulty, he rose, and they stood looking at each other through the starlight, bewildered and uncertain. The cobbler was the first to recover his wits. "'It's in no manner of use,' he said, "'to rouse the castle with hue and cry.' "'What how we to say but that we found the two in the garden together? "'It would but raise a clash. "'The which, fable or fact, would do nothing for nobody. "'His lordship mun be look ken, as ye say. "'But will his lordship believe you, sir? "'I'm summon to mind the young man's away till his father are ready "'to prejudice him again anything ye may say.' "'That makes it the more necessary,' said Donal, "'that I should go at once to his lordship. "'He will fall out upon me for not having told him at once, "'but I must not mind that.' "'If I were not to tell him now, he would have a good case against me.' "'They were already walking towards the house, "'the old man giving a groan now and then. "'He could not go in,' he said, 
He would walk gently on, and Donal would overtake him. It was an hour and a half before Andrew got home, and Donal had not overtaken him. End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of Donal Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirty Five The Earl's Bedchamber. Having washed the blood from his face, Donal sought Simmons. "'His lordship can't see you now, I am sure, sir,' answered the butler. "'Lord Forgue is with him.' Donal turned and went straight up to Lord Morven's apartment. As he passed the door of his bedroom, opening on the corridor, he heard voices in debate. He entered the sitting-room. There was no one there. It was not a time for ceremony. He knocked at the door of the bedroom. The voices within were loud, and no answer came. He knocked again, and received an angry permission to enter. He entered— closed the door behind him, and stood in sight of his lordship, waiting what should follow. Lord Morven was sitting up in bed, his face so pale and distorted that Donal thought elsewhere he should hardly have recognized it. The bed was a large four-post bed. Its curtains were drawn close to the posts, admitting as much air as possible. At the foot of it stood Lord Forgue, his handsome, shallow face flushed with anger, his right arm straight down by his side, and the hand of it clenched hard. He turned when Donal entered. A fiercer flush overspread his face, but almost immediately the look of rage yielded to one of determined insult. Possibly even the appearance of Donal was a relief to being alone with his father. Mm, "'Mr. Grant,' stammered his lordship, speaking with pain, "'you are well come, just in time to hear a father curse his son.' "'Even such a threat shall not make me play a dishonorable part,' said Forgue, "'looking, however, anything but honourable, "'for the heart, not the brain, moulds the expression. "'Mr. Grant,' resumed the father, "'I have found you a man of sense and refinement. "'If you had been tutor to this degenerate boy, "'the worst trouble of my life would not have overtaken me.' "'Forgu's lip curled, but he did not speak, "'and his father went on. "'Here is this fellow come to tell me to my face "'that he intends the ruin and disgrace of the family "'by a low marriage.' "'It will not be the first time it has been so disgraced,' retorted the son, "'if fresh peasant blood be indeed a disgrace to any family. "'Bah! The hus— "'Bah! The hussy is not even a wholesome peasant girl,' cried the father. "'Who do you think she is, Mr. Grant?' "'I do not need to guess, my lord,' replied Donal. "'I came now to inform your lordship of what I had myself seen. "'She must leave the house this instant.' "'Then I too leave it, my lord,' said Forgu. "'Where's your money?' returned the earl contemptuously. Forgue shifted to an attack upon Donal. "'Your lordship hardly places confidence in me,' he said, "'but it is not the less my duty to warn you against this man. Months ago he knew what was going on, and comes to tell you now because this evening I chastised him for his rude interference.' In cooler blood, Lord Forgue would not have shown such meanness. But passion brings to the front the thing that lurks." "'and it is no doubt the necessity for forestalling his disclosure "'that I owe the present ingenuous confession,' said Lord Morven. "'But explain, Mr. Grant.' "'My lord,' said Donal calmly, "'I became aware that there was something between Lord Forgu and the girl, "'and was alarmed for the girl. "'She is the child of friends to whom I am much beholden. "'But on the promise of both that the thing should end, "'I concluded it better not to trouble your lordship. "'I may have blundered in this, but I did what seemed best.' This night, however, I discovered that things were going as before, and it became imperative on my position in your house that I should make your lordship acquainted with the fact. He assevered there was nothing dishonest between them, but having deceived me once, how was I to trust him again? How indeed, the young blackguard, said his lordship, casting a fierce glance at his son. Allow me to remark, said Forgue with comparative coolness, that I deceived no one. What I promised was that the affair should not go on, it did not. From that moment it assumed a different and serious aspect. I now intend to marry the girl. I tell you, Forgue, if you do, I will disown you. Forgue smiled an impertinent smile, and held his peace. The threat had for him no terror. I shall be the better able, continued his lordship, 
to provide suitably for Davy. He is what a son ought to be. But hear me, Forgu, you must be aware that if I left you all I had, it would be beggary for one handicapped with a title. You may think my anger unreasonable, but it comes solely of anxiety on your account. Nothing but a suitable marriage, the most suitable of all is within your arm's length, can save you from the life of a moneyless peer, the most pitiable object on the face of the earth. Were it possible to ignore your rank, you have no profession, no trade even, in these trade-loving times, to fall back upon. Except you marry as I please, you will have nothing from me but the contempt of a title without a farthing to keep it decent. You threaten to leave the house. Can you pay for a railway ticket? Forgu was silent for a moment. My lord, he said, I have given my word to the girl. Would you have me disgrace your name by breaking it? Tut, tut, there are words and words. What obligation can there be in the rash promises of an unworthy love? Still less are they binding where the man is not his own master. You are under a bond to your family, under a bond to society, under a bond to your country. Marry this girl and you will be an outcast. Marry as I would have you and no one will think the worse of you for a foolish vow in your boyhood. Bah, the merest rumor of it will never rise into the serene air of your position. And let the girl go and break her heart, said Forgu, with look black as death. You need fear no such catastrophe. You are no such marvel among men that a kitchen wench will break her heart for you. She will be sorry for herself, no doubt, but it will be nothing more than she expected, and will only confirm her opinion of you. She knows well enough the risk she runs. While he spoke, Donal, waiting his turn, stood as on hot iron. Such sayings were in his ears the foul talk of hell. The moment the earl ceased, he turned to Forgu and said, My lord, you have removed my harder thoughts of you. You have indeed broken your word, but in a way infinitely nobler than I believed you capable of. Lord Morven stared dumbfounded. "'Your comments are out of place, Mr. Grant,' said Forgu, with something like dignity. "'The matter is between my father and myself. If you wanted to beg my pardon, you should have waited a fitting opportunity.' Donal held his peace. He had felt bound to show sympathy with his enemy where he was right. The Earl was perplexed. His one poor ally had gone over to the enemy. He took a glass from the table beside him and drank. Then, after a moment's silence, apparently of exhaustion and suffering, said, "'Mr. Grant, I desire a word with you. Leave the room, Forgu.' "'My lord,' returned Forgu, "'you order me from the room to confer with one whose presence with you is an insult to me.' "'He seems to me,' answered his father bitterly, "'to be after your own mind in the affair. How indeed should it be otherwise? But so far I have found Mr. Grant a man of honour, and I desire to have some private conversation with him.' I therefore request you will leave us alone together. This was said so politely, yet with such latent command, that the youth dared not refuse compliance. The moment he closed the door behind him, I am glad he yielded, said the earl, for I should have had to ask you to put him out, and I hate rows. Would you have done it? I would have tried. Thank you. Yet a moment ago you took his part against me. On the girl's part, and for his honesty too, my lord. "'Come now, Mr. Grant. I understand your prejudices. I cannot expect you to look on the affair as I do. I am glad to have a man of such sound general principles to form the character of my younger son. But it is plain as a mountain that what would be the duty of a young man in your rank of life toward a young woman in the same rank would be simple ruin to one in Lord Forgue's position. A capable man like you can make a living a hundred different ways. To one born with the burden of a title, and without the means of supporting it, marriage with such a girl means poverty, gambling, "'Hunger, squabbling, dirt, suicide.' "'My lord,' answered Donal, "'the moment a man speaks of love to a woman, "'be she as lowly and ignorant as Mother Eve, "'that moment rank and privilege vanish, "'and distinction is annihilated.' "'The earl gave a small, sharp smile. "'You would make a good pleader, Mr. Grant. "'But if you had seen the consequences of such marriage "'half as often as I, you would modify your ideas. "'Mark what I say.' This marriage shall not take place, by God. What, should I for a moment talk of it with coolness were there the smallest actual danger of its occurrence? Did I not know that it never could, never shall take place? The boy is a fool, and he shall know it. I have him in my power, neck and heels in my power. He does not know it, and never could guess how, but it is true. One word from me and the rascal is paralyzed. Oblige me by telling him what I have just said. The absurd marriage shall not take place, I repeat. 
Invalid as I am, I am not yet reduced to the condition of an obedient father. He took up a small bottle, poured a little from it, added water and drank, then resumed. Now for the girl. Who knows about it? So far as I am aware, no one but her grandfather. He had come to the castle to inquire after her, and was with me when we came upon them in the fruit garden. Then let no further notice be taken of it. Tell no one, not even Mrs. Brooks. Let the young fools do as they please. I cannot consent to that, my lord. Why, what the devil have you to do with it? I am the friend of her people. Pooh, pooh, don't talk rubbish. What is it to them? I'll see to them. It will all come right. The affair will settle itself. By Jove, I'm sorry you interfered. The thing would have been much better left alone. My lord, said Donal, I can listen to nothing in this strain. All I ask is, promise not to interfere. I will not. Thank you. My lord, you mistake. I will not promise. Nay, I will interfere. What to do I do not now know, but I will save the girl if I can. And ruin an ancient family. You think nothing of that. Its honor, my lord, will be best preserved in that of the girl. Damn you! Will you preach to me? Notwithstanding his fierce words, Donal could not help seeing or imagining an almost suppliant look in his eye. "'You must do as I tell you in my house,' he went on, "'or you will soon see the outside of it. "'Come, marry the girl yourself. "'She is deuced pretty, "'and I will give you five hundred pounds for your wedding journey. "'Poor Davy. "'Your lordship insults me. "'Then damn you, be off to your lessons "'and take your insolent face out of my sight. "'If I remain in your house, my lord, "'it is for Davy's sake. "'Go away,' said the earl, and Donal went. "'He had hardly closed the door behind him, when he heard a bell ring violently, and ere he reached the bottom of the stair, he met the butler panting up as fast as his short legs and red nose would permit. He would have stopped to question Donal, who hastened past him, and in the refuge of his own room sat down to think. Had his conventional dignity been with him a matter of importance, he would have left the castle the moment he got his things together, but he thought much more of Davy, and much more of Eppy. He had hardly seated himself when he jumped up again, he must see Andrew Coleman. End of chapter 35